you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Lady Lindbrook Cosmetics. How may I make your world more beautiful? One moment. Lady Lindbrook. Oh, good morning, Tim. Yes, she's expecting your call. If you'll hold, please. Mrs. Lindbrook. Yes? Mr. Gunn on line two. What's that? Shall I put him through? Speak up. I can't hear you. The Bravo account. Shall I put... <sighs> I don't know any Mr. Bravo. It's Mr. Gunn. If you like, oh, I'll... Sally, please, I'm due at the photo shoot. Mr. Munn will have to call back, if that's really his name. Gunn. What? Nothing, Mrs. Lindbrook. Stop muttering, dear. Should I tell Burton to have the car ready? And have Burton bring the car around. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <sighs> He's already parked downstairs. Wayne... Good morning, Miss Richards. Uh, I mean, Mr. Benson. She's getting to you? Well, sometimes we do have a little... Failure to communicate. <laughs> Tell me about it. Last week I locked myself out of the house, had to climb in the window when she couldn't hear the doorbell. Vanity, all is vanity. Whoever said that got it right. Anyway, the limo's at the curb. Burton's waiting for her call, like a good dog. She won't use the cell phone. Well, why not? She's convinced there's something wrong with it. Don't worry, Sally. I won't let her take the company down with her. I'll tell her you're here. Oh, that's all right. Let me uh, surprise her. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who? Gotcha. Wayne, darling, I didn't hear you come in. If I were a snake, I would have bitten you. Well, you shouldn't sneak up on me like that. I haven't finished my makeup. Be a dear and hand me the hairspray. You know they have makeup people at the shoot. What? I said you're beautiful as always. I have to be, in case my handsome husband drops by. Oh, afraid I'll divorce you if your lipstick's on crooked? Something wrong with my lipstick? Uh, we need to talk. Did you say something? My point exactly. Rose, I've been thinking. I have an idea. What would you say to a romantic weekend? Just the two of us. It's about the business. Well, of course our first anniversary isn't till Valentine's Day. But we could get a head start. Actually, that's not a bad idea. The cabin in the mountains, huh? I could join you later. And later? I, I don't understand. Not very long. A, a few days and... And <laughs> what would I do in the meantime? A chance to rest. Clear your head. You work so hard. Uh, who would run things here? Well, I could take the reins. Temporarily, of course. But I enjoy my work. Now, now, don't be stubborn. It's for your own good. Uh, you think I can't handle it anymore? Just because this building has such dreadful acoustics. It's not the building. Admit it, if you weren't so... Vain. Ah, that's not what I said. I've told you, I will not wear hearing aids. It has nothing to do with vanity. They hurt my ears. They distort everything. I wouldn't understand a word anyone says. All the more reason to take some time off. You'll see. You'll be able to run the business more efficiently. More profitably. I've done quite well until now, thank you. I think you hear what you want to hear. Whenever the word business comes up... My business, Wayne. The one I built from the ground up long before you came along. You are the most stubborn woman I've ever met. I, I only want what's best for you. You know that, don't you, darling? A company based on beauty. Not on what a person can or can't hear. Beauty is, they say, as beauty does. 
And the CEO of Lady Lynbrook Cosmetics understands this, or thinks she does. But truth about something else. Like perfection, it may lie in the eye or the ear of the beholder. Rose Lynbrook is about to hear one very surprising truth, intended especially for her and broadcast directly from the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Now You Hear It, Now You Don't, starring Dee Wallace with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Here we are, ma'am. Burton, why are you stopping? I say we're at the studio, Mrs. Lindbrook. What time is it? We're right on schedule. Not late, are we? Not in the slightest. Oh, speak up, will you? I- I'll get the door. Would you kindly help me with the door? Certainly. Where is my blusher? Ready, ma'am? Well, I guess this will have to do. Watch your step. The, the curb. Not that door, Burton. The other one. I can't slide over leather in this dress. I suggest the sidewalk side. Traffic this time of day is... How's the traffic? I say it's not safe. (sighs) Quickly, they're waiting. I'll go around. (sighs) Man would be late for his own funeral. Well, don't just stand there. Give me your hand. One moment, there's a bus... Now! But, ma'am... Oh, never mind. I don't need your help. Wait! Get behind me! Burton! Burton! Uh, ma'am, are you... Are you... Old? Uh, Burton! Oh, did you see that? She stepped right out into the street. What's the matter? Didn't she hear the horn? Must be dead. Oh, if it wasn't for that chauffeur, it would have hit her head on. The poor man. Hey, hey, somebody, call an ambulance. Stop fussing. I'm rechecking your blood pressure. This dress is ruined. I consider it a small price to pay. I want to go home. Not so fast. Nothing's broken. You said so yourself. X-rays don't always tell the whole story. I'd like to hold you for observation. What? Our best private room, of course, unless you demand the entire floor. (laughs) I can't hear a word you're saying. How convenient. This is Fashion Week. I have a contract with every designer on the runway. I'm sure your assistant... What's that? I say, let your assistant handle it. (laughs) Sally? (sighs) Her grandparents were hippies. Rose, how long have we known each other? What are you going on about? More years than either of us cares to remember. And at that time, I've seen you through... Oh, let's say... The vicissitudes of a life well-lived. From the occasional nip and tuck to brow lifts, chemical peels, injections from the endangered species list. I've done everything you asked. You should. I pay you enough. But I've never lied to you. The issue is no longer appearance. It's a matter of communication. If you can't interact effectively with the world around you... Call Burton. What? Tell him I need him. I'll take that as a sign of short-term memory loss rather than a hardening of the heart. Would you not? I'm exercising due diligence. Let's have another look at those eyes. I've had enough of your pawing and probing. Why don't you tell me what you remember about the accident? This is the room. You can't go in there. Out of my hey. way. Hey. Wayne. Stop. Get me my purse. I need a mirror. 
Rose, I got here as fast as I could. Sir, there's a waiting room It's all right, nurse. This must be... My present husband. Wayne Benson. How do you do? Rose, thank God. And my assistant, Sally Richards. Mrs. Lindbrook, are you all right? Why is she here? Uh, Sally drove. As soon as we heard... What on earth happened? A chance encounter with a rather large bus. Apparently she didn't hear the horn. Isn't that so, Mrs. Lindbrook? What horn? Any broken bones? Only a few bruises. Her driver took the brunt of it. Where is Burton? Uh, in IC. See that he gets the best of care. We're doing everything we can. Will you please take me home? Darling, are you sure that's a good idea? At once. I'll make the medical decisions, if you don't mind. You can't hold me here. Not without a lawsuit. On what grounds? Emotional distress. Confinement against my will. And overbilling for utterly pointless tests. You're being unreasonable, not to mention reckless. Sally, call my lawyer. Yes, Mrs. Lindbrook. (sighs) Very well, if that's the way you want it. You'll have to sign a release of liability. Anything. Just get me out of here. These are muscle relaxants. Take one as needed. The other pills will help you sleep. Nurse, send up a chair. Right away, doctor. Why is everyone treating me like an invalid? I can stand on my own two feet. Careful, darling. The wheelchair's on its way. I wouldn't be caught dead in one of those contraptions. Hospital insurance requires it. But don't worry, someone can roll you to the exit with a bag over your head if you're afraid of being seen. I could park by the ramp in back. Would you mind, Sal? We'll meet you there. No problem. Mrs. Lindbrook, I just want to say how relieved we all are. What did she say? She said you look absolutely fabulous. Oh. What was that about Burton? Don't worry your pretty head. I'm sure he'll get the best care money can buy. And what is that monstrosity? One final indignity. A standard issue neck support. Uh, You can put your scarf over it, or I'll pull the fire alarm and clear the hall. I don't think that'll be necessary. Good. It would be a first in this wing. Uh, Mr. Lenbrook? Benson. Yes, the release form is at the front desk. Be sure she initials the waiver. Oh, Wayne, do be a dear. Oh, uh, right. Scamper, darling. And this little box is for you, too. What is it? A special gift. I don't like surprises. Go ahead. Open it. (gasps) No. Absolutely not. Give it a chance. That's all I ask. I've made myself perfectly clear. This is a prototype. A real advance, I'm told. They call it the H-100. I will not wear a hearing aid. An entirely new technology. The research lab needs someone to field test it. Who knows? You might be written up in the scientific journals. I don't want that kind of publicity. Think of what it might mean for others. Let them get their own hearing aids. I tell you, you're the perfect subject. Oh, then I shouldn't need it. Rose, be honest with yourself this once. Anyone else would have heard that bus. It came out of nowhere. With a hundred decibel horn blasting away? Face it, you have degenerative hearing loss, and it's only going to get worse. Look, it's no larger than a pencil eraser. An experimental microcircuit with full frequency range. And this is the wireless control unit, the size of a lipstick. At least try it. I couldn't possibly. Then I can't possibly release you. If I add borderline concussion to your chart, the decision will be out of my hands. You wouldn't. What's more important? Your vanity or your life? (sighs) It doesn't even look real. Completely invisible once it's in place. It won't fit. Hold still while I insert it in the ear canal. There. Where's my purse? Here's a mirror. See for yourself. Even that new husband of yours won't know. 
From now on, you'll hear every word, every whisper. The two of you will be closer than a kiss. Is that true? Your secret. Trust me, this will make a new woman out of you. Go ahead, turn it on before he comes back. It's just this little switch here. See how you're doing. Nurse! Time for time. Nurse! Who is wearing medication? Nurse. Why won't she come? <laughs> no one came to visit. Stop! It's, it's, it's just, just down, down the hall, Mrs. Lindbrook. The rear entrance, darling. Don't you hear that? You're right. It's, it's too much, I tell you. Hang on, we're almost there. Help! Help! This is Help! <gasps> Who's that? I don't hear anything. <laughs> You'll be home soon, ma'am. Don't leave me, Mrs. Lindbrook. I did my best. I swear. Burton? Don't leave me here to die. Please, ma'am. I beg you. Don't. No. Don't. No. No. Oh, Doc. I told Rose I'd stop by. You didn't need to do that. How is she? About the same. Up and around yet? Eh, she doesn't do well out of bed. No? Still pretty shook up. The pills don't help? Not much. Do you, uh, do you have anything stronger? I don't know if that's wise. Drink? Oh, you go ahead. I've, uh... I tried to keep the pressure off, but without the business to worry about, well, she, she's lost. Uh, really? I guess it's all she knows. She just can't cut it anymore. She, she doesn't even want to try. That doesn't sound like the Rose I know. The accident really did a number on her. She needs more downtime. It's possible, I suppose. Or maybe she's had too much. I'm thinking of moving her to a place in the country until she gets her strength back. Oh, I don't know about that. There's nothing wrong with her body. Of course, if it's emotional, I could refer her to a specialist. A shrink? She wouldn't hear of it. Well, then let's try this. A couple of days a week back in her old office, for starters. She's not ready. She can sign letters, make some calls, the way she used to. See how it goes. Not a good idea, Doc. Well, it might do her a world of good. I couldn't allow it. Allow? <laughs> well, she hasn't been declared incompetent yet. No, but... That's... Let me have a look at her. This isn't a good time. Well, she's awake, isn't she? I'll check. Don't trouble yourself. I think I remember the way. First door at the top of the stairs, isn't it?
Rose? Come in, Doctor. How did you know? I heard you. All the way downstairs? Before that, when you turned the corner and drove up. Really? <laughs> that hearing aid must be more sensitive than I thought. Oh, it is. Imagination was always one of your strong points. You're looking well. I look a fright. Not at all. Mind if I give you the once-over? I'm glad you're here. Why, I'm positively flattered. Pulse normal. Eyes a little bloodshot. A lovely green as ever. Hazel, I thought you'd never come. Something on your mind? You can always call. He took my phone away. Wayne? He said it was broken. Then I'm sure he'll get you a new one. <laughs> Don't bet on it. Now, now. Let's check that blood pressure. He wants to put me in a sanitarium. Have you been taking the pills? I only pretend to swallow in case he switches them. So you haven't been sleeping. That can make the world seem a very different place. Lie still for a moment. There. A little low, but close enough. I'm a prisoner in my own home. I don't see any padlocks on the doors. The longer I stay here, the weaker I get. I'm afraid to eat. He might put something in the food. Oh, come now. He was right. You all were. I wasn't competent, but isn't it ironic? Because of what happened, I received the greatest gift of all. The ability to hear the truth. Don't be dramatic. You had a problem, and I treated it. The hearing aid works well, then? Too well. I keep it turned all the way down. Otherwise, I couldn't bear it. Amazing what they can do with those little circuits. I was able to hear everything again, and more. Oh, so much more. Other people, other rooms. The gardener below, the mailman on his rounds, the birds flying overhead. Surely not. The cleaning lady downstairs, the cook in the kitchen. Wayne, when he arrives home, before he puts the key in the door, muttering to himself, talking on his phone. He doesn't know I hear, but I do. All of it. A trick of acoustics. Uh, the air vents in the walls. Oh, I know my own house. All right, Rose. I'll play along. So you think you hear voices? Let me guess. Talking about you, are they? I am not paranoid. An overworked imagination is more like it. That and too much time on your hands... Lying here with nothing to do, your mind heating up like a compost heap? Get out. Ah, I've offended you. Do as I say. There's the rose I know, the one who suffers no opposition, who stands up for herself at the drop of I'll a... I'll prove it to you. Go into the hall. Now. That's the spirit. Close the door and begin speaking. What would you like me to say? Anything. Whisper it as softly as you can. Very well. Now, where's the control? Testing one, two, three. Mm. That late already? Traffic will be a nightmare. That should do. You can come back now. Well, what card did I pick? You took exactly seven steps to the end of the hall. Very good. A security camera? Oh, of course, the floorboards do creak. The alarm on your wristwatch. It beeped three times before you turned it off. Now that is a neat trick. Where's the hidden microphone? And feel free to bill me, Doctor, for the inconvenience of rush hour traffic. How did you know that? You spoke it under your breath. Did I? Yes, I must have. Either that or... I'd have to conclude your little hearing aid picks up people's thoughts... 
And I'm afraid I don't believe in magic. Believe what you like. Occam's razor is good enough for me, a scientific principle I learned in medical school. It says, begin with the simplest explanation. Anything else is merely spinning our wheels. I know what I hear. Do you? I'm nobody's fool. No, you're not. You're a stubborn, hard-headed businesswoman. One who learned how to think for herself. <laughs> I had a good teacher. That you did. Your first husband, Jake, rest his soul. I remember when he founded the company. And you, listen to me, you had the courage to take it to the next level. By thinking pragmatically, not by worrying over imaginary enemies. Yes, I did that, didn't I? On my own, using the tools he gave me. So, if I have to deal with this on my own... But you're not alone. Do you know how lucky you are? There's a man downstairs who only wants what's best for you. He'd do anything to make you happy. But I heard him talking to that girl, hatching some sort of plan. Snap out of it. No one's trying to hurt you. Can't you see what's happened? You suffered a shock and a delayed reaction, what they call post-traumatic stress. And now your thoughts are trapped in a tape loop, playing the fear over and over again. That's not something you're used to, is it? Learning to rely on others. Learning to trust yourself again. No. Wake up, Rose. You are not a victim. Never have been and never will be. It's time to start thinking again about what's best for you, for the business. You make it sound so easy. What do people do when they fall off a horse, hmm? You know the answer as well as I do. Get right back in the game. But first things first, start with some real rest. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. But I do hear things. So you told me. You know what that is? Your own insecurities talking. Not hard to understand, considering that you've been running on empty. I'm going to give you an injection, and tomorrow everything will seem a hundred times clearer. I promise. I wish I could believe you. Give me your arm. There. I'll schedule you for a physical in a couple of days. Afterwards, you might want to stop by the Lenbrook building. I bet they've missed you. They should. I am Lady Lenbrook. Hold that thought, Rose. Never, ever forget who you are. Doctor? Yes? I meant to ask you about Burton. Your driver? Nobody's told me anything. But I, I know he has family. I want to continue his salary with full benefits. That would be very decent of you. His injuries must have been quite serious. I heard him, you know. When? On my way out of the hospital. He was in the last room at the end of the hall in severe pain. I told the nurse, but she acted as if she didn't know what I was talking about. You really should do something about your help. Why didn't you call me? That old duck came nosing around. I waited all day. Keep your voice down. Oh, oh Dr. Wrightson. Miss uh, Richards, isn't it? Nice to see you again. Ah, Miss Richards, uh, stop by to get some papers. Uh, she was just leaving, weren't you, Sally? Uh, Miss Richards. Yes. Y yes, I was. How's Rose? Much better. Is she? Don't bother with the pills tonight. I... I administered a sedative. With any luck, she'll sleep through till morning. Uh, bring her by in a day or two, and I'll give her the all clear. Isn't that rushing it a bit? Don't worry. She's a lot tougher than you think. I... I hope you're right. See you soon, then. Uh, 
if she's up to it. Something tells me she will be. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Is that Sally? Why is she here? What, what are they saying? He's on to us. Relax. I can't take much more of this week. It won't be long. When? At the cabin in the mountains. Tonight. <gasps> Doctor, come back. I was right. I need you now. So this is how it ends. I seem to remember being carried from the house. It was still daylight, but the night was coming. I need you, Sally. Lift your feet. I'm trying to. Yeah, help me get her to the stairs. What? She's coming too. No, she's not. I'll drive her. Meet me at the cabin in your car. No one will know you were there. It could have been a dream. For a time, I thought it was. I couldn't wake up. There was too much medication in my body from the injection. But it was all too real. The lake, the cabin, the one Jake built for me. Only this time, I wasn't here with Jake. I heard Wayne in the room below the loft. I tried to sit up. Easy, Mrs. Lindbrook. Sally? Go back to sleep. Where am I? In bed. Where else? What? I said, go back to sleep. Now. I found some firewood. She keeps drifting in and out. Wayne? I want to go home. Sure, my love. As soon as you get your rest. It doesn't matter what we say. She can't hear. Can she? Not a word. Why are you doing this? I, I don't understand. No, 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 no. Don't worry, you will. How long is this going to take? I have to make it look right. She was feeling better. She, she wanted to go to the mountains. Why not? Then at some point, the excitement got to her, and she stopped breathing. How are you going to accomplish that? A simple pillow over the face. No marks. And the only drug in her system will be what the doctor gave her. Who knows, maybe it was too much for someone her age. And we're so far out in the country, and it'll take the ambulance forever to get here. What a shame. No. Isn't that so, darling? I don't want to see this. You won't. It'll happen in the middle of the night. By then, you'll be back at your apartment in the city. Why don't I just leave now? Uh, and miss the festivities? I brought champagne to toast your new job. I'm going to start a fire. It's freezing in here. Wayne! Shh, 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 shh. Now, Rosie, you need your strength if you want to make it through the night. Please. Save your breath. Save your breath. That's right. Close your mouth. Or I'll do it for you. Eventually, the medication started to wear off. I heard them downstairs by the fire. They thought I was still asleep. I could barely walk. My legs were too weak. Even if I could, there was no place to go. The lake on one side, the mountains on the other. I didn't need to turn on the hearing aid. I knew what they were doing. They were celebrating. When I was a little girl, I used to play hide-and-seek. We covered our eyes and put our fingers in our ears while one of us hid in a secret place. I was very, very good at that. 
No one ever found me. So tonight I would have to be it again. Except that this time there was no place to hide. Even climbing out of bed took all the strength I had. There was no way out, only the window, and it was too high for me to jump. But I knew the cabin well. I had designed it myself with Jake. A rustic dresser, a cedar chest, a small closet with a concealed wall safe. The only thing left was to listen, more closely than I'd ever listened in my life, so I'd know when he came for me. I turned up the hearing aid as high as it would go, and waited. I willed myself to stay awake, (laughs) curled up in bed like a child, afraid of the boogeyman. But I was not a child anymore. You let me fall asleep. Where are you going? It's time. Now? Yes, now. I'm coming to get you, Rosie. Where are you? Gotcha. Stop right there. You're supposed to be asleep. I said, don't come any closer. I only came to kiss you goodnight. Not another step. (laughs) What have you got there? A thirty-eight caliber Smith & Wesson. What does it look like? Careful now. You might hurt yourself. Stand back. Where did you get it? My first husband kept it in the safe. You didn't know about that, did you? Rose, Rose. I remembered the combination. Put the gun down. One of the things he left me. Come on. The tools I needed to survive. Come on, give it to me. I'm warning you! (laughs) What did you do that for? Stay down. You don't get it. Don't make me shoot again. It was nothing personal. Just business. Business? You pathetic man. I am the business. My name is Rose Lindbrook. Anything else, Lieutenant? Uh, We'll need a copy of the autopsy. Of course. I'll send it over this afternoon. We have it listed as a a gunshot wound in the chest. That's right. A single shot to the heart. Well, I guess that's enough for now. What about the assistant? The Richards girl? (laughs) Kidnapping, conspiracy to commit murder. She confessed everything. The deceased Wayne Benson says he was going to take over the business. He promised to make her the new Lady Lindbrook. Fools. There's only one of those. Here's my card. Call me when Mrs. L can make a full statement. It shouldn't be long, a day or two. She's a remarkable lady. Thanks, Doc. Not at all. Yes, nurse. Will you need me for anything else this morning? I guess not. I was just going over the test results from R&D. The hearing aid? What did they say? Looks like she was right. About what? It wasn't calibrated correctly. The gain was boosted way too high. So, I guess that explains it. I'm not sure I follow. She could have heard voices at a distance. From another room, say... If they didn't burst her eardrums first. No damage done, fortunately. The H-100 might actually have saved her life. Did she ever... Oh, it's, it's none of my business. Go ahead, Janet. Well, I was just wondering. Did she say anything to you? 
Didn't she suspect what her husband was up to? Yeah, patients say a lot of things to their doctors. Some real, some imaginary. The trick is to know the difference. This time, I should have listened more closely. She must have been terrified. She's lucky she didn't lose her mind. Want to hear something really peculiar? The frequency response. They used a new type of limiter circuit. Only it didn't work. So the high end was off the scale. So that's what she was complaining about. Not only the decibel level, but the extended upper frequencies. I don't see how anybody could bear it, except for a dog. Above the normal range? Way above. Beyond any instrument we've got. If there are sound waves that high, no one's ever measured them. I'm surprised it didn't drive her insane. But sounds like that. Where would they come from? Don't ask me. Some other place. One we don't know anything about. Ah, I'm just spinning my wheels. It is strange, though. Yes, it is. Because she swears she heard some very odd things. She believes she had a conversation with her husband, Wayne, for example, after she shot him. Of course, that's impossible. He died instantly. One shot, straight through the heart. And after the bus accident. Hmm? When I wheeled her out of the hospital, she said she heard patients at the end of the hall crying out in pain, including her chauffeur. I know. But she couldn't have. The limo driver died in ICU while she was here. And the room at the end of the hall? Well, you know what that is. Yes. The morgue. Hey there, Janet. Hi, Mimi. Going to lunch? I'll meet you in the cafeteria, right after I drop this off. Okay, great. Mrs. Lindbrook? Mrs. Lindbrook? (gasps) Sorry. How are you feeling? What? I brought your hearing aid back, just as you asked. It should work perfectly now. They've recalibrated it. Here, let me fit it in your ear. I can do it myself. If you like. Ready for some lunch? Did you hear me? I I said, are you ready for some lunch? Oh, stop fussing. I have what I need now. Well, if you need anything else, just, just buzz the nurse's station. Doctor will be by in a while. Till then, I'll leave you alone so you can rest. But I'm not alone now. They are with me, the voices of the dead. So many new ones coming and going in this place. I have to listen very, very closely. And one day, perhaps, just perhaps, I'll hear all of their secrets, all the things they have to share with me. Jake... Are you here? Speak to me, my love. If you're with me, speak now. I'll be able to hear. Where are you? Jake? Jake! Beauty is as beauty does, and love, like real beauty, never dies, here or in the twilight zone. (laughs) 
Now You Hear It, Now You Don't. Starring Dee Wallace with Stacey Keach as your narrator was written for The Twilight Zone by Dennis Etchison from a story by Carl Amari. Heard in the cast were Norm Woodell, Rob Riley, Jim McCants, Jennifer Joy, Sia Moody, Mimi Ayers, Joby Cerny, and Alex Sopner. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Amari and directed by Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are done in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Bob Benson, Todd Beyer, and Tim Cerny. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including three free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Yes? Hi, Marilyn. Oh, hi, Val. Guess what? What? I got a catalog this morning. Hmm, that's nice. I'll hold it up so you can see. Didn't you hear me? I said I got What's a... What's so special about a catalog? You get a lot of them, don't you? Yes, but this one is from the Bureau. Oh. Well, isn't that simply the greatest? I suppose so. You suppose? Wait till you see it. It's beautiful. It's... I know. You think you do, but you can't. Not until you've seen it for yourself. I got one, too. You did? Why didn't you call me? I I was going to. Honest. Isn't it wonderful? I can hardly wait. How long does it take, do you think? I don't know. A few days. But the transformation prom's next week. They have to give us time to decide. I don't need time. I've already made up my mind. You have? Number 12. They're so beautiful, with perfect blonde hair and those little noses that turn up at the end. My mother's a number 12. I know, and she looks so fabulous. Don't you think she looks fabulous? My mother's a number 14, but I always thought your mother looks so much better. Who wants to be a brunette? Nobody has dark hair nowadays. There's this one girl at school, that senior Jennifer. Well, she picked number 14. What a mistake. Nobody liked it. She tried to dye her hair last week, and it came out all red and springy looking. Now she wears extra makeup. She thinks we won't notice. But her hair doesn't go with anything else. I have red hair. Oh, uh, I know. Do you think there's something wrong with red hair? No. Honest. It's great. Really. But when you think about what you'll look like after the transformation, isn't it dreamy? Maybe I'll pick number 15. They have such nice long legs. Of course, number 11 does, too. Just like a dancer. Not as slim as number 12, but... I gotta go. To look at your catalog, I bet. Hold it up to the phone so I can see. It's not here. Well, where is it? You didn't lose it, did you? Better check, because if you did... My mother's got it. Oh, good. I mean, I want to ask her a question. Do you think she's happy being a number 12? If she could give me her opinion before... Yeah, I'll tell her. Bye, Val. Portrait of an American girl, caught in that transition known as the terrible teens. The place? A world very much like our own, with all the modern conveniences that make life healthy, happy, and safe. The time? Only a few years from now, when the passage into adulthood has been rendered as pleasant and painless as possible. The answer is technology, and the guarantee that beauty is available not only to the lucky few, but to all, equally and without prejudice. Call it the American dream. For what young girl would not want to be beautiful? Given the chance, what girl would not happily exchange a plain face for a pretty one, an overweight body for a slender one, a lonely adolescence for popularity? It's a dream that might happen tomorrow, 
but as we're about to see, it's already happening in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Number 12 Looks Just Like You, starring Bonnie Somerville and Charles Shaughnessy, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. What are you doing, honey? I'm looking at the scrapbook. My old scrapbook? Oh, dear. How embarrassing. I think it's nice. You should be looking at your new catalog. Here, I brought it back. That's all right. They all look so pretty, don't they? I can't decide. The 17 reminds me of your father. His features, I mean. But I think the 12 might suit you better. Mm-hmm. What do you think? I don't know. I thought we should look at it together, all right? If you say so. Of course, you can't see the details clearly. The holograms are so small. Just the basic faces and figures and how they look wearing different outfits. But you get the idea. What's the matter? Nothing. Are you listening to me? I'm sorry, mothers. Some of the pictures in this old album... Sometimes I don't understand you, darling. What do you mean? Most girls your age are thrilled to death when it's time to choose a pattern. Have you even looked at the catalog? Yes. I remember how excited I was before I made my choice. I couldn't sleep for three nights. The patterns were all so lovely. I couldn't make up my mind. <laughs> my mother had to help me decide. I finally chose number 12. I guess that's everyone's favorite. Is it? Aren't you excited? Mm-hmm. What is it in that old album that's so fascinating? The way you were before. Oh, you can't be serious. This page, for instance. Not that one. It is you, isn't it? See? It says Lana Donnelly. Oh, I can't believe how plain I was. No wonder I didn't have any friends as a child. The sandy hair, all those freckles. Like mine? Well, that's what you inherited. But when I see that thick waist in the picture, those ugly, shapeless legs, I absolutely want to cringe. I wish your father hadn't given you this book. Hard to believe, I know, but I'm afraid the awful truth is it's me. Before my transformation. I knew it. I was such a sight. I wouldn't say that. I think you were beautiful. I really do. <laughs> well, I certainly don't. I was unbearably homely. It was always hard on me at school until, well, thank goodness for the transformation. It's the most marvelous thing that could happen to a person, and it didn't come a moment too soon. Am I very homely now? Of course you aren't. Not to me. But afterwards, oh, think of it. You'll be beautiful. Mother. Yes, dear. May I ask you a question? Anything at all. Suppose I didn't want it. What? I wouldn't have to, would I? Darling, what are you talking about? At least I could wait a little while, couldn't I? Would that be all right? Oh, I don't think so. It has to be done at just the right time. A certain stage in your growth. Later, it's much harder. That's why the Bureau notified you. The time is now. But what if I'm not ready? You're just nervous, darling. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing at all. Say, I know what you need. You do? A glass of instant smile. I'll ring for Grace. I don't need anything. I think you do, if you could see yourself. But all of that will change. Just think. Turn it over in your mind and savor it. Very soon now, very, very soon, you can look like this. Or this. Who's that one? She's exactly your age. Isn't she beautiful? Her name is, let me see, Melanie Moore. There's no reason why this couldn't be you. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You rang Mrs. Q. Barrel? Lana. Pardon me. Lana. A cup of instant smile for my daughter, Grace. Yes, ma'am. On second thought, make it two. I could use a little pick-me-up myself. Right away. Teaching the help to use first names can be a problem these days. But we're all equal, aren't we? Yes, Mother. Remember that. After all, Grace is a number 12, too. Even if she is our maid. Oh, Mother. Why so glum, darling? I'm tired. 
I think I'll go to my room and lie down. That's a good idea. You're not yourself today. Oh? Who am I? You act as though there's something wrong with the transformation. I don't understand what possible objection anyone could have to being beautiful. After all, isn't everybody? Someone's at the front door, Grace. Yes, Mrs. I mean, Lana. Be right there. Oh, never mind. I'll get it. Hello, Lana. Oh, Rick. Thanks for coming by. How's Marilyn? The same. I almost couldn't believe what you said on the vid phone. I couldn't believe it myself. But it's true. She doesn't want the transformation. Can you imagine? Let me talk to her. I wish you would. Where is she now? In her room. I'll let her know you're here. Yes? Marilyn, are you awake? Why? Uncle Rick is here. He is? Be right there. That girl. You were her father's brother, Rick. What did he tell her? What do you mean? What could he possibly have said to give her these crazy ideas? It's an interesting question. Don't jump to conclusions. He was a good man. I know that. A little strange, perhaps, but a good man. I'll have a word with her. Might not have been his fault, you know. Then whose? Hard to say. They pick up so many peculiar notions from the trivid and that school. Oh, they... Here she is now. Don't let on that I called you. I won't. Honey! Look who stopped by to see you. Hi, sweetheart. Uncle Rick! Ah, oh, forget that uncle stuff, will you? You want me to start feeling old? Oh, you're not old. Can you stay? For a few minutes, I guess. I was just passing by and I... You two will excuse me. What's the matter, Mom? Nothing. I'm late for my culture class. Still taking that night course, huh? Well, I can't miss a chance to improve myself, can I? Make yourself comfortable, Rick. If you need anything, Grace is in the other room. Sure. Nice to see you, Lana. Nice to see you. Come back soon, will you? We'll all have dinner together. Sounds great. Bye now. Now then, what's all this about? What's what about? Well, I gather your mother is worried. Oh. Don't say it like that. She cares very much about you. Because I don't want to be transformed? Something like that. Because I want to stay ugly. Stop it. You're many things, honey. Most of them delightful, but you're definitely not ugly. You're just... Just what? Not beautiful? Some people might say so. What would you say? You're... different looking. Different good or different bad? Doesn't matter. The point is, people choose transformation when the opportunity comes along. I guess I'm not like other people. Your father chose it. I know. He was a number 17, just like you. <laughs> well, yes. 17 is the favorite for men these days. Has been for the past 20 years. My brother was a perfectionist. Wouldn't settle for anything less. Uncle Rick. Yes? Haven't you ever wanted to... to look like you? I do look like me. But you also look like a lot of other people. And all considered rather handsome, or so I'm told. Is that bad? Is it good to be like everybody? Isn't that the same as being nobody? I think it's time you tell me. Tell you what? We've been getting these radical ideas. My father used to say... Your father was a handsome man, wasn't he? Yes, but he read books. He, he thought about things. Sometimes we talk, just the two of us. Everybody talks. I mean about real things, not just electronic baseball or the super soccer team or where to buy a dress or fix your hair. Is there something wrong with sports, Marilyn, or buying new dresses? Think of all the businesses that would close down if nobody thought about them. But if you make that all there is in life... Sorry, sweetie, I have to be going. For now, I'd say you're out of sorts. It's not unusual at your age. You better have a glass of instant smile. 
Ask Grace to bring one in. I've had a glass of instant smile. I've had glass after glass after glass. And you know something? It doesn't do any good. Take it easy. I don't feel like smiling. I feel like frowning. In fact, I want to cry. I'm unhappy and I don't know why. Do you understand? I'm just not happy. I'll tell you what you are. I don't know how it happened. But I'd say you're a very sick young lady. Why? Because I don't want to be like everyone else? I'll tell your mother to make an appointment with the doctor tomorrow. Till then, take care of yourself, sweetie. And try not to worry. We'll all be better very soon. You'll see. What's wrong with me? Somebody please tell me. What's wrong with me? So glad you could come. Thanks, Mrs. Cubero. Lana, please. Oh, sure. Lana. We haven't seen much of you lately. I know. Marilyn, look who dropped by. Who? Hi, Marilyn. Val? Yes, it's me. Oh, I, I didn't recognize you. Doesn't she look fabulous? I feel fabulous. Number 12 has always been my favorite, ever since I was a little girl. Well, it was worth the wait, wasn't it? You bet. Are you two going out tonight? I don't think so. But if Marilyn wants to... I can't. I have to do my online homework. Just a visit, then. I'll leave you alone. I know you have a lot to talk about. Remember, Val, you're always welcome here. Thanks, Lana. If you need anything... We're fine, Mother. Don't be such a stranger, Val. I promise. See you soon. She told you, didn't she? Well, yes. And that's why you're here. Really, Marilyn, don't you think you're being silly about the whole thing? I think it's my own business. Well, of course it is. But I don't understand. Nobody does. I just don't see why I have to make up my mind right now. There's no law, is there? But everyone has it done. Fine. They're not me. It doesn't hurt or anything, if that's what you're worried about. When they did mine, I didn't feel a thing. I'm sure it didn't. Well, what then? You like the way I look, don't you? Sure. You look just like my mother now. Oh, excuse me. Like Lana. What's wrong with that? Nothing, Val. But I like you. Of course you do. We're friends. We'd be friends even if you didn't have the transformation. Don't you know that? That's not the important thing. What is important, Val? It's like getting a new dress or a new hairstyle. You just look better. You want to look as nice as you can, don't you? If I do it, I'll, I'll look like one of those holograms in the catalog. That's right, you will. And they're all beautiful, aren't they? What's wrong with that? I don't know. But somehow I have this feeling that it's wrong. Why? How will you know me afterwards? How will anyone know me? That doesn't make sense. You know what I think, Marilyn? I think you're just plain weird. If everybody says it's all right, if the whole world thinks it is, then how can you say something different? I don't get it. You're the one who doesn't get it. I don't want to look like someone else. Val, I want to look like me. I won't let them change me into something else. I won't let them. Help me, please, Val. I don't have anyone else who listen. Please help me. Marilyn? Mother? No, I'm Miss Simmons. Oh, you must be a number 12, too. Why, thank you, dear. As a matter of fact, I am. Doctor will see you now. Where's my mother? She's already in the office. Would you like to come with me? All right. Dr. Hortel? Yes, nurse. Miss Cuberell is here. Thank you, Eva. Hello, Marilyn, darling. The doctor and I were just having a talk. <laughs> Please, call me Rex. All right, Rex. Would you care for a beverage, Marilyn? No, thank you. That'll be all for now. Very well. Call me if you need anything. Uh, yes, I will. Have a seat by me. The couch is very comfortable. What's this for? Oh, just a simple interview. 
Your mother, Lana, wanted us to get acquainted. Why, Rex will answer any questions you have. <laughs> I'll do my level best. And I appreciate it. We both do. I'm sorry to have bothered you. It's, it's such a small thing, really. No, no, not at all. That's, that's my job. Marilyn, please, sit. Now then, you're 18? Yes. Well, it must be about time to... Ah, yes, I... I see that you've already received your notice. Went out last week. That's why we're here. No, oh, you mustn't worry. I try not to. Marilyn's like so many young people nowadays. She is? Mm hmm And it's our fault. How so? Well, because we haven't made things clear to her. It's a matter of communication. But when you deal with a bureaucracy, well, there's bound to be an information lag. I read everything from the Bureau. But it didn't give you any definite explanation of why you've had to wait this long. I'm sure it's been difficult. Marilyn looks at you, Lana, at the women all around her in pictures on the trivid, and then she looks into a mirror. It has a negative effect on her self-image, not to mention her spirit. There's nothing wrong with my spirit. Marilyn, please. Well, from pure perfection of body, face, limbs, pigmentation, carriage, stance, she sees herself and is horrified. Isn't that so? Well, I... Well, of course it is. The child asks herself, Why must I be so hideous, off-balance, oversized, awkward, when, when everyone around me is so perfect? In short, she's tired of being a monster. She's come close to giving up. Dr. Rex, that's all well and good, but you don't understand. He doesn't. <laughs> I beg your pardon? If she isn't just depressed or anxious, she's... Well, go on, say it. You're my patient now. Everything is in strictest confidence. Well, she's... I, I don't know quite how to put this. I made up my mind. You have? I don't want to have the transformation. You what? I don't understand it either. She never said anything before, and now, suddenly... I is this true? Yes. Oh, perhaps you'd like to talk about it. Not particularly. She won't give any reasons. She just... Suppose you tell me, Marilyn. In your own words. There's nothing to tell. I, I just don't want to change. You do understand that transformation is a normal part of growing up. It has been for years now. In a way, it's a milestone. A sign of maturity means you're ready to take your place in the adult world. How? By being like everybody else? Well, I wouldn't say that. No, there are a great many styles in the catalog. You're, you're absolutely free to choose any one you like. There's no pressure on you at all. No, no coercion. Isn't there? No, that would be against regulations. But I have to choose one, even if I don't want to. That's the way it's set up. If I don't... Well, I don't, I don't even know what would happen to me. You make it sound like you're being forced. No, that would be contrary to free will. And if there's one thing this country guarantees... But what would happen if I don't? If I stay the way I want to be? Why do people care so much? I thought this was supposed to be a democracy where we respect everybody. Marilyn! Even if they want to be different. Even if they want to live their lives the way you they... You mustn't talk like that. Why not? You've been given every advantage, every privilege. We're talking about a chance to develop your full potential. Would you mind if I conduct a test? What kind of test? A personality profile. Uh, for my records. I don't see why not. Do you, Marilyn? Come over here, please. What's that machine? Oh, it simply scans your mental activity, then prints it out on a strip of paper. The whole process takes a, a few seconds. It's quite painless, I assure you. All you need to do is sit in this chair. It's all right, darling. I promise. What are you putting on my head? A cranial recorder. I'm sure you've had this done before. You did. When you first started school, remember? All right, close your eyes, please, and sit quietly. Now, you must understand, the, uh, the transformation is desirable not only from an aesthetic point of view. It plays an important role in one's psychological adjustment. According to scientific research, it's absolutely vital. There. That's, that's all there is to it. What does it say? Hmm. Lana, was there anything specific that triggered your daughter's feelings? 
Uh, an emotional incident of some sort? Nothing that I'm aware of. She's never shown much interest in her appearance, but I honestly can't imagine anything Your that Your husband might... died in the Ganymede incident, I see. Five years ago. Did you ever discuss this matter with him? Yes. I recall that he had some misgivings at first, but he finally chose number 17. Your number. Huh, I see. You remind me so much of him. Your eyes and the way you walk. Well, that's, that's hardly surprising. It's an outstanding design. He's not Daddy, Mother, or Uncle Rick. Now you can go back to the couch now, Marilyn. We're all finished. Just lift the helmet off. You were very f fond of your father, I take it. Yes. And you respected his opinions, didn't you? He was very, very intelligent. Oh, I'm sure he was. Did he ever tell you that the transformation was bad? Not exactly. I'm sure he didn't. What did he tell you? He said he thought it was tragic. Jack had some ideas that were rather nonconformist, Doctor. But it was just talk. He had the highest physical and psychological rating with the rocket service. Well, this is a very unusual case. I'll require some additional time to look into the matter. Uh, suppose I get in touch with you, say, in a few days. That will be fine. I appreciate your seeing us. Did you find out? Hmm? What's that? The machine. Did you find out what's inside my head? Oh, your general intelligence rating is quite high. Social adaptation, good. Powers of reasoning appear normal. Oh, above normal, in fact. Then why won't you let me make up my own mind? Honey, please. Why can't I? Why should I be forced to do something I don't want to do? You can't make me, can you? Oh, no one has ever been forced to take the transformation. Now, the problem is to discover why you don't want it. Then, once we understand that, well, we'll make whatever corrections are necessary. <laughs> Something of a challenge, young lady. Don't you worry. I'm sure we'll be able to handle it. Whatever it takes. Dr. Morris, dial 118, please. Dr. Where are we going? This way, please. It's just at the end of the hall. What part of the hospital is this? They have the private offices down here. I, I thought Dr. Hortel was going to meet me. You mean Dr. Rex? He'll be along later. Miss Marilyn Cubero. Come in, Marilyn. Sit down. It's too dark. I can't see anything. Walk toward the desk. Wait. See the chair? Yes, but I, I can't see you. Sorry. The lamp must be right in your eyes. Let me adjust it. Who are you? I am Professor Friend, Sigmund Friend. You must call me Sig. Dr. Rex has told me about you. I'm here to help. Sit, please. Help me? Help rid you of your fears of this necessary and important... No, that isn't true. It's not necessary. This very necessary, very important step in your life. But why? Why does everyone want to force me to do something I don't want to do? Why else but for your own good? That doesn't make sense. Why else would the state go to so much trouble and expense? Many, many years ago, wiser men than I decided to eliminate injustice and inequality from this world. They saw in physical unattractiveness one of the factors that make men hate. And so they charged the finest scientific minds with the task of eliminating, or at least minimizing, ugliness everywhere. But I'm not ugly. I'm not pretty, but I'm not ugly either. To others, you may be. Not to those who love me. There's more to it than that. As we learn to reshape the features, remold the body, we also learn to eliminate most causes of illness and thereby prolong life. Before the transformation, you might have expected to live 70, 80, perhaps 90 years. Now you may live twice that long, even three times. These are good things, don't you agree? Genuine advances for humankind. Yes. Your mother. She's lovely, is she not? At one time, her face and body would already have begun to show the marks of age, of decay. You would not deny her youth and beauty, would you? But you could do that part without changing me, couldn't you? I wouldn't mind just that. Someday you might. And then it would be too late for the transformation. 
No, I'll never change my mind. I've thought about it, and I'm positive. Why? Did you ever read Shakespeare? Or Shelley? Or Keats? Those books were banned many years ago. Where did you find them? My father gave them to me. And dozens more. Aristotle, Socrates, Dostoevsky. D did you know Dostoevsky was an epileptic? Ugly, deformed, but he wrote about beauty. Real beauty. Marilyn, I warn you. This sort of subversive talk... Those men wrote about life, about the dignity of the human spirit, about love. I've heard enough. Interjecting smut into this interview is not going to help your case, not at all. Then may I go now? I've arranged a room for you. You'll be quite comfortable. But I don't want to stay here. I want to go home. It's only temporary. Your mother will be informed and you'll be allowed visitors. Mother, did you hear what he said? They want I'm to... not your mother, dear. But I am a number 12. This way. No, you can't make me stay here. I'm afraid you must let me decide what is best for you. This way? No, please. We're not going to hurt you. We're going to help you. Let me go! Let me go! They're almost there. Just ahead, third room on the left. And you're sure she's all right? Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad. Did you know, Doctor, we've been best friends since preschool? Well, she's lucky to have a friend like you. And a mother who cares so much. Like you, Lana. I hope she's awake. Marilyn. Dr. Rex? You have company. Oh, Mother. She was quite upset last night. I... I gave her something to help us sleep. Hello, darling. You haven't done anything to her yet. Oh, a mild sedative, nothing more. If you'll excuse me, I have to look in on another patient. Of course, doctor. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Hello, Val. Are you okay? I think so. We'd have been here sooner, only the doctor said you were sleeping. How do you feel? I don't know. What happened? Nothing. They just wouldn't let me go. Oh, Mother, they're going to do it anyway. They're going to make me do it. That's not true, Marilyn. Dr. Rex promised, remember? He was lying! Lying? Why should he? I don't know, but I know he has to say that to keep people from finding out. Finding out what? That they do the transformation whether you want it or not. Don't try to sit up. Didn't you hear what I said? I can't see why you're so unhappy when all they want to do is make you pretty. But they don't! What? Last night before I went to sleep, I remembered something. I remembered what Father told me. He said, when everyone is beautiful, then no one will be. Because without ugliness, there is no beauty. Oh, Mother, don't you see? They don't care whether you're beautiful. They want everyone to be the same. That's all. They? Who are you talking about? I'm afraid it's time to go now. Already? If it's all right, I'd like to stay and talk to Marilyn some more. Well, uh, well, just for a few minutes. Don't worry, dear. Everything's going to be fine. You'll see. What do you want to talk about? Well, I was thinking about what you said, what your father said. I don't see why he's so important to you. Val! I mean, he's dead, isn't he? Besides, you must have had other fathers. My mother's been married 11 times. Personally, I always like the stepfathers better anyway. Please, Val. You've had nine fathers since the first one. Well, haven't you? Everybody marries everybody these days. Val, stop. After all, how can anybody live with the same husband for a hundred years? Besides, from what I hear, your first father wasn't much fun. Stop talking about my father. You didn't know him. I loved him. He was good, kind, and he cared about me. Not the way I looked, but what I thought. What I felt. And he cared about himself. His dignity as a human being. My father wasn't killed in the Ganymede incident, Val. He killed himself. Why? Because when they took away his identity, who he was, there was no reason left to live. I don't understand. And I don't understand you, Val. Look at me. Do you ever feel anything? Sure. I feel good. I always feel good. Like that poem we learned in school. Life is pretty, life is fun. I am all and all is one. You don't get it. 
Forget what? What are you talking about? You really don't. You can't. You can't understand anything. I gotta go, Marilyn. Goodbye. I have to get out of here. You're number 14, aren't you? Yes. Do you like 14s? I do now. Have you had lunch yet? I was just on my way to the 22nd floor. That's amazing. So was I. Working a long shift today? Till 7. Then I'm free. That's great. Say, have you seen the Holo Lounge yet? If you like, I was thinking... Which is the way out? I can't remember. Must be those two doors at the end. <gasps> mother? What's that? Is that my mother on the gurney? Is your mother pregnant? No. Then your mother must be at number 12. Are you all right? Yes, I'm, I'm fine. What are you doing in your hospital gown? I, I was just looking for the nurse. You better stay in your room. Push the button by the bed. The nurse will be along. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. The double doors, this has to be the way. Hello? What is this place? Somebody? Hello, my dear. We've been expecting you. Dr. Rex? Where am I? What? This is an operating room. No! <laughs> no need to run. Sooner or later, everyone decides to be beautiful. What number have you chosen? No, please, please! Ah, Mrs. Cubell. Val, just in time. Is it all over, Doctor? All over. Is she okay? She's fine. You'll see for yourself. I've been so worried the last few days. She seemed in such a state. It's as I told you. Occasionally, a young person has difficulty adjusting to the idea. It always works out fine in the end. <laughs> it never fails. A complete self-contained procedure. Mother! Val! You see? What did I tell you? Look at me, Mother. Look at me. Marilyn? Well, what do you think? You're beautiful. Simply beautiful. Wow, I love your long legs. And the nicest part of all, Val, now I look just like you and Mother. Turn around so I can see you. Do you like my makeup? They even gave me some high heels. Of course, I'll need a new dress to go with my new look. Yes. Yes, you will. Come along, Marilyn. We'll do some shopping on the way home. Then we'll have a party, and all your friends can come over. You're going to have so many new friends from now on. I know. Isn't it exciting? Portrait of a young lady in love for the first time with herself. Improbable? Perhaps. But in an age of plastic surgery, bodybuilding, an infinity of cosmetics, and an obsession with appearance, let us hesitate to say impossible. These and other blessings, some of them decidedly mixed, may await us in the not-too-distant future, or at least a future to be found in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. 
where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Number 12 looks just like you, starring Bonnie Somerville and Charles Shaughnessy. With Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by John Tomerlin from a story by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Linda Reiter, Rebecca Spence, David Darlow, Nick Sandys, Nina LaSalle, Tom McElroy, Rick Arthur, Joby Cerny, Fernet Lebo, and Terry Lopez. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Director of Development. Please hold. Good morning, sir. Yes, this is Market Research. Mr. Amber probably is still alive. Mr. Jameson's office, personnel. I asked Mr. Sterling to return your call. Oh, uh, hello, sir. Legal department. I'll connect you with Mr. Farwell. No, he hasn't. Not yet. May I take your number? Miss Pepper. Mr. Feathersmith, how are you this morning? Miss Pepper, when the old gentleman arrives, will you show him in? Of course, sir. Is there anything I can get you? The mail's on your desk. I have a list of your appointments. The old gentleman, that would be... Mr. Dietrich? Then it's Der Tag. What's that? The day. Today? Isn't that right, Helen? Well, he has an appointment. He's going to get it. Mr. Feathersmith will have him drawn and quartered and served up in the executive dining room with an apple in his mouth. Shh, there's Mr. Dietrich. Excuse me. I have an appointment to see Mr. Feathersmith. Oh, yes, Mr. Dietrich. If you'd let him know that I'm here. He's expecting you, sir. Go right in. Thank you very kindly. Yes. Mr. Dietrich, sir? Come in. I can just see him now. That big, happy grin before he draws blood. Have a cigar, Mr. Dietrich, before I rip you to pieces. A cigar, Mr. Dietrich. You're about to witness a murder, a willful predatory case of homicide. The victim is a Mr. Sebastian Dietrich, age 77. The killer is a Mr. William Feathersmith, a robber baron whose body composition consists of refrigeration coils covered by thick skin. In a moment, Mr. Feathersmith will proceed on his daily course of conquest and calumny with yet another business deal. But today's deal will be one of those bizarre transactions that take place only in an odd, out-of-the-way marketplace known as the Twilight Zone.
And now, back to the Twilight Zone with Of Late I Think of Cliffordville, starring H.M. Winant, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I said, would you like a cigar? No, thank you, Mr. Feathersmith. You asked me to come here at two, and it is now two. What did you have on your mind? Hmm. <laughs> You've never cared much for my personal habits, have you, Diedrich? Smoking, for example. Whether I do or don't is really not at issue, Mr. Feathersmith, but the extent of time that you keep me here is, on the other hand, of considerable import. I'm a busy man. I'd like to get on with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, by all means. Um, we've gone a pretty far route, the two of us. Have we? I owe you a great deal, Mr. Diedrich. I remember vividly the afternoon many, many years ago, back in Cliffordville. You called me into your office. You ran a rinky-dink, nickel-and-dime little tool shop. And you said, you said, uh, Bill Feathersmith, I like your style, boy. I want you in with me. Do you remember that afternoon? I shall never forget that afternoon, Mr. Feathersmith. I've thought about it a good deal in the ensuing years, and I've never ceased to regret it. <laughs> you never did like me. I wouldn't say that. I have disliked and detested you with great cordiality. I have found you to be, as of the day you walked into my office, a predatory, grasping, covetous, acquisitive animal. Without heart, without conscience, without compassion, and without even a subtle hint of the most commonplace decency. Does that answer your question? I give you this, Diedrich. You never were a man to toady around with a lot of phony euphemisms. You always did speak your mind. <laughs> and you, Mr. Feathersmith, mark you, this is perhaps the singular compliment I can dredge up, have always been a man to speak yours. So, why don't you? All right, then. I'll do precisely that. See this map? It's my empire. Mining over here. Electronics here, here, and here. Lumber, railroads, minerals. An industrial complex I built up step by step, piece by piece. And in which I take pardonable pride. Yet there's a piece missing. Go on. Well, that is to say there was a piece missing. The Diedrich Tool and Die plant. Was? A good, substantial plant employing 13,000 people some 40 years in operation, not always perfectly managed. But sufficiently well to make you move heaven and earth to try to buy it. Thank God I won't live to see the day when you get your greasy hands on it. Of course, as a matter of your financial problems, I happen to know, Mr. Diedrich, that you secured a loan of 13 million dollars. This is the note here. Isn't it? How do you... I bought the note, Mr. Diedrich. I paid an exorbitant amount of money, far more than it was worth. But it was, let's say, an exceptional opportunity for our lives to crisscross again. What is your point? The point is right here on the note. It says payable on demand. So, on demand it is. I want it paid. Not tomorrow. Now, this moment, I want your personal check in the amount of $13 million, or I'm very much afraid I'll have to send out the painters to the Diedrich Tool and Die Works and cross your name off the sign. Feathersmith, if you call in that note, you'll ruin me. You'll put me into bankruptcy. You'll kill off everything I have, everything I own. You're a most discerning man. Here it is only six minutes past two. Six minutes! That's all the time it's taken for you to comprehend that I've managed to kill you off. <laughs> Mr. Dietrich, are you all right? Sir, is everything... Would you like to sit down? You, you look so pale. Miss Miss Pepper, Miss Pepper, 
Where is she? Where is... Where... Oh, what time is it? Oh, excuse me, sir. I didn't know you were still here. I'm here, my good man. I'm assuredly here. <laughs> and here is the mountaintop. The high rung on the ladder. <laughs> I'll finish cleaning later. No, 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 no. You, you may join me on the mountaintop. <laughs> here I am, way up on the mountain, like, like, uh, like who was it? Uh, Genghis Khan or uh, Julius Caesar? Julius Feathersmith! <laughs> 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 Don't worry, sir. I'll clean it up. Who are you, anyway? I'm Hackett, sir. The custodian. Top three floors. Well, uh, how, how would you like a drink, Mr. Uh, custodian of the top three floors? Uh, see, I, I, I have a, another bottle somewhere. Thank you, no, but I appreciate it. How long have you been performing this illustrious task? Thirty-four years, sir. I've been thirty-four years in the building. I got a... I got a gold watch last year. A gold watch? Ho, ho, ho! After thirty-four years! That's practically as long as I've been in the building. But I didn't start here. No, 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 no. I know indeed. I, I started in a little town called Cliffordville. Hmm. Never hear of Cliffordville, Mr. Hickett. That's a... That's a coincidence, Mr. Feathersmith. I was born in Cliffordville. Grew up there. Well, then we have something in common. We're both from Cliffordville, and we both put on our pants, one leg at a time. <laughs> but there, the similarity ends. Come here, I want to show you something. Yes, sir? See this picture on the wall? Know who it is? Why, I'm not sure. That's William Feathersmith. Me. Taken in front of our old home in Cliffordville. Now that was a town, wasn't it? That was a real place. Stately trees, gracious homes, beautiful, sprawling park. And real people, people who knew the value of a buck, people who worked hard to get it. There was none of this crazy stuff about unions, retirement benefits, or antitrust suits, or any of that claptrap. Those were the real times, when a man could go up to the stars if he had a mind to, and the legs to carry him, and the fingers to reach out and grasp. Not like now. Nah. Not like now at all. I... I reckon so. I'm going home now, Mr. Hackett. May as well. No place else to go. Yes, sir. I've been sitting here for three hours, all by myself, thinking about Cliffordville. About how I... how I wished it was that way again. I had an old man here today, Diedrich. He gave me my first real job. <laughs> well, I fixed his wagon. He never liked me, I never liked him. We both used each other, and I got the most use out of it. I broke him to pieces today, just like he would have done to me if he could. And he's tried, Mr. Hackett, let me tell you. He's tried. Good night, then, Mr. Feathersmith. William Feathersmith, what a crock. <laughs> Alexander Feathersmith is more like it. Alexander the Great Feathersmith. I've got everything there is to get. But I'm still hungry. Understand? I'm hungry. A 20-course meal. I've got a tapeworm inside me that's taken every bit of it. He cried. What? What did you say? Alexander the Great. He cried because he had no more worlds to conquer. I guess... I guess maybe he was kind of like you, Mr. Feathersmith. Hmm. Y you know... You know what I wish? I wish... I could go back to Cliffordville. Back 50 years ago and start all over. Because getting it all... That was the kick. Not having it. Getting it! <sighs> Good night, Mr. Hackett. Custodian of the top three floors. Don't forget to wind your gold watch. Oh, at last. Hold on. This isn't the lobby. Hey, wait! I said wait! Where? 
13th floor. Oh, great. But, well, this building doesn't have a 13th floor. Hello? Who's there? Hello? Hello? I'm glad you're still here. The elevator let me off the wrong floor. Oh, how do you do, sir? I was just about to close up. Who are you? Devlin. Just Devlin? The first name's not important. No, I own this building. I'm aware of that, Mr. Feathersmith. What I'm not aware of is you're having an office here, whoever you are. Oh, I've just opened it, Mr. Feathersmith. Devlin's Travel Service. Hmm. As a matter of fact, I opened it for your convenience. Mine? Would you care to come in? Why? Why, because, Mr. Feathersmith, we've got some business to transact, you and I. Please, have a seat. There's no reason why we shouldn't be comfortable, is there? I must have missed something. We have business. What sort of business? Travel, of course. I've been expecting you. You have? Sit, please. Now, isn't there anywhere you'd like to go? Your heart's desire? Well, there was this town. <laughs> of course there was. The name of the town was Cliffordville. Ah, yes, Cliffordville. And it was a pleasant town? It was better than pleasant. And <laughs> there were the local girls. Oh, beautiful. Just beautiful. They always are. Go on. You were saying? I remember old Doc Wagner, too. <laughs> Treated me when I broke my arm. That's another thing. There was none of this blood pressure, basal metabolism, cholesterol nonsense. Old Doc Wagner looked at your tongue and wrote out a prescription, and that was it. And the food, simple, fair, healthy, and delicious. That was the way life was then. Simple. And you enjoyed that, didn't you? What? No, I, I didn't have time to enjoy anything. But, but I did what I wanted to do. I worked, I scrambled, I dug, I scratched, I pushed, drove, and I went up. Understand, I went up. And now you're all the way up. But you're simply bored. That's what it is, isn't it, Mr. Feathersmith? I'm worse than bored. I don't have any purpose now, no, no plans, no, no drive, because there's no place left to go. Hmm, are you sure? The sign on your door, what, what does it mean exactly? A succinct suggestion of the kind of service I offer, Mr. Feathersmith. And that is? Just as it says. Travel. Or more to the point, if you don't mind the rather melodramatic terminology, one might call it time travel. Miss Devlin, I think we may have something to talk about after all. Indeed, Mr. Feathersmith. You've got everything you want. And the pleasure is not in the acquisition. It's in the struggle to acquire. Isn't that the sense of it? Go ahead. So, let's do this. Let's send you back to Cliffordville. The Cliffordville of 50 years ago. And you can start fresh. Acquire. Build. Consolidate. Do it all over again. How does that sound? You're not dealing with a bumpkin, Miss Devlin. This isn't one of those sell your soul for a nickel country boys. <laughs> Try this. You send me back in time to Cliffordville, but I want to look like I looked 50 years ago. Agreed. Number two, I want to keep my memory, everything that's happened since, not impaired one bit. Check again. And I want the town to be exactly as it was, the same people. All very easily arranged. Now for the price. I suppose the standard payment is, well, <laughs> what you call a soul. On occasion, that is part of the transaction, but in your case, I believe we got a hold of your soul some time ago. Mm, let me check. Mm. Oh, yes, here it is. There was the crash of the Trans-Mississippi Debentures, the company you bought and manipulated. You ruined several hundred people with that bit of chicanery. The bulk of your soul went over to us shortly thereafter, and there are several other items here. Private life, subconscious thoughts and dreams, uh, indirect murders, people you drove to ruin, hopelessness and suicide. No, I'm afraid your soul is not yours to negotiate. Then what do you charge? Cash, Mr. Feathersmith, the old Missoula. 
I have your current assets tabulated here. Were you to liquidate as of this moment, you'd be worth precisely $136,891,412.14. <laughs> You're very thorough. We have to be. Now, the cost for what you ask is nominal. The entire bill, and this covers transportation, clothing, the retaining of your memory, the maintenance of the town in its historically accurate form, including its citizenry, is... $136,888,006, leaving you a balance of $2,812.14. Highway robbery! Quite a little nest egg, considering. Hmm. Considering that I know where the oil is, just outside of town. 1,400 acres not discovered until they brought in the first well. And, of course, I know the stock market in advance and every important invention over the years. Before it happens, I can get in on the ground floor. The absolute basement. All things considered, Mr. Feathersmith, it's a fortune. You just send me back there with my bankroll and watch my smoke. How soon can I go? I'll handle the liquidation for you. Just sign this power of attorney, and there's no reason why you can't leave, say, tomorrow morning. Done. Exemplary, Mr. Feathersmith. You're one of the few remaining rugged individualists. A pleasure doing business with you. Now, Union Airways, 8 a.m., followed by a rail connection the rest of the way. I'm afraid there was no airport near Cliffordville back then. You'll arrive at noon. Exactly 50 years ago. And needless to say, I wish you everything that you deserve. Little lady, you don't have to wish me anything. I'll get everything I go after. Everything. You know, Mr. Feathersmith, I believe you. In fact, I have no doubt whatsoever. Care for a cigar? Here's your stop, sir. Are you sure? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, yes. Yes, there, there's the town square. <laughs> you need a hand with your bags? I don't have any bags, and I don't need a hand from anybody. Then, then good day to you, sir. Enjoy your stay in Cliffordville. All aboard! Cliffordville. <laughs> the devil, you say. Yes, sir. May I help you? I'd like to see the president of the bank. That would be Mr. Gibbons. Do you have an appointment? No, but he'll see me. He's having his lunch right now. Tell him uh, Mr. Feathersmith is here to talk about investments. Some very important investments. All right, sir. I'll tell him. Take your time, sweetie. <laughs> By the time the bank closes, I'll have this dumpy little milk stop tied up with a ribbon around it deliverable to me. I'll only be a moment, sir. I don't normally let business interfere with pleasure. I never allow pleasure to interfere with business. The name is Feathersmith. I'm not a peddler, a drummer, or door-to-door -door salesman. I'm here to make myself rich. And in the process, you pick up a few crumbs of your own. I beg your pardon? The Widow Turner's Land. The south end of town. Is it available? The Widow Turner's Land. There were 1,400 acres. Mr. Gibbons, is there an echo in here? No, no indeed. It's just that, well, sir, you're talking about a valuable piece of property, a beautiful spot, singing birds and constant sunshine, a garden of Eden for a man with vision. The potential is unlimited. It's a swamp for mosquitoes, and the potential's malaria. I just want you to tell me who owns it and how much they want for it. As a matter of fact... It was purchased from the late Mrs. Turner's estate by yours truly, in partnership with a Mr. Sebastian Diedrich. Diedrich, huh? What do you know? Well, do you suppose you and Mr. Diedrich could be persuaded to part with your land, assuming the price is right? As valuable as it is, well, sir, everything has its price. How does $8 an acre sound? Lovely. Good. Good. 
if I were an idiot. But I'm not an idiot, Mr. Gibbons. I'll give you one dollar an acre. Well, why don't we strike a compromise and say six dollars? Let's say one fifty. You drive a hard bargain. Mr. Diedrich and I might hold still for four dollars an acre. Mr. Gibbons, you wouldn't hold still for a back rub if it couldn't be converted into currency. Two dollars an acre, and that's it. Two, you say? Two, I said. And ten minutes from now, it'll go down to one sixty. Going, going, gone, Mr. Feathersmith. I presume this will be a cash transaction. You bring the deed over to my hotel tonight, properly signed and notarized, and you'll have your money. Well, now, sir, this is the way I like to do business. No fiddling around. Just two staunch men of goodwill who know what they want. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Feathersmith? I'll agree with you all the way down the line, Mr. Gibbons, as long as you keep both hands on the table. Ah, Mr. Feathersmith. Right on time. I don't believe you two gentlemen have met. This is my associate, Mr. Diedrich. How do you do? Yes, I recognize you, Mr. Diedrich. So very, very much younger, though. You have me at a disadvantage, sir. Never mind. Sit down. Please. I presume you have the cash. Fourteen hundred and three acres. Twenty-eight hundred and six dollars. Hmm. You like to put all your eggs in one basket, don't you, Mr. Feathersmith? Oh, don't concern yourself, Mr. Diedrich. I happen to have an exclusive contract with the hen. <laughs> <laughs> Waiter, uh, beers all around. Uh, right away, sir. All right, gentlemen. Uh, let's get down to cases, shall we? When it comes to a fast shuffle, I don't mind telling you I'm a very knowledgeable dealer. Comment, Mr. Diedrich. Uh, you have the floor, Mr. Feathersmith. You seem rather anxious to have it. Just a human frailty to gloat a bit when one has just skinned a couple of professional skinners. I suppose you're thinking that when this pigeon flew into town, you plucked him bald. Well, <laughs> I sent a telegram to a geologist this morning. He came in on the one o'clock train, spent the afternoon out at the widow Turner's land, made some preliminary soil tests. <laughs> Care to hear the results? Feel free, sir. Then I'll oblige. That crummy swampland you sold for two bucks an acre is worth a million times that. There's oil in that ground. Oil, understand? Black gold, enough to produce five hundred barrels a day for the next thousand years. <laughs> oh, I swear, I can almost feel sorry for you. <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear me. Oh, we heard you. Oil. How's that for a shocker? Well, at the time, it did make us gulp. At the time, four years ago, when the first geological tests were done, well, there was no doubt then that the land had oil under it, six thousand feet under it. Which means that it might just as well be on the moon. <laughs> There's no way that oil can be taken out. What do you mean, no way? I could drill down a mile, two miles, if need be. You could, perhaps, Mr. Feathersmith, but nobody else on Earth could, unless you've already invented such a drill. Of course, I forgot. It wasn't until several years later that they came up with a drill bit strong enough to. Something wrong, Mr. Feathersmith? Not feeling too well? Something, something I I ate. Oh, something you ate, no doubt. Something like crow, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> but Mr. Cronk, this here is Mr. Mr.、Uh, Feathersmith. Yeah, he says he wants to talk to us about inventions. What kind of inventions? Something that'll turn this two-bit bicycle shop into a factory. Such as? Well, for starters,、um, how about a motor-driven scooter for kids?、Uh, you want to enlarge upon that, Mr. Feathersmith? What do you mean enlarge upon it? It's a gadget that gets kids around town, teenagers too, even businessmen. What's it used for? It's used to make about two hundred million bucks. That's what it's used for. Lightweight aluminum with wheels and an electric motor. <laughs> What's wrong with foot power? Everyone's going to want these. Kids will be begging Santa Claus for them. Look, I'm handing you the whole thing on a platter. All you have to do is build it. 
Well, I'll tell you what. You draw me a blueprint and some specifications, and Mr. Clark and I will give it a try. I'm no crummy draftsman. I've given you the principle. All you have to do is manufacture it. Not without a blueprint and specs and some backing. You have any money? I can get it. Anyone with a little imagination could see. Well, only place that makes loans around here is the bank. That'd be Mr. Gibbons. You better talk to him first, with your blueprints, of course. I don't need you. What other machine shops are there in this hick town? Well, you might try Otis over at the gas station. He's got all kinds of tools. Of course, he's pretty busy regrooving people's tires. See you in the funny papers, boys. You'll live to regret this. Mark my words. What was his name again? Featherhead? <laughs> <laughs> Modems, you connect your home computer to the telephone line. Y your home what? Cable television, you pick up the signal from a satellite. What's a satellite? Listen, you download it over a dish network. Dishes? But nobody watches TV in the kitchen. Pantyhose, I say take off your garter belt now and throw it out, now. And I say get out of my store, all the way out. You have a filthy mouth, sir. Diedrich! I know this is your house. Come out here. Who's out there? It's me, Feathersmith. Do you know what time it is? It's 50 years too early, that's what time it is. Listen, I, I played it all wrong. I, I should have had it done the way it happened in the first place. It, I'll, I'll start in the morning, just like I did before. I, what are you talking about? You said I had get up and go. You, you said I had drive. Then I went to work for you and I moved up from there. You want to do what again? I want to go to work for you. I wouldn't hire you if you were the last man on earth. You're a loudmouth clod born to get suckered out of his last quarter. Now let me have my sleep. <sighs> oh, I got, got to rest. Oh, this pain in my chest. Oh. Are you all right, sir? You look pale. Why don't you sit down on this bench? Doc Wagner? Is that you? Now, you must be the new fella in town. Nothing but idiots in this place. Now, now, take it easy. Hmm. That's not a very good pulse. Not good at all. Never mind that. Never mind that. Ha how do I get through to these village idiots here? They're peddling their lives away on bicycles, and I'm trying to give them the space age. I don't know much about that, but I can tell a bad pulse when I feel one, and yours feels like the heart of a 75-year-old man. You sure don't take care of yourself. What did you say? The pulse of a what? A man in his 70s. If I've said it before, I've said it a hundred times. Modern man dries himself to an early grave just trying to keep up with the pace of life nowadays. Why? That dirty, cheap little thief! She didn't change me inside. That's why I'm so tired. That's why I can't make it here, because inside I'm old, the way I was. Swallow two of these pills. You horse doctor! I remember when you were diagnosing acute appendicitis as cramp colic. Go on, get out of here. You couldn't diagnose anything. Well, I can diagnose insanity when I see it. And that's what my diagnosis is in your case. Insanity. Plain and simple. I don't need you. I don't need this jerkwater town. If I were you, I'd check myself in for observation. At a mental hospital. Well, you're not me. It was that Devlin dame. That dirty, two-timing little hustler. Why, Mr. Feathersmith, everything all right? You look a bit queasy. You miserable! Now, let's be fair. Nothing was said about changing your chronological age. You wanted to look 30. And you do. We said nothing about your insides. Your heart, veins, kidneys. What, what, what about this town? You wanted it as it was. The contract was very specific. 
It's really not my fault that your memory is so imperfect. And as to the possibility of investments, your problem was that you leapt before you looked. But everything else is wrong, too. I mean, the deals, the inventions. They've never heard of space shuttles or microchips or... Of course they haven't. And you, Mr. Feathersmith, because you're a wheeler dealer, a raider, because you're a taker instead of a bringer, you are now what is commonly referred to as behind the old eight ball. Look, I, I don't want much. I, I swear to you, make it the way it was, that's all. Get me back with Dietrich. Let me start out there, that's all I ask. I think we might be able to arrange that. Mind you, purely as a gesture of sympathy, though it hurts me to mouth the word. Frankly, you are so unhappy, so totally abject a creature that I cannot find it in my... well, in the place where you'd normally find a heart, to leave you here. There's a train out at midnight. A special train. Bless you, Miss Devlin. Please. I won't forget this. There is a small surcharge for the service. How much? Forty dollars. Things do cost, Mr. Feathersmith. I don't have forty dollars. I, I don't have ten. I don't have... What's this in your pocket? Well, how about that? This is your night. You have one negotiable item left. The deed. All you need to do is liquidate it. But who'd buy it? That I wouldn't know. What do I do? You've got a few seconds. Find yourself a customer. It's as simple as that. But where? There's a young fellow over there on his way home. You could ask him. It's bargain night, right here. Huh? 1,400 acres of singing birds, constant sunshine. All for 40 bucks. Here, please. Well, for $40, I might be able to... All aboard! Please hurry. There, there. You won't be sorry. You'll be rich. Hey, hey, what's, what's your name, young fella? Uh, Hackett, sir. Bill Hackett. Yes, want something? I was gonna clean up, sir. So clean up. Who are you? Feathersmith, sir. <laughs> Great old town. What is, sir? I was just thinking about Cliffordville. That's where I grew up, got my start. That's a coincidence. I I grew up in Cliffordville, too. Well, now, how similar we are, Mr. Feathersmith. We both came from Cliffordville, and we both put our pants on one leg at a time. And here we both wind up in the same building, each with his own particular function, eh? Yes, sir, our, our own particular function. They, yeah, well... They gave me a gold watch four years ago. My 40th year is a custodian. Well, now, maybe for your next 40 years, if you really apply yourself, Featherstone, I'll get you a box of these imported Cuban cigars. What do you think of that? That sounds great, Mr. Hackett, sir. Have one now, why don't you? On me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. William J. Feathersmith, tycoon, who tried the track one more time and found it muddier than he remembered it, proving with at least some degree of conclusiveness that nice guys don't always finish last, and some people should quit when they're ahead. Our tale of Iron Man and Irony delivered FOB from the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. 
The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Of late, I think of Cliffordville, starring H.M. Winant, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling from a story by Malcolm Jameson. Heard in the cast were Susan Hart, Joe Forbrook, Doug James, Christian Stolte, Mike Baccarella, Jeff Lupatin, Meg Falcon, Jessica Schramm, Lynn Foley, Carl Amari, and Christy Schramm. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Anything on the radar? Uh, not yet. No signal at all. Try 4.0, true. It'll probably come from that direction. I had her on that all morning, sir. Still nothing. You're past your time, aren't you? Who's your relief? Al Baines, Captain. Baines? <laughs> I'll see what happened to him. Yes, sir. Morning, all. Anything yet? Afraid not. They lost, you figure? There's no telling. Okay, if we fill our containers now? Go ahead. As long as the water supply holds out. Be a while till the next batch is ready. Julie! Where's your husband? He... he was sleeping, Captain. Get him, Julie. Is something wrong? There's something wrong. Yes, sir. How does it taste today, Henry? Same as always, hot, flat, and unforgettable. <laughs> but wet. Suffer it a little bit more. Six months from now, you'll be drinking chocolate ice cream sodas. You want to see me, Captain? There's a man in the radar tower who'd like to see you, Al. He would have liked to see you two hours ago when you were supposed to relieve him. I overslept. Tell that to Hank Parker up there in the tower. Tell him you overslept and then be good enough to tell him, Al, that you'll stand his watch all day tomorrow. That's not fair, Captain. It doesn't happen often. Once is too often, Al. More than once is intolerable. And many more than once is a case history of Albert Baines who likes his sleep. I prefer it to a stupid game in the hot sun, both of them. A game, Al? What are we listening for? Thirty years of two shifts a day. What have we ever heard? Wind noise. And what have we ever picked up on the radar screen? Dust particles? But anything to make you happy, Captain. You listen to me. There's a ship on its way. And when it reaches this atmosphere, it may want to be vectored in. They may want landing instructions, wind direction, ground temperature. And if Al Baines is in the sack 
we may spend the rest of our lives here. Is that what makes you happy, Al? How do we know there's a ship out there, Captain? A lot of garbled static two months ago that you told us was a message, and then nothing. Two whole months, and you decide there's a ship coming here to take us back. You make the rules and set the watches and plan the days, and now you tell us the Messiah is coming. To tell us to pray? The difference between you and me, Captain Benteen, is that I do my dreaming when I'm asleep. You do yours on your feet. There's a ship coming, Al. All of us believe it. Because he tells you to. And we believe him. Whatever Captain Benteen says, that's what will happen. Sure you believe him. He tells you this is the best of all possible worlds, and by God, you break into song. You're sweating your lives away on this rock, but the captain says it's paradise and we have to clap our hands. Rule by hypnosis. Al, there's a ship coming. This happens to be a fact. There's a ship coming. Believe it. I tell you, it'll happen. And you know it's real, just as you know this is real. You haven't forgotten our ship, have you? The Pilgrim One, the first spaceship sent up to colonize the outer regions, and this plaque placed here by the 130 men, women, and children who established the first off-Earth colony. We owe them our belief because they had faith. Don't ever forget that. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd better go check on the generator. This is William Benteen, who officiates on a small outpost in space, an outpost slowly disintegrating under the heat of two suns, with the holes, the cracks, the fissures that are the residue of despair. He tries to fill them with faith and to retain a faith of his own. This is a remnant society, a handful of people who left the Earth looking for a millennium, a place without war, without jeopardy, without fear. What they found was a lonely, barren place whose only industry was survival. And this is what they have done for decades, survive. Until the memory of the Earth, they came from what has become an indistinct and shadowed recollection of another time and another place. Two months ago, a signal from Earth announced that a ship would be coming to pick them up and take them home. In just a moment, we'll hear more of that ship, more of that home, and what it takes out of mind and body to reach it. Because this outpost is located in the far reaches of the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, On Thursday We Leave for Home, starring Barry Bostwick with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Can't keep the generator running, sir. No wonder. Look at these wires. They're rotten. That's all we got, Captain. No backup? This is it. Any insulation? That's all gone, too. We used it on the uh, converter belts. Well, we have to get the current running somehow. If that refrigeration unit stays off, the temperature in the underground rooms will go up 50 degrees. Well, we could stop the saltwater converter for a day or so, switch the parts. Then we'll have to do that. Tell the people to fill up all the jugs they have. We'll be shutting off the water in six hours. Yes, sir. Captain? What about the ship? It's on the way. We know that much. Then everything will be different. When we get back, the things that are old and worn out, we'll throw them away. Just throw them away. Captain, Captain, Captain Benteen. What? 
The main square, come quick. It's Mrs. Rodale. She's hanged herself. Cut her down. Oh! Mommy, what happened? Is that lady all right? Get them out of here. Come, children. God have mercy on her. You men there, prepare her. We'll bury her in an hour. Yes, sir. We now consign to... to this planet the remains of Mary Rodale. We ask God in his infinite mercy to give her the serenity and joy that she sought while she was with us. And we ask his forgiveness for her sin. Amen. 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 We ask that this good woman be allowed to rejoin her beloved husband who preceded her in death 11 years ago. Bid your farewells now. Forgive her, Lord. Have mercy on her, Lord, for what she's done. A terrible thing. She didn't know what she was doing. She knew what she was doing. Better and clearer than the rest of us. Oh, Al. This is a funeral, Al. The ninth funeral in the last six months. Nobody talks about it. We just let it go by. But there have been nine people who thought that maybe heaven is a place where they can get a drink of water without salt in it where they'll be able to breathe air without choking on the heat of it. If you want to talk blasphemy, I'll take it away from here. I'm talking truth, Captain Mentine. I'm saying that this woman and the others, they took their own lives because living became intolerable. And I say that dying was their right. Anything else? Just this question. I put it to everyone here. Al, please. No! Isn't living tough enough that we don't have to do it by the book? Isn't it hot and blinding and miserable enough that there shouldn't have to be rules? So that we shouldn't have to suffer by the numbers? Will anyone make the simple observation that there's far more happiness going into that hole than what's left above ground? There's more peace of mind in that dead body than in all you mourners put together. We've got here is anguish. Captain Benteen, let us live with it or die from it in our own way. Young Mr. Baines here wants us to lie down in the sun. Young Mr. Baines would have us give in to death when there is still life. He would end all the rules. He'd throw away the regulations. There'd be no standing in line for water. Let the strong take it away from the weak. No rationing of food. Let the young steal it from the old. And when that ship comes down to take us back to Earth, it won't find a society. It will find only a pack. There'll be no human beings left. Only animals. There's a ship coming. It's winging its way in now. It's on its way. Say it. Say it out loud. Let me hear you say it. There's a ship coming. 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 That's right. There's a ship. A ship. Yes. A ship that's coming to take us. Hear that? Can you hear that, everyone? Do you hear? It's the. Meteor storm! It's a meteor storm! Find shelter! Get inside! Up to the cave! Get up to the cave! Julie! It's Julie! She's bleeding! Quickly! We have to move! I can't. Something hit my arm. I think it's broken. Stand aside. I'll carry it. How 
is she? It's just a cut to the forehead. Not very deep. But keep this bandage on it. Julie? Julie, honey? Can you hear me? Al? Don't let her move just yet. She may have a concussion. How's your arm? It's not broken. Must have been a rock that hit it. Captain, thank you. For a little first aid, <laughs> no thanks necessary. I deliver babies, too. You might want to keep that in mind. Now I'd better go see to the others. Will it go on much longer, Captain? I wish I knew. It sounds like it's spending itself. I've seen meteor storms before, Captain, but nothing this size. What about the damage, Henry? Two underground cells destroyed. At least, that's what it looked like from out front. Everybody accounted for? I think we're all here, Captain. I've checked. Nobody's missing. Thank God. Everyone try to stay calm. The worst of it is over. Jojo? Yeah, Captain? You're not scared, are you? Well, kinda. Now, we can't have that. Mind if I sit for a minute? We'll talk, you and me. Captain, tell me about the Earth. Would you, Captain? Tell us what you remember. Yes, do. Well, all right, I guess I can do that. We'd like to hear. You, over there, is that you, Fran? Yes, Captain. And you, Buck. Yes, sir. You fill in the holes if I leave out anything. Straighten me out if I'm wrong about any of my recollections. Jojo, I was a boy of 15 when we arrived here. But I remember Earth. I remember it as, as a place of color. I remember that in the autumn, the leaves changed. They turned different colors, red, gold, orange. And I remember streams of water that flowed down hillsides. And the water was sparkling and clear. And I remember clouds in the sky, white, billowy things that floated like great majestic ships. They looked like sails. What are sails? Don't you know what sails were? In ancient times, that's how ships moved across the water. There was so much water. The men unfurled large sheets of canvas against the wind. And it was the wind that moved them. And I can remember night skies. Night. Endless black velvet stars, and sometimes a moon that seemed to hang there as, as big as the face of an old man, looking down on us all. Captain, what's night? Why, that was the quiet time, Jojo. Night was when the earth went to sleep. It was the cover it pulled over itself. Not like here, with two suns always shining, always burning. It was a darkness that felt like... like a cool hand brushing over tired eyes. And there was snow on winter nights. Gossamer things that drifted down and turned the earth all white. And we could build snowmen the next morning and see our breath in the air. And... It was good then. It was right. So, why did you leave there? Oh, we thought we could find another Earth, Jojo. Then we found... this. We thought we could escape war. We thought, uh, we thought we could build an even better place. And it took us 20 years to find out that we had left our home a billion miles away only to be stranded, like visitors, 
transients, that no roots could take hold in this ground. But it was too late. So we spend the next 30 years watching a clock and a calendar and waiting. But we can't wait any longer. Not a day, not an hour. We have to get back home. There's no more time. I'll go outside and survey the damage. Charm. Radar towers still standing. What? Why, it's... Al! Al Baines, do you hear that noise? All of you, come out here! Do you hear it? What is that? It's not a meteor That's not a meteor. And it's not wishful thinking. Not this time. Those are rocket engines. Look, I remember the sound of it. That's the ship! The ship has come at last! Pretty fast. Watch your step. It looks like you got plenty of room for everybody. Do you have any water? Clean water? We have enough. Oh, doesn't that sound wonderful? Delicious. Careful. I better talk to your leader. You have one, don't you? Sure do. Captain Benteen. I don't see... You're standing over there. Hey, Captain, come see the ship. Mr. Benteen? I'm Benteen. Colonel Sloan. I command the Galaxy 6. Our orders are to transport you all back to Earth. <laughs> Colonel, what took you so long? Six and a half months, Mr. Benteen. A hundred times that. We've been waiting for 30 years. Does it all look like this? Salt flats and scrubby mountains. Two suns, hot and perpetual. Thirty years of it. Thirty years. The children have never seen Earth, and some of the older ones don't even remember it. They'll see it now. Our orders are to get you aboard as soon as possible. We figure that we should be able to lift off on Thursday. Are you still using Earth time? Of course. Good. That'll give you three days to prepare. Unfortunately, your people will only be able to take what they can carry. Over 200, aren't there? 187 men, women, and children. It may be a little crowded, but we'll fit you all in. You've been used to a lot of space, Mr. Benteen, haven't you? Space? Room to move around. Oh, that's all there is here. That and the heat. I can feel it. They'll make the trip standing on their heads if necessary. I'm sure they will, but I don't think that'll be necessary. Do you know? Can you understand? What a godsend this is for all of us. It's hard to imagine. I can only say your country's very, very proud of you. What of the Earth? Has it changed? Not too much. Still green? Still green. And the cities? The cities still stand. And war? As always, I'm afraid. One dies down, another one springs up. But through some miracle and the grace of God, we never had the big one. Now, Mr. Benteen, all things considered, I think you'll find it very much as you left it. Captain Benteen. Captain? That's what the people call me. This place, their very lives, it's all been my responsibility. You've done quite a job, Captain Benteen. But you can rest easy. I'll take over the responsibilities now. No need. I'm used to the job, Colonel. 
the living quarters. They're underground. I was saying, Colonel, I'm used to the responsibility. I wouldn't quite know how to function without it. Is it cooler there, Mr. Benteen? I'm sorry, I didn't... Your underground rooms, are they much cooler? Yes, they're refrigerated. Uh, it's... it's... Captain. Morning, Captain. George. The best morning ever. We just wanted to say thank you, Captain. Why? For what? For keeping us alive all these years. That's right. Without the Captain... None of us would be here. That's not necessary. You better believe it, Colonel. I do. I do believe it, Captain Benteen. Go ahead, Colonel Sloan. That's all right. I'll see to the others. You know, I don't need this. I'm not going to take this. Hi, Captain. Julie, where's your bandage? Oh, I don't need it anymore. But we put one around your head so the cut would heal. What's this? Isn't it incredible? It's called a medicinal patch. You wear it for 24 hours... It accelerates the growth of new skin. Look at a forehead, Captain. You can hardly see the scratch. Better put the sling back on your arm, Al. I don't need a sling. Just this metal band. It's magnesium. Colonel Sloan said my arm would be perfect by the end of the week. Well, I, uh... I seem to have had my practice taken away from me. But while we're here, I'd use that sling. I'll bet I've fixed about 500 broken wings in my time, and the only way to be sure it heals properly is to keep the limb immobile. Where's Colonel Sloan? I want to ask him what to pack. Uh, Eleanor, uh, let me help you with that bundle of clothing. Thank you kindly, Captain. I'll carry it for you. No, thank you, crewman. I've got it. Here you go, ma'am. I don't know how to thank you. Are all the crew as strong as you? That's our job, ma'am. Nothing to it. <laughs> Hello there, Captain. Well, I'm so excited. How much longer? Not long. Be patient. May I have your attention, everyone? <laughs> yeah. Good question. Quiet, please. What is it, Captain? As all of you know, we have less than 36 hours before we depart. And as I told you earlier, there is a maximum allowance of 14 pounds per person. Soon we'll begin weighing your belongings, and if we're over the limit, I'll make up a list of necessary items. I hope I'm not intruding, Captain. I was just telling them about the weight requirements. We'll handle all that tomorrow. I heard you'd called a meeting here in the cave, so I brought Lieutenants Engel and Rafferty with me. Everyone has so many questions about Earth, I thought perhaps this would be a good time. Actually, Colonel, the purpose of this meeting is simply to make some last-minute arrangements. Colonel, I used to live in San Diego. Is California still the same? Sunny and warm most of the time, but not this warm. Los Angeles has become the biggest city in the world. These kinds of questions, we could just as well handle them when... Colonel Sloan? Are there still major leagues? My dad used to tell me about baseball and the World Series. The leagues are just as before, American and national. What about the Dodgers? <laughs> they, they came in tenth last season. I'm told they need pitchers pretty desperately. I'll tell you what. When we're finished here, we'll improvise a ball and bat and have ourselves a game. How's that sound? Yes. That'd be great. Let's do it. I, th I, think, I think it's a little hot for that kind of activity. What we could do is have some group singing. We haven't done that for a while. I got an old sack. That'll be the ball. Who's got a stick? What are we waiting for? Let's go. Please. Please, wait. We haven't finished yet. Jojo. Jojo, I haven't told you a story in a long time. How would you like to hear a story about... What have you got there? This is what they call candy. One of the spacemen gave it to me. It tastes... It tastes... Sweet, Jojo. It tastes sweet. Yeah, sweet, Captain. Want a bite? No, oh, thank you, Jojo. Back on Earth, we can get all we want. Something, Captain? I'm not sure. I'm not at all sure. You've promised them all candy. 
You've made it sound as if, uh, as if that was what the earth is made of. Sugar and spice and everything nice. Maybe, maybe they ought to be told the truth. The universal language. Baseball. You have a limited vocabulary, Colonel. Do you have any idea what the temperature is? At this hour, it's about 110. I don't know whether your crew can take it, but I know my people. They're going to pay for this little athletic event. Some of the older ones, it might even be serious for them. It's just a game, Benteen. My guess is that it's worth it. Now, I'd better get back to the ship. Colonel Sloan. Something else, Mr. Benteen? Colonel, when we get on the ship, you can tell us what to do and we'll all fall into line. But here, in this place, I'm in command. I'm not trying to usurp authority, Mr. Benteen, but I really don't see what harm a little game... It's still Captain Benteen. For now. <sighs> Galaxy crewmen, back to the ship. That's an order. Oh, come on. It's time for rest now. All of you go back to your home. I'll announce when the new day will start. You happy now, Captain? I was never unhappy, Colonel. I just happen to know what's right and what's wrong. I ask you to keep your crew in the ship during the rest time. I don't want my people distracted. You rule with a heavy fist. If it were one ounce lighter, no one would have survived. I've held these people together by will. They'd have died, Colonel. Without someone they could hold on to, they'd have withered away. Not anymore, Captain. Relax. That's a luxury I've never been able to afford, Colonel. I've never been able to marry, to think only of myself, because of them. I've been a father figure, a governor, a confessor. I've been all those things. And if I hadn't been, there'd be no life here. These are my people. Understand? My people. What's with him, Colonel? Now bear with him a little bit longer, fellas. He's really quite a man. He's got just one minor aberration. And what's that? He believes he's God. As far as he's concerned, we're booting him out of heaven. Mr. Captain Benteen is here, sir. Showman. Very well, sir. Come in, Captain. Sorry my quarters are a bit cramped. Please, sit down. Colonel Sloan, this is a list of all passengers with their approximate weight and the weight of their belongings after each name. The scale we have is pretty beat up. My guess is that it underweighs by about four or five pounds. Fine, fine. All I wanted was an approximation. We'll weigh them in on our own equipment before blast off. This is Wednesday, 12 midnight? I keep getting confused with the constant light. When do the people get up? About two Earth time. The hours from 7 until 1.45 are the hottest. That's when we try to stay indoors. Then we have our meetings at the cave about two hours afterwards. We've had to improvise our own schedule. You've improvised very well, Captain. I looked at the saltwater converter, your electro plant, the sun shield you put up over the crops. Very inventive. Necessity hasn't been the mother of invention here, it's been the father and the whole family. <laughs> well, you'll be able to give way to progress now. Though I wonder if all of it'll be to your liking. The way you'll be lionized when you get back to Earth. You're referred to in the press as the lost pioneers. They're gonna make quite a thing of you when we land. Oh? Wherever any of your people settle, there'll be keys to the cities, brass bands. I expect they'll scatter all over the U.S. The government's had inquiries by, well, it must be thousands of relatives. My guess is that they'll just about have time to look into a television camera and then get whisked off. Well, they won't be scattered, Colonel. They'll go as a group. We'll find a place where we can settle, and that's where we'll stay. I, 
I'm talking about when we get back to Earth, Captain. That's what I'm talking about. They won't be splitting up. Not my people. Captain, as a point of interest, did you ever ask them? Ask them what? Whether they'd want to stay together. That would be a ridiculous question, like asking a child if he wants some more, uh, some more ice cream. They're children, you see, Colonel. Oh, chronologically, they range from six months to 60-odd years, but socially, psychologically, they're children. I've kept them alive and functioning all this time. Once we're back on Earth, I'll simply continue the process. Captain Benteen, have you told them that? Have you told them that after 30 years of waiting, 30 years of living in a compound, they're going to travel a billion miles just to walk into another one? Have you? There's no need. They wouldn't have it any other way. To leave them to their own devices, that would be an act of cruelty. Captain, do me one favor. Just ask them. Naturally, we won't have to concern ourselves with the colder climates. The northeastern states, the upper regions of the Great Plains, will find an area much farther to the south, perhaps Florida or Texas. Southern California has a temperate climate. Uh, Captain! You better tell us about frostbite treatment, because I'm moving to Wisconsin. That's where my family settled originally. What about Oregon, Captain? That's where Joan and I plan to settle. I've heard about the forest there. Please, wait a minute. You don't understand. <clears throat> Let me make this clear. All of you will have a chance to meet your relatives. I see no reason why visits can't be arranged, perhaps even for a week or more. But naturally, we'll remain together as a community in whatever land grant we obtain from the government or whatever given area we can arrange. I can assure you of one thing, and I hope put all your fears to rest. I'll remain as your, well, your guide, your consultant. And I guarantee that no one will lack for my help or my advice. Captain? Julie, Julie and I were thinking of farming. Why, that's a fine idea, Al. We'll farm just as we have farmed, but much more easily. The rainfall back on Earth is so plentiful. And as I told you, there's only one sun, so you won't have to shield the crops. Of course we'll farm. Certainly, we'll farm. Julie's got relatives in the state of Washington. You couldn't take the cold. None of you could. But I guarantee that wherever we settle, the farming will be good. I'll see to that. What's the matter? Don't you understand? We... we don't plan to stay together. You don't understand, Al. You've never understood much of anything. If we split up, I seriously doubt that we'd survive. Al, explain it to him. Go on. We'll survive, Captain. If anyone wants to stay together, that'll be their right. But if they want to go their own way, that'll be their right, too. Am I wrong, Colonel? You're not wrong. We're to take you back as a group. Once on Earth, you can do as you please. Colonel, let us settle our differences in our own way. There are no differences, Captain. There are differences. There are changes that have taken place on Earth. Things we aren't prepared for. Oh, the Colonel has made it sound like a big holiday. The good life just plucked off a tree. Well, friends, I don't want any of you disillusioned. Wherever men live, they grub, they scrabble. They have to dig to stay alive. It's a fact. But together, that's the word, together, we've got to stay together. Think of that word now. Let's say it out loud. Everybody, now, together, 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 together. Looks like the congregation isn't with you anymore, Captain. What's the matter with all of you people? Wait. I've made the compartment assignments. I'd like to go over them with you. Assignments? There's not much time, and there's some things we have to check off. There's a decompression problem that we've got to tell them about, and a moment of weightlessness shortly after we leave the atmosphere that... I want to explain to the children. Do you know, do you know 
what we called you while we waited for you to come. We called you the Messiah. Did you? You were supposed to bring freedom, but that's not what you brought. You brought selfishness, dissatisfaction, divisiveness. With all the misery we've had here, those germs never infected us. I brought nothing but a ship and a crew and a means of escape. You've had no diseases, no viruses. Did it ever occur to you why? You've lived in a test tube, Captain. Antiseptic and germ-free and sterile. Sure, you're a group, a cell, but that's all over with. Now it's time for you to be what God meant you to be, individuals. Time to break the test tube. Time to rejoin the human race. What I'd like to know is why in the name of God you're so reluctant about it. Because I remember the human race. This is incredible. Oh, it's really incredible. I was wrong, Colonel. I've been telling them about an Earth that doesn't exist. An imaginary garden. No. We can't go back. It's too late. Captain, really. Everybody, gather around. I've got something to tell you. Listen to me, all of you. Uh, I want to tell you all... Uh, listen to me, uh, uh, all of you. I, I want to tell you about the real Earth. Captain, are you all right? Let's talk about the diseases. What? The viruses. The, the cancers. The floods and the freezing, the wetness and the cold. And there are other, other miseries. Worse than anything we've experienced. Hatred. Jealousy. Violence. Listen to me. It's an Earth we don't know. We can't leave here. We'd be committing suicide. We'd die of, of things we've never been exposed to before. We'd die of the loneliness that animals get in a zoo. Because we don't belong. We don't belong to his kind. Do you understand me? We don't belong there. Captain Benteen, why don't you let your children vote on it? Only if they know what's waiting for them. Only if they understand that Earth isn't any garden. It's never been, and it never will be. That's fair enough. I'll tell you what Earth is. The same as it's always been. It's a race struggling to survive, just as you have survived. Captain Benteen is right when he tells you that it isn't all a place of beauty. There may still be wars and prejudice and strife. I suppose there will always be jealous men and angry men and unforgiving men. But it has one thing you don't have. Every man is his own master. There won't be anyone telling you when to eat and when to sleep and when to meet, what to sing and how to play. Instead of heat, you may feel cold, and instead of thirst, you may feel hunger. But you'll be men and women. You won't be sheep. You won't be a kindergarten. And when you pray to God, his name won't be Benteen. A vote now, Captain. And the majority wins. Those of you who want to be on the ship ten hours from now, heading back to Earth, step forward. All right, I'm going. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. That's it. Let's go. I suppose that makes it unanimous, Benteen. Even you, Jojo. Well, I want to go with the Colonel. Give me something, anything. Give that sledgehammer. Here. Angle! Rafferty! There, sir. Stop him! He's running for the ship! No, no, no! Captain! Captain, no, please! I gotta grab him! Grab him! We'll see how far you get. Without a tail fin! Put it down! Ah! Uh. Ah! Uh, uh. You all right, Colonel? I'm fine. What about the ship? Just a couple of dents, nothing serious. Lucky you stopped them when you did. Captain Benteen, let go. For everyone's sake, loosen your grip and let go! God help you. God help you all. 
tomorrow you think you're getting on a ship headed for paradise. What you don't realize is you're heading for hell. What about you? I'll stay here. That's right. This is my home. This is where I belong. This is where you belong. You just don't have the brains or the guts or the sense to know it. This ship leaves at 0800 tomorrow. If you're not on board... I want no special privileges, Colonel Slow. No special treatment. If you're to blast off at 8, you blast off at 8. As for the rest of you, you can go on the ship or you can remain here with me. I'll be at the cave. Any who want to remain can meet me there. That's it, folks. The rocket's fired up. Everybody on board, single file. What about the captain? I'll give it one last try. Lieutenant Engel, see to the passengers. I'll be right back. Yes, sir. Where are you going, sir? To the cave. Captain? Benteen? Benteen, we know you're in here. Please, let us talk to you. He's not going to show himself, Colonel. We're leaving now. We have to blast off in five minutes. If we don't, we'll have lost our orbital position. Benteen, it has to be now. Captain! Captain, please, come out! Remember this. If we leave without you, there'll be no other ships. This is where you'll live the rest of your life. And this is where you'll die. All right, Benteen. As you prefer. Let's go, Baines. Goodbye, Captain. Hello, hello, friends, all together at the meeting place. Any new business today? No? Jojo, I'll bet you want to hear about Earth, about the rivers and the seas, the, the blue skies, or the night, the stars and the moon. Which do you want to hear about this time? Uh, there's, um, well, there's color on Earth, the change of seasons, and the wind, the wind brings the smell of the ground, the plants, the seeds, the roots, flower petals, sap from the trees, and the smell of the weather, the rain or the mist or the fog. And on the earth, on the earth, there's green, the color green, the feeling green. There's something fresh about it, something living. Earth. It's called Earth. Don't. Don't, don't leave me. Please, oh, don't leave. A man named Benteen, sometimes known as Captain, 
who had certain prerogatives. He could lead, judge, legislate, even dictate. It became a habit, and finally, a necessity. William Binti, once a god, now a population of one, on a distant outpost in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. On Thursday, we leave for home. Starring Barry Bostwick with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Christian Stolte, Elizabeth Lido, C.J. Amari, Richard Hensel, Justin Kaufman, Kurt Nabig, Joby Cerny, Jennifer Joy, Meg Thalkin, Tracy Hernandez, Jake Salins, Doug James, Jeff Lupiton, and Amanda Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Out of my way, you vermin! What are pigs doing out on the street anyway? It's not sanitary. You should be in a sty or a sandwich. Good morning, friend Woodrow. What's so good about you? Oh, that's the spirit. Keep your chin up. Uh, what'll it be this morning? Daily courier. <clears throat> Daily courier. That'll be two cents, Mr. Mulligan? Two cents? Two cents. Same as always. Seems more expensive. Thank you very much, sir. Now, let's take a look government surplus. Can you believe it? Believe what, Mr. Mulligan? Government only earns a million and a half dollars more than it spends. First thing you know, they'll owe money. Then everything will collapse. Inventory predicts every hundredth man will own a horseless carriage someday. Oh, that's all we need. I already know what the newspaper says, Mr. Mulligan. You don't have to read it back to me. You read it? Of course. My copy? Not your copy, Mr. Mulligan. My copy? I wouldn't dream of tampering with your daily courier. I can assure you no human hands have touched that newspaper. Well, except for the printers, of course. I should think not. At least some people still have standards. Not like Mr. Bowman, the butcher. 
You know how much he's charging for steak? Well, why don't you tell me, like you do every morning round about this time? Seventeen cents a pound! What do they think we are? Millionaires? I don't know. Seventeen cents seems a fair price to me. I really don't know what you have to complain about, Mr. Mulligan. Things aren't so bad. Hello? <laughs> you were saying? The only customers you've had in your store this morning are me and this here pick. Thank you for the overpriced newspaper, Mr. Swanson. Always a pleasure, Mr. Mulligan. Get out of my way! Out of my way! What is this country coming to? It's a madhouse. A madhouse, I say. Hey! Hmm? Something the matter, officer? Something's the matter, all right. Don't you ever look where you cross the road, Mulligan? Look? What are you talking about? Can't you see that horse and carriage coming? Where? There! Oh, yes, I see it. Damn nuisance if you ask me. Well, I didn't ask you. No one's asking you. I ought to run you into the station house. That's what I ought to do. What did I ever do to you, O'Flanagan? It's Officer O'Flanagan. And why don't we start with causing a public nuisance by standing in the middle of the street, waiting to frighten the horses? Just watch your step, Mulligan. You watch your step. <sighs> Just watch your step, Mulligan. Some time to live in, this is. Steak at 17 cents a pound. Hats! A dollar ninety-five. And that lady in the advertisement for Nelson's buggy whips. Shameful. You can see her ankle. Her whole ankle. Hey. Hey. Better move, mister. Whoa. Hey, get off the street. You're going to get run over. You want to get yourself killed? You crazy fool. Don't you know the speed limit's eight miles an hour? Uh, remember what I said about watching your step, Mulligan? Uh, or, or you just might fall in a horse trough. <laughs> or you might just fall in a horse trough. Well, howdy, ha, ha, ha. Look at me. I'm a working man, an honest man, a prideful man. And here I am working as a janitor for some crank of a professor and drying out my soaking pants in a ringer. Where's the dignity? Whole world's going to the dogs. That's where it's going. Nothing but trouble everywhere you look. Chickens and pigs walking in the streets like people. Crazy bicycle riders who don't watch where they're going. Government spending money like a drunken man. Racing bicycles on the streets at cost of living. And noise, noise, noise! What the Sam Hill? Mm. Never heard a ringer make that noise before. Why is it doing that? Wait, 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 wait a second, that's not the ringer. Something in my pants pocket. What is that? Oh, it's me harmonica. Oh, that's just swell. Just my luck. Ruined. Better hang it up to dry next to my pants, I suppose. I guess I should run the newspaper through the ringer, too. Might be able to save it. Not that there's ever any news worth reading. But two cents is two cents. Eh, there you have it. <laughs> Hot off the press. <laughs> it's down here, Fenwick. I want you to be the first to see this. Professor Gilbert? Oh, can't let him see me without my pants on. Here it is, Fenwick. Huh? Huh? Well, what do you think? Why, it's astonishing, Professor Gilbert. I've never seen anything quite like it. Me either. What the heck is that thing anyway? 
So this is it, Professor. Yes, Fenwick. I call it the Helmet of Tomorrow. Well, that's a stupid name. If this invention's any good, why not call it the Helmet of Today? Very interesting. Just think of it, Fenwick. You put this helmet on your head. Twist this dial. Press here to activate. Here? Oh, not now. And uh, you can visit any year you choose. Any year? You could even travel into the far future. The future. How about 1891? No, farther than that. 92? No, 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 no. Think far into the future. How about 1970? Now you're thinking. Incredible. But there is a time limit on its operation. There is, Professor? There is. Purely a precautionary measure. No man should be allowed to interfere with the course of history. Well, how long a period would have functioned, Professor? 30 minutes only. 30 minutes? That's almost half an hour. Yes, it is. Thirty full minutes in which to study the events of whatever future date we care to witness. <laughs> Professor, you're wonderful. Eh? I said it, it's wonderful. Uh, indeed it is, Fenwick. Indeed it is. Are you ready to test it? In good time, all in good time. When I'm ready, I shall take my first journey into the future. To the year... Um, 1962? Oh, who knows what wonders mankind may have achieved by then. Very likely I'll find the world deserted and everyone living on the moon. Or perhaps we'll have a woman president. Well, I hope civilization will progress, Fenwick, not descend into madness. <laughs> but now, before I embark upon my test journey, we must toast this moment with champagne. Champagne! <laughs> champagne! Go, Fenwick! Go! A time helmet. Now that makes sense. A device that gives you a chance to find a time where there's a little peace and quiet. Oh, let's take a look at this thing. How did the professor set the date? This dial thing magic here. What year did he say he wanted to visit 1962? No, oh, that's still too close. Only 72 years off. And a man might live 72 years if he doesn't get hit by a bicycle. Now, me, I want to go beyond a man's lifetime. How about 2000? No, no, a little further. 2050. No, 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 not that far. Maybe a few years earlier. Now, it's called the Helmet of Tomorrow, so I suppose I wear it on my head like this. What's that? What, what, what did I do? Hey! What the heck? I'm on fire! I'm on fire! Water! Got to find some water! Help! Water! Water! Help! Water! Help! 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 Water! Help! Help! Ma'am, of all that's decent, put some pants on. <laughs> Mulligan! Mulligan? Hey, where'd he go? This is our hero, Mr. Woodrow Mulligan, a disgruntled citizen of a small town called Harmony, New York, circa 1890 complete with the high cost of living, bicycles that exceed the speed limit, and horses pulling carriages with reckless abandon, not to mention an oink oink here and a cluck cluck there. Mr. Mulligan, a rather dour critic of his times, is shortly to discover the import of the old phrase, out of the frying pan and into the fire, said fire burning brightly in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Once Upon a Time, starring John Reese davies with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hey! Where am I? 
This doesn't look anything like harmony. <laughs> where, where, where the heck am I? Oh, well, wait a minute. It must have worked. I'm in the future. <laughs> Show you dumb bird. Now, what time is it? It's ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. I've got half an hour to take a look around. You want to get yourself killed? Oh, missed my turn. I better make a hand signal. Watch out! Hey! Hey! The time helmet! Let go of that! That's right! Hey, give it back! You got it hooked on your arm! Oh! I was trying to turn right! I oh, can't get this thing off my hand! Oh, oh there. Got it. There it goes! Oh. Oh, it's, it's, it's rolling down the street right in front of that kid. Awesome. A new helmet. You there, boy, that's mine. Give that to me. Finders keepers, it's mine now. Come back. No way, you freak. This is crazy. How, the, how are you supposed to catch the little brats if you put them on a board with wheels on the bottom? I've got to catch them. Hey, kid, come back. I'm to get the headquarters. Hey, Clancy. The emergency at the drugstore was a false alarm. <laughs> There's not a thing going on here. Just quiet as a... Hey, hold on there. Pull you back, Clancy. I got some lunatic in his underwear chasing after a kid on a skateboard. I'm in pursuit. Stop, police. For God's sake, put some pants on. Flanagan. Oh, new book. No good. The, the boy's getting away. There's no way I can... Ah! Ah! A bicycle! Now we're talking! Hey, that's my bike! Sorry, lady, I just need to borrow it. Thanks! Somebody stop that jerk! He stole my bike! Wish everyone was living on the moon. Streets are more crowded than ever, and he's still too far ahead. I, I, I'd take a shortcut through this, this, this thing. What is a car wash, anyway? Getting all wet. What the blazes is this thing I'm in? Ah! Oh, 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 oh. Oh. <laughs> what kind of infernal contraption was that? Come out of there! Oh, not again! That's the boy. He's going inside that store. This sign says it's a store. It's more like a palace than any store I ever saw. Oh. Look out, you people! Here hey, I come! Hey, watch out! <gasps> hey! Hey! Who closed the doors? Somebody help! I'm gonna crash! I'm gonna crash! I got through. Do they have invisible doormen in this century or something? Hey, hey, kid! Give me that helmet back, you little thief! Take it! It's stupid anyway! Catch! Whoa! 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 Oh. Got it. And it's not damaged. I can go home. I can go home again. <laughs> Six dollars for a pound of steak? Madam, do I look to you like a millionaire? Look out! Look out! What... what just happened? The helmet! Oh no, it's broken. And it's 9.45! I've only got 15 minutes left. How am I going to get back now? Get back, sir? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do I mean? Did they change the language in the last 120 years? I said I need to get back, and I do. But get back to where? Let me understand this, sir. You have this funny-looking hat in your hands, no pants, and you say you've got to get back somewhere within 15 minutes. Is that right? Right. And this hat-like device, what precisely is this thing? This is a time helmet, mister. Time helmet? That's what brought me here. You see, I'm from 1890, and that's where I got to get back to. What? 
You say you're from 1890? What proof have you of this, sir? Proof? Yes, proof. Well, I didn't think I'd need any. Aha! That watch, your shirt and tie, your shoes. Where did you get them? They're mine. Where are your trousers? Hanging up to dry in 1890. Is it possible? Quickly, who is the president? What? I... The president! You mean Benjamin Harrison? Look, mister, I haven't got time... Benjamin Harrison? And before him... Grover Cleveland, of course, but what's that got to do with... I believe you. By George, I believe you. You are from 1890. That is no news to me, mister. Tell me how to get back to 1890. That'll be news. And this is the device, huh? How does it work? Well, you have to... Look, look, look. I don't know how it works. I'm only the janitor. Janitor, eh? Then how does it happen that you came to be in possession of this technological wonder? Why do you talk like that? Never mind. Now, permit me to examine your... your time helmet. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Primitive but functional, yes. Fascinating. Remarkable for its time, really. Or for any time. Ooh, that's curious. What's curious? These look a little like the components you'd find in a digital television. I don't know what that means, mister, but if you think you can fix it, you better hurry. Time limit on it, huh? Thirty minutes, and there's only fourteen of them left. I wasted fifteen of them chasing a boy who took my helmet. And the sixteenth? Talking to you. Hmm. Let me see now. What's going on here? What's the meaning of this? This doesn't look good. Which of you crashed a bike in my store? Who are you, sir? I'm the manager. Would one of you like to explain what's going on here before I call security? An accident, sir. Accident? Merely a minor incident, no harm done. Apart from bicycle tracks on this expensive piece of steak. But, not that that matters now. We are confronted with matters of far greater importance. Why are you talking like that? That's what I said. Look at this place. This is a shambles. And who's this man in his... Well, he hasn't got any... I took them off after I fell in a horse trough. A what? It's a uh, slang for... Uh... Oh, never mind. Come along, sir. Mulligan. Woodrow Mulligan. Where do you think you're going? Out of my way. Oh, no, you don't. Miss Blodgett, call security. I said get out of our way. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Mulligan. We're getting out of here. Hey, hey, where are you going? Excuse me, miss, uh, but have you seen a man dressed like something out of a silent movie, only without any pants? Oh, that policeman, he's after me. Why? Some kind of generational grudge. Don't ask me. Get behind me. What? I said, stand behind me. Excuse me, sir. Have you seen... Uh... I haven't seen anyone, officer. I didn't say anything yet. I haven't seen anyone because, uh... I'm blind. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, my mistake. Hey, if you're blind, where's your dog? No dogs allowed in the store. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, just watch it, that's all. Are you blind? Oh, not me, that guy. There they are! Where? The one you want is standing behind that fat man. Run! What's the time, uh... Rollo. My name is Rollo. And the time is, uh... Hmm, almost 9.50. Sorry, madam. I guess you still need pants in the 21st century, huh? Not in Europe, I believe. But in this country, it's still considered polite. Lend me a coat, will you, Rollo? Oh, of course, here. Excellent. The Home Entertainment Department. We should find the replacement parts we need here. Keep watch. This will only take a moment. It'll have to. 
I want to address a typical American worker. Howdy. Now, you listen to me. I'm listening. I'm going to ask you something. Yes? Do you think it's right that your hard-earned money winds up in the pockets of those people who are quite capable of working and prefer to be a drain on our society? Heck no. But those dummies in Washington say it should. I say, wise up. Hold on a second. Hey, Rolo. Hmm? This fella says I should wise up. That's probably good advice. Who said that? This fella here in the window. That's TV. Who's TV? TV? Television? Uh, oh, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Trust me, you're not missing anything. Can you fix it? The television? The time helmet! I'm certainly going to try, sir. Try? Oh, this is useless. Give me the helmet. No, wait! Where are you going? I don't have a lot of time to take in the sights, but I'm pretty sure I saw a repair shop around here. Over there. Proprietor! Pro yeah! Swanson? Logan Swanson? Is that you? Swanson's my name, buddy. Jack Swanson. What can I do for you? Would you come here for a moment, please? Whatever. I have something that needs your urgent attention. And these are the components you should need. Can you fix it? I can fix anything. Good. Whew. Leave it with me. Come back Thursday about uh, 2 o'clock. Oh, very kind. Yes, we'll be back on Thursday? You don't understand. This man must get back to 1890. 1890? That's right. <laughs> You're in the wrong block, pal. This is only 1600. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You see, this device here is a time helmet, and this man here, Mr. Woodrow, is from the year 1890. What are you, some kind of nut? Look, I'm a scientist, young man. Young man? I'm 38. If you'll just lend me those tools, I'll... Hey, 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 don't touch the tools. But this is... Don't, don't touch. Do not touch the tools. I can't stress that enough. I'd let you sleep with my wife if I had one before I let you touch my tools. Mr. Swanson, do you mind if I read your newspaper? Knock yourself out, pal. Does that mean yes? Yeah, that means yes. We barely have ten minutes to get this man back to his, uh, time continuum. Now, if you'll let me demonstrate, it's a straightforward but delicate operation. All we want is this soldered to that... Don't touch! Do not touch the tools, will you? Can you see that sign? I can see it, yes. It says we do not accept checks. Yeah, well, I'm going to replace it with another sign that says don't, don't touch, touch the, the tools. tools. Right. Excuse me. What? Who is this? That's the president. This is the president? Uh-huh. Of America? That's right. I have been away for a long time. Can we return to the subject at hand? You don't seem to understand, sir. What I'm trying to say is... Sorry, are you deaf? This is the last time I'm going to say it politely. Don't touch my tools, if you don't mind. Allow me to show this to you. Don't touch the tools! What in the world is this contraption? What did you say? I'm trying to explain to you that the front... Don't yell at me! I don't like to be yelled at, okay? Get it off me! Get it off me! What are you doing with that mulligan? It's trying to eat me! It's not trying to eat you, it's... Wait a moment! Oh, Rolo, what is this monster? It's not a monster, it's a vacuum cleaner. Everybody has one. Everybody has one of these? Yes. Vacuum cleaners are used for simple... Cleaning their vacuums. Yes, I get it. I get it. 
You people are strange allowing something like this indoors. What if it gets loose and attack the child? Now look, Mr. Mulligan. If you want to get this helmet fixed in time, just sit down quietly, please. Now, how are we getting along, Mr. Um, uh, Swanson, was it? Ah, uh, not too good. I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. You're sure this isn't for making those fancy European coffees? No, sir, this is a very scientific piece of equipment. What we're trying to do here is help... I don't understand. What is that little thing in there? Oh, well, that is a transition of... Help! Where did he go? Mr. Mulligan! Where are you? I think he just walked into that upright freezer. Hey, ask him if the light goes off. <sighs> what on earth were you doing in there? Don't you know how dangerous that is? I, I, I thought it was another room. It's not another room! Just, just stay away from everything. Sit down if you must, but everything else is out of bounds. Now, sir, where were we? Beats me. Yes, and I wanted to draw your attention to this node over here. Don't touch my tools if you don't mind. You see, I'm merely trying to point out to you that in order to facilitate... Don't point with my tools, please! Would you allow me to please make this clear to you? All we have is... Don't you understand? I assure you, I do understand. This happens to be mine. Oh, just a moment. What now? Now, where is he going? Stay here. Stay here? <laughs> I work here. Why would I be anywhere else? Just keep working. The clock's ticking. Yeah, it's ticking, because I fixed it. Mulligan, what are you doing out here? I thought you said time was of the essence. It is. But I don't want to go back to 1890 without any pants, so I thought I'd take a look at 21st century fashions. Have you seen these prices? This is what you pay these days. I have to pay slightly more. It seems that the hefty gentleman must be continually punished by our judgmental society. Now, come on, back inside before someone sees you. Well, is it ready? Pretty much, I think. A couple of small, minor adjustments, and you'll be all set. Good. Finally, I can go home. Not a minute too soon. No offense. None taken, I assure you. In fact, I would go so far as to say that I envy you your trip, sir. You sure he's the one from 1890? Well? Because you sound like Masterpiece Theater here. Keep working. Yes. 1890 is a wonderful period, Mr. Mulligan. I never used to think so till now. A time of simple, practical values. No traffic snarls, no income tax, no terrorists, no computer viruses. Only peace and quiet. Time to contemplate. Income tax. I am a scholar of that period, sir. That is why I've cultivated this mode of speech, appropriate to that time. Huh? The 19th century has a charm, nay, a fascination for me. The very thought of having lived in those halcyon days. I'll sure to be glad to get back there, Rolo. If I ever do. How much time is there left? We've got less than five minutes. Five minutes will be more than adequate. Tell me about your town, Mr. Mulligan. Where, for instance, might a scientist find employment? You are a scientist? Yes. Are there any in your town? Well, the only one I know is Professor Gilbert. I, I work for him. Oh. There you go, guys. All fixed. It works? Sure. Why not? Good. Well, uh, what do we do now? Pay me. I was talking to Mr. Mulligan. I know. That's why I said it. I didn't want you to forget. Pay the man, Mr. Mulligan. Pay the man. With what? I don't carry any money in my shorts. Oh, very well. Here's a 50. Thank you. Now, Mr. Mulligan, the time helmet. How does it work? I already told you, I don't know. The year. How do you program in the year? I don't know what program means. 
But if you're asking me what I think you're asking me, you just twist this dial, see? 1890. Good. And if I'm correct, and I usually am, to activate the device, you just have to... Good. Give it here. Not so fast, sir. Hey, 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 what you doing? Don't put it on! I intend to use it myself in exactly three minutes. What? Well, you can't do that! Well, I am doing it, sir. I'm returning to that time of bliss and simple pleasures. And you're just going to leave me here? Your fate is unimportant, sir. You are only a janitor. I am a scientist. Why, 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 I, I, I... Stand back! In less than three minutes, I shall have escaped this age of madness. Well, look, look, Rural, I just thought of something. Oh, well, congratulations. Look, I, I, I brought a chicken with me all the way from 1890, and all I did was hold it. We can go back together. You're lying, sir. I am not. Oh, no, the copper. Uh, ha! Now I got you. What's the idea of running around the street with no pants on? Rolo, take me with you. Get off me. Too late. 1890, here I come. Come, 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 come. You're under a... Rest. Ah, shoot. Mulligan? Where in the name of St. Pat did you spring from? I'm back. I'm back! For pity's sake, man. You're still not wearing any pants. Officer O'Flanagan, you are a sight for sore eyes. Ho, ho! 1890. Charming. Charming. Good morning, Fred and Rolo. I said good morning. What's good about it? Got up the wrong side of the bed this morning, eh? Every side is the wrong side. I didn't sleep a wink last night. No. No, my mattress feels as if it's stuffed with rocks. And I've had indigestion ever since I've arrived here. This food is terrible. Well, not today it's not. Today I got us some steak for dinner. 17 cents a pound. Can you believe it? How can they sell it so cheap? I don't know, and I don't care. Well, suit yourself. But I like 1890. It suits me. Look at this laboratory. It's ancient. It hasn't any equipment at all. Listen, I can even get a tune out of my harmonica now. Stop that! Darn noise. I don't know why I ever came to work here. I don't know why I ever wanted to live here, this barbaric... Primitive wilderness! What an utter fool I was to think I'd be happy living in 1890. Of all the dull, miserable, impossible periods of time, this one takes the prize. No sanitation, no facilities, no spring mattresses, air foam pillows, or electric blankets! Oh, sheesh. This guy is worse than my mother-in-law. No comforts, no frozen canapes. No microwave meals, no swimsuit edition of Sports Illustrated. You know what, Rolo? I think you'd be happier some other place. Or maybe some other time. What are you blabbering about? 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. There you go. Now, here, try this on for size. Ow! There you go. A perfect fit. Oh, no. You can't send me back. You don't belong here, Rolo. Any more than I belonged in your time. I'll just press here to switch the helmet on. Get this blasted thing off my head! Goodbye, Rolo. I hope you'll find the peace and quiet you're looking for. <laughs> I know I will. Now... Mulligan! <laughs> Silence. 
just what I was looking for. Well, this laboratory won't clean itself unless Professor Gilbert invents something. Where's Rolo? Oh, Rolo? Oh, he, he just left, Professor. Left? In a big hurry. Late for an appointment? Early. Hmm, strange chap. Complains a lot. Hadn't noticed. Talks a lot of nonsense, too. Keeps saying he needs a uh, uh, computer, whatever one of those is. Fancy word for an abacus, I reckon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mulligan? Have you seen my time helmet? Mulligan? To each his own. So goes another old phrase to which Mr. Woodrow Mulligan would heartily subscribe. For he has learned, definitely the hard way, that there is much wisdom in a third old phrase which goes as follows, stay in your own backyard. To which it might be added, and if possible, assist others to stay in theirs. Via, of course, the Twilight Zone. Once Upon a Time, starring John Reese davies with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson and adapted for radio by M.J. Elliott. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Rob Riley, Michael Tashua, Malcolm Rothman, George Adams, Jim McCants, Beth Jacoby Deach, Randall Steinmeier, and C.J. Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Amari and directed by Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are done in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Bob Benson, Todd Beyer, and Tim Cerny. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including three free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Yeah? How can you tell, Tommy? Because you're the best salesman there is. Well, maybe I used to be. You are, Lou. You always have such neat stuff. Oh, yeah, I got everything. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Something for everybody. Help me set up the table, will you, Tommy? Sure. There we go. We'll be ready to start in a minute. What's in the bag today, Lou? Take a look. See anything you like? of toys. Always. Which one's your favorite? Um, let's see. The little wind-up dogs. They're so cute. And the monkeys. And the zap gun. It's cool. Pow, pow, pow. I thought I gave you one to test for me. You did, but, well, it kind of broke. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll give you another one later. How you doing today, Bookman? Oh, just fine, officer. Another day, another dollar. You know how it is. Gonna sit up right here in the corner? I thought I might, yes, if that's all right with you. Well, just don't block the sidewalk. People coming and going. I wouldn't think of it, officer. Or you'll have to move. You don't want a citation, do you? Oh, absolutely not. All these busy people can't hold up commerce. 
You know, Bookman, maybe you should find yourself another line of work. Streets are so busy these days, there ain't much room for a pitch man anymore. Isn't that the truth? You got a permit, don't you? Why, I'm sure I do. Now, where did I put it? Oh, yes, it's in my other jacket. Would you, would you like me to go get it for you, officer? Uh, just be sure you bring it next time. I will, I will. Thank you, officer. Good day to you. Hey, honey, look at these cute stuffed animals. They are, aren't they? Absolutely adorable. Here, let me wind up one for you. How much? Only, uh, seven ninety-eight. in your choice of colors. Do you have any little ones at home, sir? Nope, no kids. Well, a niece or nephew, then. These make great birthday presents, stocking stuffers, a big hit at parties. Have you ever seen anything so delightful? Look at the way they move. It is cute, don't you think, Walter? Yeah, but they got them over at the pick and save for three bucks. Oh. Now, these aren't your ordinary toy animals. No, ma'am. They walk and talk and bark and jump a full 360 degrees in the air. Plus, you never have to feed them or take them to the vet. I call them the ideal pet. Go ahead, pick it up. Feel that fur, so soft and lifelike. Thank you, anyway. They're on sale. Special July clearance. Everything's half off today. Gift items for the men, perfume for the ladies. How about a wristwatch? Did you see these genuine gold necklaces? Street scene. Summer. The present. Man on a sidewalk. Age, 60-ish. Occupation, pitch man. Name, Lou Bookman. A regular fixture for the summer, the kind you pass by every day and don't pay much attention to anymore. A rather minor component to a hot July in the city. A nondescript, commonplace little man with a wrinkled suit, a pork pie hat, and a loud necktie that always seems to be coming loose at the collar. A man whose life is a treadmill built out of sidewalks and street corners everywhere. Lou Bookman. A walking rebuttal to the American dream, which states that success can be carved, gouged, or grubbed out of the landscape no matter where you are, whether it be log cabins or tenement buildings. Because Lou Bookman has not even a nodding acquaintance with success, and his dreams only extend from the curb to where the sidewalk ends. But in just a moment, Lou Bookman will have something to occupy his time which transcends both success and failure. He'll have to concern himself with survival. As of three o'clock this hot afternoon, Mr. Bookman will be stalked by his toughest customer to date, a man in a black suit who's out to close a deal of his own and who won't take no for an answer in the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, One for the Angels, starring Ed Begley, Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Sir, how about a nice new pen? Guaranteed to write upside down, underwater, in zero gravity. Ma'am, let me give you a free sample of my new perfume. It's called Scent of Mystery, and I promise it will bring you all the love and romance you ever dreamed of. How about you, sir? Nothing for me. No? You sure? I'm just observing. The reason I ask is you've been standing there for quite a while. Are you quite sure I can't show you anything? What about a new digital watch? Comes in a gift box. Not today, Mr. Bookman. Oh, you know my name. Have I seen you before? You look... Who are you talking to, Lou? What? Oh, that man there in the black suit. Which man? The one standing by the... Well, I don't see him now. He must have moved on. Strange, don't you think? To be wearing a black suit on a day like this? It's getting awful late. Is it really? I gotta get home before my mom gets mad. You run along then, Tommy. You absolutely, positively can't be late for dinner. You gonna have dinner now, too? Sure, Maggie, sure. Guess it's about that time. What are you gonna have? Oh, a lovely repast, no doubt. The chef's special. We're having spaghetti and meatballs. My favorite. Sounds positively scrumptious. I think I have a can left myself. I hope you put your stuff away. Oh, don't worry. I can do it. Hey, Lou, can I walk with you? That would be my pleasure, Maggie. To be in the company of such a pretty girl like yourself. Want to play with us, Mr. Bookman? Come on! 
I'd love to, children, but I must get home to my plants. Delicate creatures, you know. Your plants? My wisterias. They've been cooped up in this heat all day. Oh, so what? Show us some toys. And magic tricks. I don't have much magic left. And the zip gun. I want to see the fuzzy doggies. Carrie, is that a new bathing suit? Yeah. Well, don't you look nice. And Bobby, where have you been? I haven't seen you all week. I was sick. Then you shouldn't play in the water like that. Oh, uh, I'm all better now. Let me feel your forehead. Why, what's this? A quarter stuck behind your ear. No wonder you were sick. Wow. Oh, me, me, come me, on. Me, me, please, me, please, me, please, me, come on, me. I don't think anybody else has a temperature, but maybe you could test these. Let me see. These rings to be sure they're okay. Oh, yes. Oh, they may look like toys, but they're not toys you can buy at the Five and Dime. Anybody can sell toys, but these, these, my young friends, are very, very special. Did you know they're among the wonders of the world? Go ahead, Lou. Give them the pitch. <clears throat> young ladies and gentlemen, the rings you now have on your fingers come from a remote corner of the Tibetan mountain country. Do you know where that is? No. no. Well, it's where the wisest people in the world live. The jewels are patterned, shaped, and forged by strange little men who work underground, far from the light of day. Some folks call them... The Moly Men! Right, Bobby, the Moly Men. They use magic words and incantations to produce what look like toys. But each and every one they make has extraordinary powers. What kind of powers? The power to keep a person young forever. Science can't explain it. Your teacher wouldn't believe it. Your mother and father either. But it's true. And when the Moly Men are finished, they... They say the magic words! Uh, mini, mini... Mini, mini tackle. Words that hold a strange power from another world. The power of the life force. Watch the jewel in the ring. When it changes color, something is about to happen. You'll get your wish. So remember, be careful what you wish for tonight, children. Because it's absolutely, positively going to come true. You know what, Mr. Bookman? You're my best friend. No, he's not, Bobby. He's my best friend. See you later, children, for the Bookman Ice Cream Cone and Social Hour after dinner. Same time, same place. Don't forget now. We won't. We won't. Come on, Lou. I gotta go home. That you, Mr. Bookman? Good evening, Mrs. Magnuson. Hiya, Lou. Need a hand? That's all right, Mr. Stolberg. I got it. You make out okay today? Oh, yes, as always. Sold out half my merchandise. Yeah? It looks like you got a whole lot left. Want to come over for a cold one? That's kind of you, but I'm on the wagon these days. Well, I'll keep one on ice for you anyway. Hello, my beautiful wisterias. And how have all you been today? Did you say you're thirsty? I'll bet you are. Here, have a drink of water on me. Not too much now. Mr. Bookman? Oh, you could give a man a heart attack sitting there like that. I didn't mean to startle you. Say, how did you get in my apartment? I let myself in. But you couldn't. I keep it locked. You are Louis J. Bookman, aren't you? That's right. Something I can show you? I don't think so. Something in, let me see, collar stays, maybe, or neckties. You look like a man who needs a new tie, something brighter than the one you're wearing. Mr. Bookman, I'm not here to buy anything. Then what in the world do you want? Let's get down to business, shall we? Yes, here it is. Louis J. Bookman, age 69, right? 70 in September. Well, I must say you don't look it. <laughs> nice of you to say so, young man. I try to keep busy. Occupation pitch man, correct? Are you a census taker? If you are, let me sit down. I hope this doesn't take too long. Not exactly. Born in New York City? That's right. Father Jacob Bookman, Mother Flora. Father's place of birth, Detroit, Michigan. Mother's place of birth, Syracuse, New York. My, you have it all down in that book of yours, don't you? We have to keep these things efficient. Now, today is the 19th of July, and your departure is at midnight tonight. My departure? Excuse me. Go right ahead. Hi, Maggie, darling. My doggies broke, Lou. Let me see. Oh, here's your trouble right here. See this little cogwheel? 
You push down on the key when you're rewinding it. Can you fix it? I can try. Yeah! Oh, Lou, you're so smart. You can do anything. Hear that, mister? Mm-hmm. I'd introduce you two, but I don't know your name. No need. I think I got it now, Lou. Thanks. You're very welcome. Oh, this gentleman has come here to ask me a lot of questions. You, you're not the police, are you? Hardly. Oh, kind of gave me a turn. Huh? I'm glad he's not the police. I've got my vendor's license here somewhere. I thought maybe I forgot to renew it or something. Who's the police, Lou? This gentleman here. What gentleman? That one in the other chair. Which chair? Mr. Bookman, she can't see me or hear me. Why not? Why not what, Lou? Why can't you see him or hear him? See who? It works great now, Lou. Thanks a lot. See you after supper, huh? Wait a minute. What about our manners? Aren't you going to say goodbye? Oh, yeah. Goodbye, Lou. Thanks. I mean to the gentleman. Oh, it's a game. I get it. The Invisible Man. Goodbye, Mr. Invisible Man. See you, Lou. I can see you, yet she can't. Only those who are to accompany me can see me. Understand my words, Mr. Bookman? Only those who are to accompany me. I'm still not sure I... Now then, don't you think you'd better start making your arrangements? Arrangements for what? For your departure. My departure where? You still don't get it. I just never understand you people. You get this idiotic notion that life goes on forever, and of course it doesn't. Everyone has to go sometime. Go? You don't mean... That's right. No, that's ridiculous. I don't have time. I'm a busy man. A very busy man. Let me make you a cup of tea before you go. No, thank you. Take a look around. You can see how busy I am. My flowers, for example. I have a green thumb. Whatever I touch, well, it grows. If I do say so myself, I won second prize last year at the YMHA Flower Show. See the plaque on the wall? Wisteria, open class. Oh, nice. Nice? Is that all you can say? Look at them, will you? You've never seen flowers like these. And what I further don't understand is how little you appreciate the nature of your departure. I thought we were finished with that subject. Think of the poor souls who go in violent accidents. These are the non-precognition victims. We're not permitted to forewarn them. You, on the other hand, Mr. Bookman, fall under the category of natural causes. Natural causes? What's natural about it? As opposed to accidents, car crashes, things like that. You know, I find you a devious sort of fellow. Very devious. Not to say dishonest. In what way? I can see it in your eyes. You don't want to look at me. To tell the truth, I'm not sure I like you very much. Why don't you just come out with it and say what's on your mind? Mr. Bookman, I have done everything but phone your own undertaker. How much clearer do you want it? If you still don't know who I am... Don't touch my flowers. If you need an illustration... I told you, don't touch them. I thought this might erase any doubts. You touched one and it wilted and and died right there on the spot. Sorry, that was unavoidable. It actually turned black. Do you mean your death? (sighs) Exactly, Mr. Bookman. Now shall we get down to business? Time of departure is midnight tonight. I trust that will suit you. Did you say tonight? The preordination is for death during a nap. I presume this too will meet with your approval. What if it doesn't? You'll find this a relatively simple and painless and barely noticeable. Please, I don't want to go. They never do. But I can't go yet. For one thing, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm a healthy man. Outside of a cold last winter and an infected splinter, I don't think I've been sick a day in the past 20 years. Be that as it may, the departure time is set for midnight, and at precisely midnight, it will be. Don't I have anything to say about that? Not as such. We are, however, required to consider appeals. What kind of appeals? Uh, There are three categories. So I need to fill out a form, right? Give me one, and I'll start right in on it. No forms. We listen to what you have to say up to a point, but frankly... What are the categories again? 
Frankly, Mr. Bookman, I must tell you that I see very little here in the way of an extenuating circumstance. In any event, there are three major categories of appeals. One is hardship cases. What kind of hardship? Do you have a wife or family who might suffer your demise beyond a reasonable degree? No. No family. Second category is priority cases. Statesmen or scientists, primarily. Men on the verge of discoveries. I take it you're not working on any major scientific pursuit at the moment. No, I'm not. What about the third category? Well, Mr. Bookman, that would be unfinished business of a major nature. I don't know how major this would seem to anyone else. Go on. But I've never made a truly successful pitch. A sales pitch? Oh, surely you must have many times over if that's your profession. Yes, it's what I do, and I've managed to get by after a fashion. But I never hit it just right, you know? I'm not sure I... The man I learned from back in the Carney, he had it. He could sell igloos to the Eskimos. But what I'm talking is a big pitch. One where it finally all comes together and, and the words just flow off my tongue. Not just any words either. Something I believe in. Something so good that people won't have a choice. They'll have to listen. A pitch so big the sky will open up. A pitch for the angels. I guess that wouldn't mean much to you. But it would mean a great deal to me. It would mean... It would mean that I could have one moment in my whole life when I was successful at something. Just one moment when the children would be able to... to be proud of me. The children? I've always had rather a fondness for children. That's in the record. Then you know how I feel. Not precisely, but... The problem here, Mr. Bookman, is that you'd require a delay until... Until I could make a pitch. The kind of pitch I told you about. One for the angels. That's right. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Bookman. You see... These categories are fairly specific, and... I see. And when reference is made to unfinished business of a major nature, well, the only interpretation to be made here is simply that... That my business isn't major enough. That's not quite the way we look at it. That I'm not, then. What other way is there to look at it? What I mean is that, unfortunately, Mr. Bookman, the ability to achieve success in a given professional venture is hardly of a significant... I get it. You don't have to spell it out. I'm small potatoes, and who cares what happens to a potato? They're nothing special. We try to approach each case on an individual basis. Only some are more individual than others. Oh, don't worry about it. I've heard the same thing all my life. We go out the way we came in. Since I never had that much to start with, that's how I'm supposed to leave. It's not your fault. You're just doing your job. It means a great deal to you, does it? You could say that. Uh-huh. It would be highly irregular. So's this whole thing, if you ask me. But under the circumstances, I believe we might... Yes? We might be able to grant you a one-time delay, Mr. Bookman. A conditional one, you understand. Until? What do you mean, until? Until you've made this, this pitch you're talking about. I can stay alive until then? That's the arrangement. I'll have to think of some way to write it up. You do that. As for me, I think it's a fine bargain. More than generous, frankly. It's been awfully nice talking to you, mister. I didn't get your name. About this pitch, Mr. Bookman. Yeah? When might we expect it? When? (laughs) Soon, soon. What does soon mean to you? That's hard to say. Gets into definitions, doesn't it? You have a dictionary with you. No, I didn't think so. But it's a pretty simple word when you get right down to it. Soon means in the near future, the very near future. Not right away, though. And after a while, it's all relative, isn't it? Soon compared to what? A week? A month? A whole life? Mr. Bookman. That's open to interpretation, you see. So my answer to you is, maybe not this year, maybe not next year either, but soon. Mr. Bookman, I have a very odd feeling that you're taking advantage of us. Do you? Do you really? (laughs) That's a pity. Because I am... Mr. Bookman. I just won't make any pictures at all. Didn't think of that, did you? As long as it's up to me, I won't even hardly open my mouth. I don't have to if I don't want to. That's the term, so you run along now. Think you'll get me, huh? Well, I have no intention of... Really, Mr. Bookman. How did you get back in here? I locked you out. This is much more serious than you imagine. I have to go now. I promised to meet the children. We have a kind of social club, you know. Ice cream and stories. Lots of stories. Right down there on the stoop. 
It's much more complex than you realize what you've just done. What you think you've done. See you sometime. I'll let you know when. Here we've gone out of our way to help you, and this is the way you repay us. Bye now. Mr. Bookman, it won't just end here, you understand. There'll be consequences. You'll see. FYI, that means for your information. You have made your bed, and you shall now sleep in it. You say I won't go until I make the pitch? Well, all right. You'll have to wait till I make the pitch. And young man, and this I can say to you without fear of contradiction, you have got a long wait. That may well be, Mr. Bookman. But since you won't come with me, we've been forced to select an alternative arrangement. What happened? He didn't even stop. Ran right out. Not his fault. I swear I didn't even see her. She just jumped off the curb. I didn't have a chance to hit the brakes. Has someone called a doctor? Who got it? Oh no, Maggie! I swear to you, I never had a chance to stop. Call an ambulance. You're gonna be all right, Maggie, darling. Oh, my little Maggie. Uh, hi, Lou. See? You're gonna be just fine. Lou? Who's that man? What man? Where? I told you, Mr. Bookman. Consequences. You can't take her. No, sirree, you can't take her. I'll go. I'll go as planned. Never mind the pitch. I don't even want to wait. I want to go right away. Go where? Who's he talking to? What man? He's out of his head. Mr. Death! Mr. Death, come back! <laughs> you mustn't take the little girl. I'll go, please, please, Mr. Death, you win. I'll go with you. Right here. Right now. <laughs> I wonder how she is. A little girl? Yeah, how is she? Poor Mrs. Polanski. Look, here comes the doctor. How is she, Doc? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? She's a mighty sick little girl. Brave, too. Shouldn't she be in a hospital? That's just it. There's no particular trauma. In fact, there's hardly a mark on her, except where she fell and scraped her knee. Then what is it? Something's going on with her... Her fighting spirit, as it were. That's not a medical term, of course. But I think we'll know in a few more hours. If she hasn't hit a crisis by then, I'll move her to a hospital bed. A few more hours? Around 12 o'clock. 12 midnight, you mean? I think by then we'll know. He won't get in. Who, Mr. Bookman? I'm gonna wait right here, so he can't get in. Come to bed, Mrs. Polanski. I can't. I have to take care of my baby. There's nothing you can do. That's what the doctor said. She just needs rest. I can't sleep. How could I? Lou? Where are you, Lou? Is that Mr. Bookman she's dreaming about? Such a nice man. He's like a grandfather to her. But he can't help her now. My precious little Maggie. Come on in, Lou. It's late. I'm waiting for someone. No, you're not. You're worried about the kid. And I don't blame you. She's a swell little girl. But there's nothing to do now but wait. What time you have? 11.40. Everybody's gone to bed now. You better do the same. Not yet. Take my advice. Give it a rest. 11.40, huh? Better get set up. Who's there? Good evening, Mr. Bookman. Thought I'd see you again. You got business inside? I most certainly do. It's a quarter to twelve. In fifteen minutes it will be midnight. The time of my appointment. Mr. Death, the little girl's only six years old. Please, you don't have to do it. I'm ready. I'm sorry, Mr. Bookman. But I'm ready now. We had to make another arrangement. It's impossible to change at this point. She's to come with me. So you see, I must be in there at midnight. And if you're not in there by midnight? <laughs> that would be pretty much unheard of. 
If I didn't get there at precisely 12 a.m., then the whole timetable would be upset. Oh my no. It's unheard of. Nice pocket watch you have there. But have you thought about digital technology? A wristwatch? It's more efficient. If you ever need a good one. What are you doing, Mr. Bookman? What am I doing? Oh, nothing. Just setting up a pitch is all. At this time of night? Oh, I very often have a late night sale. Very often. Not many customers out and about. <laughs> they come, they show up. You're here, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm here. But I'm afraid I... I'm not much of a customer. How do you know? Have you ever seen my stock? Now you take a tie like this one right here. Like what? Like this tie. Looks like a toy dog to me. Oh, excuse me. Here, this is what I meant. Now you take this tie. I already have several. Go on. What's it look like to you? It looks like a tie. Feel it. Mm-hmm. So? If you'll feast your eyes, my good man, on what is probably one of the most exciting inventions since atomic energy, a simulated silk so fabulous as to mystify even the ancient Chinese masters, not to mention the silkworms, a perfection of detail, an awesome attention to fit and finish, a piquant interweaving of gossamer softness, absolutely and positively the smoothest substance ever to embrace the human neck. If it's a synthetic, as you say... Come closer. I can't hear you. How did the manufacturer get it so soft? It's the thread, of course. The thread? I'll answer all your questions in just a moment, but first let me explain the applications of this magnificent invention. Now witness a unique demonstration of tensile strength. Feel this, sir. Go ahead, take it between your fingers, like touching the thinnest spider web. Is it not like holding the air you breathe in the palm of your hand? Now give it a yank. If you wish. There, you can't break it. As strong as steel, and yet as delicate as shantung silk. No mere synthetic substance, but a molecular blend of atoms the like of which has never been seen. Actually, it is surprisingly strong. Where did you say this was made? Let me answer your question, sir. Hey, Lou, what you doing down there? Come on, you gotta see this. Yeah, no kidding. It's really something. Do you have a scarf made out of this stuff? Scarves, blouses, I've got them all on order. You can't hurry the process. Picture, if you will, 300 years of backbreaking research and development to produce the ultimate thread. The witch, then which there is no witcher. And what will you pay for this fabulous, I say fabulous, incredible and amazing achievement of the tailor's art? Softer than the feathers of an angel's wings. Expensive, no doubt. Twenty dollars? Too rich for my blood. Ten dollars. Five. You might indeed pay that much and more. If you were to purchase this at a retail store, consider the markups, import fees, but this exquisite thread is not available in any store. How did you get it, then? Ah, I have connections in the government, you see. It's smuggled in from behind the bamboo curtain by oriental birds specially trained for ocean travel. Each one carries a minute quantity in a small capsule underneath their ruby throats. It takes 832 separate crossings to supply enough thread to go around one single spool. But tonight, as a special get-acquainted offer, and to help advertise the product, I'm giving away a limited number, a very limited number, not at $20, not at 10 or even 5 but at the ridiculously low price of $1 a spool. If... You promise to take it home, test it out, and tell your friends. I'll take all you have. No, you don't. What about me? I gotta have some of that for my wife. Wait, that's not all. Everyone who purchases a spool of this thread gets a free bonus pack of imported sewing needles and a gold anodized thimble. One size fits all. Gather in close now. You got change, Lou? Sure I do. You, ma'am. Sir. Yarn, simulated cashmere socks, the most marvelous plastic shoelaces that never wear out. A genuine static electricity filter fits any car radio. I gotta go. No more cash. Me too, if I can carry all this stuff. Suntan oil, nose hair clippers, eczema powder, athlete's foot eradicator. I am getting sleepy, Mr. Bookman. Good night, and thanks. Wait till I show my daughter what I got. How about you, sir? Hmm? Oh, uh, I have so many things now... I don't know how I'm going to bring it all back. One last item, especially for you. The piece de resistance. An item never before offered in this or any other country. I can't imagine what else you could possibly show me. One live, guaranteed, genuine human manservant. How's that? For what I ask of you, sir. You receive a willing, capable, worldly, highly sophisticated, wonderfully loyal right-hand man to be used in any capacity you see fit. 
Say again? I don't... Louis J. Bookman at your service. The last model of his kind. He comes to you with an absolute guarantee. All parts interchangeable. A certificate of extended warranty. Eats little, sleeps little, rests only a fraction of the time. And there he is at your elbow, ready to do your bidding, at your beck and call whenever needed. Mr. Bookman, you are a persuasive man. I challenge any other store, industry or wholesale house, to even come close to matching what I offer you here. Because, my dear man, I am offering... I am offering you... Midnight. It's midnight, and I've missed my appointment. Oh, thank you, Doctor. It's a miracle. Just give her the sedatives every three hours, Mrs. Polanski. All she needs now is rest. But she's going to be all right. One minute past twelve, Mr. Bookman. And you made me miss my appointment. Thank God. A most persuasive pitch, Mr. Bookman. An excellent pitch. It had to be to make me lose track like that. The best I've ever done. The kind of pitch I've always wanted to make. A big one. So big, so big the sky would open up. A pitch for the angels. That's right. A pitch for the angels. I guess... I guess it's my time now. As per our original arrangement. Well... I'm ready. After you, Mr. Bookman. What is it? You'll excuse me for a minute. I forgot something. My folding table. You never know who might need something up there. It is up there. Up there, Mr. Bookman. No need to worry about that. You made it. Louis J. Bookman, age 60-ish, formerly a fixture of the summer, a rather minor component to a hot July. But throughout his life, a man much loved by the children, and therefore a most important man. Couldn't happen, you say? Probably not in most places, but it did happen in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. One for the Angels, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Kamenick, Lauren Patton, Linda Ryder, Richard Hensel, Doug James, Adam Tangway, Martin Hughes, Meg Thalken, Roger Wolski, Carl Amari, and Irene Olson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone.
This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has just announced a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States. Repeat, this is a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States at a high rate of speed. Arrival time is estimated at only a few minutes from now. All citizens are advised to get off the streets immediately and take cover. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. The first missiles have just hit. Are we still on the air? How long do we have? Good Lord. It's actually happening. This is real, folks. This is not a test. How's that, Mr. Raiden? It should do nicely. The volume could be a bit higher, though. Higher? You gotta be careful not to break those speakers. I thought you installed subwoofers, state-of-the-art, as I requested. Oh, we did. For later. Will you hear them? When the explosion hits here, you'll really feel it. Good. Good. I don't know where you got your sound effects, but you'd swear a bomb was going off outside. I mean, a big bomb. That's precisely what I want. I got the other TV hooked up, sir, at the end of the hall, like you said. Let me see. Here's the remote control. You got your on, and then you got your off and your volume. Uh, did you load the videotape? Sure did. As soon as the monitors go on, it starts rolling. Why don't you show me? All right, Mr. Raiden. Let's give it a test run. Look at that, would you? There's the street outside. Only now it looks like the beginning of World War III. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, this calls for something of a celebration. If you don't mind me asking, where should you get the footage? Some special effects guys out in Hollywood? Oh, you might say I have my contacts. Given adequate funding, anything is possible. Yeah, some setup you got here. All part of the show, huh? This is not a show. It may be, let us say, an illusion, but this room is not an illusion. It happens to be the best designed bomb shelter on the face of the earth. But tonight it's for gags, right? Something of the sort. A practical joke, and I trust a most effective one. Hey, you could say that again, Mr. Raiden. When those sound effects start and that stuff goes on the TV, you'd swear the whole world was getting blasted. That's the general idea. I've got three guests coming this evening, rather special guests, and I wouldn't want them to be disappointed. Well, it fooled me, and I put most of the wiring in. A drink before you go, gentlemen, to a job well done? Uh, yeah, no, no thanks, uh, it's getting pretty late. Are these friends of yours? How's that? You're uh, doing all this to fool three of your friends. They must be, uh, I mean, they must be real, like, special friends. Oh, they are. They are indeed very special friends. This, in a sense, is the moment a man lives his entire life for. Yeah, 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 I, I bet. Uh, that about it, Mr. Raiden? Yes, I'd say that uh, just about does it. Ah, well, we, we gotta go. So long, Mr. Raiden. Good luck on your party. Party? Yes, you might call it the best party ever. <laughs> Bye, Mr. Raiden. <laughs> that guy gives me the heebie-jeebies. I know what you mean. This has got to be the number one kook in the whole country. I mean, can you imagine a guy spending that kind of a bundle just to set up a phony atom bomb explosion? And the whole thing set to go off at a quarter to twelve. Some kind of fanatic is he, huh? What's his angle? Uh, practical joke, maybe, you know, like he said. Yeah, at a half a million bucks, that's some joke. Hey, hit the button, will you? Yeah, sure. You know, it's a funny thing. What? If they was to drop a bomb, I mean, if the whole world was to go up for real, it'd be kind of a pity if, uh, if the one guy left alive was somebody like him. Wow, no kidding. Well, hey, here comes the elevator. Live and let live, that's what I always say. Yeah, you got that right. Let's get out of here and grab some chow. Now you're talking. Going up? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hard to get used to, ain't it?
This is the basement of a fashionable midtown skyscraper and office building. It's owned and occupied by one Paul Radin, whom you've just met. Mr. Radin is rich, eccentric, and single-minded. How rich, we can already surmise. How eccentric and single-minded, we shall see in a moment. Because you have just been invited to a very special party, catered and conducted exclusively for residents of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, One More Paul Bearer, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And here's the main course, dear. Baked fish, just the way you like it. Splendid. Would you care for some more milk? Not just yet, Mary. Sit down, please. Oh, who could that be? I'll get it. No, you won't. I hope it's not one of the parishioners. Wait here. But you've been on your feet all day. Dinner will keep. Nonsense. I'll see to it, dear. Oh, yes, I'll tell him at once. Who is it? The most peculiar man. What did he want? I I'm not sure, but there's a limousine waiting at the curb. He said something about a matter of life and death. Odd, isn't it? He said exactly the same thing to me. And beyond that, Colonel, you've been told nothing. Hardly a word. The driver appeared at the club, something about an old acquaintance. And you, madam? I'm as much in the dark as you are. I was busy grading papers when that very strange man in the front seat came to my door. It sounded terribly urgent. I'll have a word with him. Driver! Yes, sir. Where, may I ask, are you taking us? Be there soon, sir. Yes, but where? Who do you work for? My employer wishes to remain anonymous. Well, isn't this mysterious? Like an Agatha Christie novel. But surely you can tell us if there's a life in the balance. Here we are. Where the devil? Mm, a very nice part of town by the looks of it. Please exit from the right of the vehicle. See here, if this is some sort of joke. I assure you, sir, it's no joke. Yet you can't even tell me who gave you your orders. It is an impressive building. You may use the private elevator. I know this building. Uh, that fountain. Elevator? To what floor? This one has only one button, and it says down. I'll enter the code for you. Well, if it doesn't go up, then it must go... The other way, of course. This is outrageous. I demand that you return me to the officer's club at once. Driver? Driver! It appears that we've been left to our own devices. It was ever thus. After you, madam. What in the... Good evening, friends. That voice. If you'd be so kind, just follow the hall to the security door at the end of the hall. There's something vaguely familiar about the tone, but I can't quite... Enough. It's time to find out what this is all about. That's right. Just come in, if you will. See here. Do sit down and make yourselves comfortable. Wait... I remember now, yes. The accommodations are a bit spartan, but I trust you'll find them adequate for your needs. How good of you to come. Colonel Hawthorne, Reverend Hughes, and of course, Mrs. Langsford. I'm delighted to see you all. What? Such blank faces? Don't tell me you've forgotten. It's Raiden, isn't it? Aren't you Paul Raiden? You have an excellent memory, Reverend. And how about you, Colonel? Do you recognize me? Yes, I... I believe I do. 
You served with me once, didn't you? I did indeed. A second lieutenant. Yes. In an infantry regiment under your command. I recall it vaguely, and I seem to recall something else, too. It's not surprising that it doesn't come flooding back. After all, you had a few thousand men under you, a few thousand cogs in the great military machine. I was only one of those cogs. But then again, you didn't court-martial all of them, did you? That distinction you reserved for me alone. Oh, yes, I do recall now. You refused to lead an assault on a hill. Did I? Refused in the face of a direct order. The delay cost us a company of men. That was your contention at the court-martial board. It's what sealed my fate. I was dishonorably discharged, Colonel. Stripped of rank and booted out. How oh, fortunate for you. Fortunate, you say? Were I permitted to dictate the sentence, I would have had you shot. <laughs> of this I have no doubt. No doubt at all. But what kind of host am I? Oh, for pity's sake, Paul. I must apologize. There's a lady present. Please forgive me for not addressing you first, Mrs. Langsford. Do you recall who I am? Of course I do. I taught you in high school. Well done. I don't forget my students. Oh, oh now and then I find that they get jumbled together. Of course. But if I prod my memory a bit, I'm able to connect names with faces. And in your case, with character. I made an impression on you, did I? That's understandable. Because you flunked me, Mrs. Langsford. I certainly did. You dressed me down in front of an entire class, called me names, humiliated me. And quite deservedly so. Ah, but that's neither here nor there. I invited you here this evening for another purpose than to dredge up old animosities. Invited? I can't speak for my companions, Raiden, but the request I received was more in the form of an ultimatum. Your chauffeur said it was a matter of utmost urgency. Why, well, yes. Yes, indeed. That's the way it was broached to me, too. A matter of life and death. I was eating dinner, and my wife Mary got up to answer the door. And when she came back, she had such an odd expression on her face. Ah, Reverend Hughes. Still a bit on the wordy side, aren't you? It never ceases to amaze me, really, how changeless we remain over the years. But I suppose the habits of a lifetime are not that easily set aside, now are they? Perhaps you'll be good enough, Paul, to get to the point and tell us why we're here. I'd be delighted to. But first, can I get you something? A highball, perhaps? Or a cup of coffee for the Reverend? How do you take it, black or white? Nothing, thank you. Paul, you're trying my patience. <laughs> habits, Mrs. Langsford. The incredible persistence of habits... You call me Paul, as if I were still sitting in your classroom. What about you, a nice cup of tea? Nothing for me. And you, Colonel, a tot of rum, perhaps? I would be deeply appreciative, Mr. Raiden. If you made your point and then let us leave. You've obviously called us here for something, and I, for one, would welcome hearing whatever it is without further delay. <laughs> How staunch! How commanding you sound, Colonel. The military mind never changes either. See here. Always pressing forward. Drive, drive, drive against the objective and wipe it out. Colored flags stuck in a map and troops stuck out in the hot sun. An officer must have nerves made of steel and a head full of cement. As you were, Raiden. Oh, no, Colonel. Not as I was. As I am. Which rather upsets the chain of command, don't you think? Because I'm in command now, and what I command at this moment is your attention. You see, I've called the three of you here for a very specific purpose. I think I'm beginning to understand. Of course you are. Always so intelligent, so insightful. Let's do it in proper chronology. My dear old schoolmarm shall begin. That staunch and intrepid educator who would look so incongruously out of place without those severe spectacles covering those severe eyes looking out of an equally severe face. 
who possesses such vast prerogatives from the local school board and the vast courage that comes from pitting all her wits and training and knowledge against poor captive children. Are you quite finished, Paul? My dear lady, I haven't even begun. May I make an observation, then? You have permission to speak. Would you like to address the class? Oh, just a comment, Paul, on how incredible this whole thing is. That a man like yourself, a millionaire many times over, a big, important man who walks with kings and heads of state and industrial tycoons... You followed my career. How gratifying. How incredibly tiny a mind this kind of man must have to dwell on an incident in a high school classroom of some 20-odd years ago and to let it fester inside of him as it's done with you. I've never liked humiliation, Mrs. Langsford, whether it occurred 20 years ago or in the past 10 minutes. Humiliation? All right, Paul, let's talk of humiliation. Let's talk of your humiliation. Mr. Raiden was caught cheating during an examination, caught red-handed. Oh, not a federal crime, of course, but perhaps just a bit commentative on the nature of the person. And when accused of the act, he tried to plant his crib sheet on an innocent student. How right you are, Mr. Raiden, that I stood you up on your feet and in front of the entire class I told you what you were. But no room then was there, Mrs. Langsford, for just a moment of compassion? An iota of sympathy for a frightened and desperate boy? Oh, Mr. Raiden, I've dealt with frightened and desperate children all my life. And it might surprise you to know that I've given them more sympathy and compassion than learning. But neither sympathy nor compassion can be handed out wholesale like cheap bubblegum. The recipient must be worthy of them, and you never were. You were a devious, dishonest troublemaker. And for all your millions, my guess is that you are still devious, you are still dishonest, and I have no doubt that even now you're a troublemaker. You haven't changed either, Mrs. Langsford. Mr. Raiden, after so many years, what can be gained by... A great deal can be gained, Reverend. A great deal. But surely... You can go to the devil, Reverend. Raiden! You too, Colonel. And that's not a figure of speech. Tonight, my friends, just a few short minutes from now, you all most assuredly can and will go to the devil. <laughs> Mr. Raiden, obviously years have passed between now and whenever it was you felt you suffered various indignities at our hands. Felt? How conveniently you forget the extent of my suffering. You, for example, accused me of lack of character, and worse, you put a scandal over my head and all but destroyed my reputation. I do remember now. A girl... A young girl whom you drove to suicide, because even at that early stage, you were not a man to hold honor in very high regard. So merciless and so judgmental. What of her responsibility, her character? You're far from consistent in your dispensation of forgiveness. No, the robes of a man of God never became you, Reverend. For all your pious pronouncements, they never quite fit. Enough of this. I'm getting out of here. Now. You can try, Colonel. This is outrageous. Save your strength. You're going to need it. Open this door at once. The doors don't answer to your command, only to mine. They're made of solid steel. The walls are 18 inches of reinforced concrete sheathed in 6 inches of lead. I have my own generator plant, my own air system, and at the other end of the hall, a storeroom the size of a warehouse stocked with food and supplies. But in God's name, why? What are you afraid of? Afraid? Hardly. Prudent might be a more accurate word. Remember the story of the three little pigs, houses of straw and so forth, and only one built to withstand the blast. Blast? What blast? Colonel, you of all people should understand logistics. Does it occur to you why a man would go to all this trouble and expense? 
You've built what amounts to be a bunker. So I have. But we're not at war. Not at this precise moment. You're insane. Am I? This is the middle of the city. Ah, now you're getting warm, closer to the point. What are you talking about? About beginning a vigil, my friends. The long wait and the countdown to oblivion. Will you start making sense? I taught you better than this, this gibberish. You are correct, Mrs. Langsford, about several things. I've walked with kings and tycoons, as you so rightly perceived. I've walked with them, and more importantly, I've listened to them, to the things they have to say, the special knowledge they are able to impart because of their positions of privilege. As a result, I managed to keep abreast of the times and usually well ahead of them. The point. Patience, Reverend. I'm coming to it. You see, I know things that are going to happen. I pay informants, couriers, high-level attaches and the like for a service. Information. And I pay them quite handsomely, I might add. What sort of information? Oh, the inner workings of certain, let us say, diplomatic agencies, military installations. Information that's beyond top secret. But available, if the price is right. You're engaged in espionage. Hear me out. Forty-eight hours ago, I received a most interesting bit of news. Or rather, several bits meaningless in themselves that together form one unavoidable conclusion. Something that is known to perhaps only six men in the world. If you're trying to frighten us, it isn't working. Then let me give it a somewhat finer edge. This evening... This very evening, the world is coming to an end. Why, of all the... At 11.45, there will be no more city, no more country. Rubbish. Oh, it was inevitable, don't you think? After so many years, so many weapons stockpiled, someone somewhere was bound to become impatient to finally push the button that brings us to the reward we so justly deserve. And make no mistake about it, we all do. It began when we were born into this cesspool called life. The original fall from grace, from which there is no escape. The earth is an empty graveyard waiting to be filled, and tonight it will be. What a cynical, depraved view of humanity. By 30 minutes after midnight, there will be no more humanity. It's too late to stop. Pandora's box has been opened. There's no turning back. They are going to bomb us, and we are going to bomb them. By dawn, there will be nothing left but rubble and bodies. And now, within a few moments, it begins. You'll be hearing the sirens very shortly. That's the red alert. It means their missiles are on the way. Ours will follow soon after with proper military efficiency. And you are to survive, Mr. Raiden. Is that the idea? I am to survive. As long as I stay here, 300 feet under the ground. Already buried, one might say. How about you, Reverend Hughes? Or the rest of you? Would you care to survive too? Or shall I be the only pallbearer? What? It can't be. Don't panic. This whole thing may be a hoax. Please remain seated. If you require proof, I'll turn on the radio. This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has just announced a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States. Repeat, this is a red alert. Enemy missiles are approaching the United States at a high rate of speed. Arrival time is estimated at only a few minutes from now. All citizens are advised to get off the streets immediately and take cover. This is not a test. Repeat, this is not a test. The first missiles have just hit. Are we still on the air? How long do we have? Good Lord, it's actually happening. This is real, folks. This is not a test. This is real. Comments? Perhaps a little military sophistry now, Colonel. A quote from General Grant or Lee or Patton. And you, Reverend, something enriching from the gospel? 
Oh, my, such silence, Mrs. Langford. Nothing in that vast reservoir, that pilgrim's progress mind of yours to fit this situation? No mental eraser you can use to wipe out reality? I've got to get to my wife. Oh, by all means, Reverend. Certainly, get to your wife. Hold hands and die together. Take your hands off me. You turn my stomach, Reverend Hughes. You know that. Find your wife. I intend to. That's not what's on your mind. What's on your mind is what's on the Colonel's mind and the school marms over there. Your precious hide. Your sanctified flesh. That's what preoccupies you at this moment. Let go of me, Mr. Raiden. If I'm to die tonight, I want to be with someone I love. <laughs> Very theatrical, Reverend Hughes. But far more burlesque, I'm afraid, than legitimate theater. Kindly have the decency. Why don't you have the decency, Reverend? To depart this earth with just a fragment of the truth in your mouth. What truth? Tell me, to my face, that you are so scared, so miserably frightened, that you'd sell your wife by the pound if it meant your survival. Admit it. If those were the last words I ever spoke, Mr. Raiden, they would also stand as the worst falsehood I ever uttered while living. Why am I not convinced? Will you open the door, Mr. Raiden? Will you let me leave now? Take a look at the monitor first. You might want to consider what awaits you outside before you open that door. How did you know, Raiden? How could you possibly have known exactly when? What difference does it make? If we leave now, we might make it back to our homes. Highly unlikely at this point, but I suppose hope springs eternal. Oh, of course, Mrs. Langsford, back home to your aging sister, no doubt. And you, Colonel, back to the club so you could die with your cronies amid all your medals and memorabilia. Whatever we do, it's none of your concern. My dear friends, shall we drop the pretense now, this instant? Shall we all of us now dare to speak the truth? I told you how this room was constructed, steel, concrete, and lead. It is the only place where you can survive. Now, what is all this nonsense about going back to your homes? You mean to say you'd walk out of here to certain death, when by simply staying where you are, you're assured that you'll live? Are we to understand, Mr. Raiden, that you will permit us this luxury? That you will allow us to stay in your fortress? Oh, indeed. Indeed, Colonel. As a matter of fact, it's precisely why I asked you all to come. Each of you, in your own way, tried to destroy me. But I will not repay the compliment in like kind. That is to say, I won't require an eye for an eye. Nothing quite as basic, as naked as that. Then I'd be interested, Mr. Raiden. What is your price? <laughs> the Colonel would be interested. I should think so. And I presume the school marm and the reverend, too, would be interested. I submit, dear friends, that you're not just interested. It's the only single thing on God's earth that has any meaning left. How much will Raiden charge so you can stay here in safety? All right, my friends, here's the all-important price tag. The fiddler has played, and here comes the bill for the music. But be sure to listen carefully, because time is very rapidly running out. Say it, man. What is your price? You will, each of you, each one of you in turn, beg my pardon, ask my forgiveness. And if need be, you'll get down on your hands and knees to perform that function. Is that all? That's all. Our Father who art in heaven... I suggest you prepare your requests without delay. The first bombs have just exploded somewhere near the city. I assure you, the next ones won't miss. Did you hear what I said? I need your decisions now. Say pretty please. I beg your pardon. Pretty please with sugar on it. How's that, teacher? Speak up! Pretty please with sugar on it, Mr. Raiden. It's what children say to exact a favor. Children, Mr. Raiden, but they say it by rote. 
It comes out pure. There's no meanness to it, no cruelty. That's something that comes much later in life. The capacity to damage other human beings. That's enough. Not quite. You let me out of here, Mr. Raiden. If I'm to spend my last quarter hour on Earth, I'd rather it be with a stray cat, or alone in Central Park, or with a city full of strangers whose names I'll never know. Have you lost your mind? The door, Mr. Raiden. Will you open the door now? You heard them. Heard what? Stubbornness for its own sake? Sheer contrariness? Absolute irrationality in the face of... Uh, that? Open up, Raiden. Yes, open it. You're too blind, or you're too stupid. That must be it, because none of you understand how simple it is. All you have to do, literally all you have to do, is to say a sentence. Just a string of silly, mindless words, like a command, Colonel, like a prayer, Reverend, like a lesson. Nothing more than that. All you have to say is that you're sorry. I have nothing to be sorry for. You deserve that, Court Martial, and more. I'll hardly withdraw my complaint now. And I, Mr. Raiden, pity you that you still can't see the error of your ways. May God have mercy on your soul. All right, all right. You want to go out there and die? Go, but you'll all be back inside of five minutes. There's the elevator, go, go, go ahead, use it. Carry the farce to its conclusion. Stand aside. Where are you going? Up there? To what? As far away from here as I can get. Do you hear that? Are you deaf? You still want to go up on the street? Why? To get a good look at the frenzy and the panic and the horror? Before you come back down here to your only salvation? Move away from the elevator. But you don't need to see it firsthand. Watch it from here on the monitor. You can see it happen, the whole thing. Watch as your world is shoveled into a grave and covered over. Move, or I shall be forced to move you. You fool. After you, ma'am. Last chance. I mean it. It's your last chance. What about it, Hughes? Is life so stinking cheap you can throw it down a drain? No, no, it, it's not true. This is, this is no fantasy. You'll be back. You'll see. You'll be back. This is the Emergency Broadcast Network. The Office of Civil Defense has issued a red alert. The United States is under enemy attack. The first wave of bombers and long-range missiles slipped through our defenses by unknown means and are on the approach now. Evacuation procedures are underway in all major cities. The president will make an announcement as soon as, as soon as, this is real, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a drill. This is not a test. This is an actual emergency. What? That's not what he's supposed to say. We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to bring you this live coverage. Just before midnight this evening, several of the country's major population centers suffered missile attacks resulting in severe casualties. Siege mentality. Unconfirmed report of nuclear detonations. The White House, the Midwest, the coast. We will remain on the air for as long as... What's wrong with this? Off! I want this tape off! That's enough. That is quite enough! Ladies and gentlemen, this is my last assignment as a broadcaster. I can see the bombs going off. And now, now they're streaking down, lighting up the sky, heading directly for us. A great wind from the firestorm. If you can hear me, I want my wife and daughter to know that, that I love them very much. No! 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 No, 
Oh, please. I didn't mean for it to actually happen. Th there's, there's nothing, nothing left. Nothing. The city is gone. Is there, is there no one else alive? Somebody? Anybody? <laughs> What's wrong with him? Must be drunk. Poor man, he looks crazy. Yeah, look at his eyes. Why is he crying? <laughs> All right, Mac, get up. Hey, Mac. What's the matter with you? Got a little too much to drink, huh? On a beautiful night like this. Well, now, let me take you home. Where do you live? Can you tell me that? I didn't, I didn't want it this way. Won't somebody listen to me? Isn't there anyone left in the world who can hear me? Someone! Someone! Uh, this is Saunders. Thank you, I'm I'm in front of the Raiden building. You want to send a car over here right away? Some poor devil's lying on the ground off his rocker. No ID. Yeah, it could be anybody. Yeah, okay. It's okay, Mac. Help's on the way. Now, why don't you come on over here and sit down by the fountain? That's right, in front of this nice building. You weren't gonna no, try taking a bath no, in it, were you? No. Because then I'd have to arrest you, and I wouldn't want to do that. Can you hear me? Can't you even tell me where you live? You know where you are? Anything around here look familiar at all? What happened to him? Another nutcase. Never saw him? Is he deaf or blind? Okay, folks, let's move along. Move right along. Give the poor fella some breathing space till the ambulance gets here. <laughs> easy, Mac. Take it easy. You're gonna be okay. No, no. No, no, no. No. No, somebody. Somebody. Some, any, anybody. Anybody. Is it, anybody left alive in all this rubble? Not another human being anywhere in all the world. Please, please, please. Oh, please, God, oh, please. <laughs> Mr. Paul Raiden, a dealer in fantasy and human misery, especially his own. Trapped in the graveyard of his mind, and now, as it has always been for him, the only person in the world. The sole pallbearer at a funeral he alone manufactured in a bleak and empty landscape called the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. One More Paul Bearer, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Meg Thalken, Rich Kamenick, Turk Muller, Norm Waddell, Jeff Lupiton, Roderick Peoples, and Lawrence Nepidal. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. 
Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. I did. Oh, come on, honey. You're not in that much of a hurry, are you? Yes. Well, clear the room then. Tell them they're keeping the head of McClellan Enterprises waiting. Tell them that we... All right, all right. You want to forget the whole thing? No, I don't want to forget the whole thing. I just want to get this nonsense over with. Send you a postcard. Oh, that would be wonderful. Bon voyage. Ta-ta. Yes, Tata. Come on. Um, hello. May I help you? Mr. Spirito? I am he. We're the Ransoms. My wife called for an appointment. Oh, yes. Please be seated. Now, where exactly do we intend to go? We intend to go to London. Splendid. Of course, you've been. Oh, no. <laughs> charming place. You have picked a rather bad time of year, though, but... Excuse me, we're kind of rushed today. I wondered if you'd... Uh, certainly. Now, have we decided on an airline? No. Well, then, if I may suggest... We are not going by plane. I beg your pardon? I said, we are not going by plane. Ooh, but you must, un unless you're planning this for some time in the future. No, it has to be right away. Oh, <laughs> then I'm afraid a ship would be out of the question. You see, it's the off-season, and the liners have all been booked up, or put on short runs. All of them? All the acceptable ones, yes. I hope you won't mind my saying this, Mrs. Ransom, but, you know, airplanes are perfectly safe nowadays. I realize that some people feel a certain trepidation, but there's absolutely no reason... Eileen, if it's the only way... May we see a list of boats that are running? <sighs> if you wish. You promised. I know. It's important, Alan. We agreed on that. I'm afraid these are the only passenger-carrying vessels bound for England in the next 30 days. Some are freighters, but uh, it's sometimes possible... What about this one? The Lady Anne? <laughs> I don't think so. Why not? Well, it's very nearly the oldest ship in the water, and the slowest. Thirteen days to La Havre. Another half day to Southampton. Forget it. No, wait. This says it leaves on Thursday. We'll take it. Please, Mrs. Ransom, the Lady Anne is a veritable antique. Listen to the man, Eileen. We can relax when we get there if that's what you want. Don't make such a big deal out of it. It is a big deal to me, Alan. A very big deal. Give us two tickets. For this relic? Yes, that's right. The Lady Anne. Oh, very well. A few extra days won't matter, will they? I don't have anything better to do. Check okay? Of course, sir. But, uh, Mrs. Ransom, the Caravan Travel Agency takes pride in its service. I beg you not to do this. Well, it isn't going to sink, is it? With a ship that old, you can't tell what might happen. Oh, give me that check. Here. We'll pick up the tickets. Come on, Alan. You can go back to work now. Thanks for your help, Mr. Spirito. Very well. <laughs> bon voyage.
portrait of a honeymoon couple about to embark on a journey. Like most newlyweds, they've never traveled a great distance together, nor have they become truly acquainted. But there is a difference. These newlyweds have been married for six years, and they're taking this honeymoon not to start their life together, but to save it. Or so Mrs. Ransom believes. She's not sure why she insisted on an ocean liner, except that it will give them some much needed time together, even if it is the Lady Anne. The tickets read New York to Southampton, but this old ship is bound for a very different port. Its final destination? The Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Passage on the Lady Anne, starring Martin Jarvis and Rosalind Ayers with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Perfect. A foggy night. Can't even see the ship. Where is everybody? Already on board. We're a few minutes late. I was ready. If you hadn't taken so long packing... There it is! Oh, Alan, isn't it beautiful? No, 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 not it, she. The ship happens to be a lady. Sorry. She's beautiful. Mm, indeed she is. Oh, yes. There's the uh, gangplank, is that what they call it? Come on, Alan. I can hardly wait. You know, from the descriptions, we were expecting a cross between a kayak and the Flying Dutchman. <laughs> You're, you're seeing someone off? No, we're passengers. What? How's that? Passengers. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I hardly think so. No, you see, this is the Lady Anne. Toby, please. You have no right to badger them. Yeah, be quiet, woman. Well... Now, now young fellow. Uh, look here, if you'll consult your tickets, I think you'll find there's been a mistake. I repeat, this ship is the Lady Anne. And I repeat, there's no mistake. Uh, show me your tickets. Why should I do that? Call it curiosity. Uh, do you mind? Go ahead, Alan. Ah, uh, all right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Alan Ransom, New York. To Southampton. You're not going to read the fine print, too, are you? Well, they, they seem to be in order. Thank you. It's good to know that. Well, there must be an error. Uh, this is um, a private passage, you might say. Uh, a mistake in booking. No, no. It's a terrible mistake. Come along, dear. But, Millie, I, I don't understand. Well, I guess that's how the British say welcome aboard. Oh, don't get your back up. You'll be twice as cranky when you're his age. Bet we can beat him up the ramp. Not too late to turn back, you know? I mean, think of being cooped up with me for 14 days. I made a promise and I'm gonna keep it. Isn't that good enough? Sure. Not very steady. Really gives you confidence, doesn't it? At least try to enjoy this. <clears throat> Oh, one moment, please. Your names? Ransom. Mm, uh, yes, yes, I, I see it on the list. Do you want to see our tickets, too? Everything seems to be in order, sir. Stateroom 24, down that flight of stairs. Thank you. Important. Oh, yeah, 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 here we are. Yes, here we are. Good evening. I say, you're not going to let them do this, are you? I'm afraid it's out of my hands. Out of your hands? Well, we'll see about that.
I hope they got the luggage on board. It'll be waiting in our room. You'll see. It better be. We're due to take off in 10 minutes. Take off? Sail. Disimport. I think it's disembark. Right. Alan, you have to admit, it's a real showpiece. Did you notice this carpeting? And the oil paintings? And brass everywhere. Great. Where's the bar? I could use a drink. Number 24. This is it. What in the... Alan, look! It's like an old-fashioned drawing room with a tapestry and gold everything. <laughs> Pigeon's blood vases. Mm. I don't believe it. Are those plaster cupids on the ceiling? Oh, it's marvelous! And the canopy bed. Shaped like a swan. <laughs> It's got a goose feather mattress. Oh, Alan, isn't this fabulous? It's probably the most ridiculous room in the entire world. You realize that? Probably? It is! <laughs> and you actually like it. Don't you? Look at this chest. It must be a hundred years old. A bowl of fresh flowers on top. And even a box of candy. Shaped like a heart. At least the luggage is here. No kidding. You think we can take it for two weeks? I mean, with all this, this, this... There's the whistle. Come on, let's go up on deck. Why? Why? That's what you do. Haven't you seen any movies? Hurry. the ones I mean, Burgess. Not the ones going with us. Yes, I tell you. Nonsense. Obviously a silly blunder. No, no, no. They have tickets. Calm yourself, Mackenzie. This needs to be settled at once. Very well. Here they come. Oh, hello. Hello. How do you do? Oh, very well, thank you. Now then, uh, no doubt you young people aren't aware that this is a rather, well, how should I say, private sort of cruise, you see. Very tight. Dear me, yes, unquestionably a slip-up on the part of the, uh... Look, mister, we're getting a little tired of this routine. Try to understand. There hasn't been any slip-up. This is our ship, and we are sailing to England on it. Her. Her. What did I tell you? They're determined. This is bad news, very bad indeed. Oh, really? For you or for us? Don't argue with them, Alan. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, see here, uh, please. This may seem odd to you, but we are actually trying to be of help. Yes, exactly so. You see, there are things you don't know about this ship. Yes. But what does that mean? Well, for example, it isn't common knowledge that... Uh, yeah, Burgess, Burgess. No, Mackenzie. We've got to tell them. But... Um, uh, <clears throat> this vessel is over 50 years old. We knew that. Oh, but there are other things you couldn't possibly know because you haven't had time <sighs> to look. Such as... Well, she's falling apart, everywhere. The deck chairs wouldn't support the weight of a baby. <laughs> yes, that, that's true. And the staircase is about to collapse at any moment. And the food, oh, food, dreadful, dreadful. It's positively poisonous. Um, Tomin, you know, yes. But the worst of it is the danger at sea. Those boilers, not to be trusted. They've been ready to burst for years. Oh, yes, 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 for years. So uh, you can see how impractical the whole idea is. Hmm. 
There's just one thing. Yes? If it's such an awful, dangerous ship, what are you doing on it? Hmm? What? Yo. <laughs> yeah, well, um, we're old and eccentric. Well, yes. <laughs> well, we're young and eccentric. We like impractical things, the challenge and all. Besides, we think it's an absolutely charming boat. Ah, oh, last warning. They'll be pulling away the gangplank at any moment. Look, you'll, you'll be quite bored. We never get bored, do we, Alan? Nope, not at our age. You're uh, sick, then. Yes, 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 you'll get sick. No stabilizers. She rides like a washing machine, I can tell you. Mm, sounds like fun. I think I've heard about enough. Wait. I have my checkbook. What's that for? I am prepared to pay you double the amount of your tickets. This is ridiculous. No, I want to hear it. Pay us to do what? If you will abandon your plans, I'm sure you'll find another booking, something more suitable. That's a very generous offer. Yes, very much more suitable. Alan, you're not considering it, are you? Well, what do you say? Not a chance. Triple the amount, then. Yes, yes, triple, triple. No. Very well. I am forced to extremes. Sir, madam, if you will leave the Lady Anne at once, I will give you the equivalent of, um, let me see, uh, 50,000 American dollars. 50,000 American dollars. Yes, uh, which uh, I will match. Well, I haven't got to go on me, but... I, I, Making I it a total of 100,000. Yes, 100,000. You're talking my language now, gentlemen. Alan! Let's say pounds sterling, shall we? In pounds? Or better yet, an even quarter million U.S. currency will be fine. <laughs> um, no, no, that, that amount is, is completely unreasonable. I'm sorry. Uh, no. In that case... But, but... Sorry. Let's go, honey. You must reconsider. You don't understand the implications. Look, fella. Ever since we picked this tub, people have been doing their best to discourage us. I don't know why, and I don't care. But if you're worried about brash Americans crashing your cozy little tea party... No, 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 it isn't that at all. Forget it. From now on, leave us alone. I'm proud of you. Thought I'd take the money, didn't you? Well, for a minute there, I didn't know. Oh, look! We're moving! Off to a great start. I could use that drink now. Me too. Too late. We did our best. We should have tried harder. Mm. But the funds he was demanding... <laughs> Highway robbery. Nevertheless, it was our duty. The duty of everyone on board. Who knows what the consequences will be. I fear we should have done whatever was necessary to keep them off this ship. It's almost 11. Hmm. Mm. Don't tell me you're nervous. We're not going to let two cranky old men spoil our second honeymoon, are we? A lot more than two. Mm hmm. Better get dressed. Fire drills in 15 minutes. What? Look at all of them. And 
all wearing their life preservers. <laughs> oh no. Alan, some of them are even on crutches. And wheelchairs. Pretty hard to stand for inspection. Is that what they're doing? Apparently it's a safety requirement. Well, there was the Titanic. I picked up a few more names. The Mackenzies, of course, and Mr. Burgess. How could I forget? The one on the end is named Van Vlyman. Next to him is Mr. Bristow. Cooey! Hello there. Care to join us? Yes, do join us. Hello. In a moment, Mrs. Mackenzie. You don't suppose that everyone else on this ship is... Everyone. I checked this morning. The youngest person I saw was 70. Oh, but that's silly. It must just be the first class section. There aren't any other sections. The entire ship is first class. You mean they're all? Show some respect. This group alone represents several thousand years. All for fire practice. Remember, Eileen, getting there is half the fun. Chin up. Your life jackets. Oh, thank you. Uh, now then, as soon as you're all ready. I think the straps go over your shoulders. Like this? That doesn't look right. Psst. Do you need help, dear? Good morning, Mrs. Mackenzie. As a matter of fact, you should put your arms through the hole. No, 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 no. Let them learn for themselves, dear. I was just trying to make it easier. <laughs> See you later, then. Yes. <laughs> Do the best you can. We look like a couple of clowns at a funeral. Now then, in the event the balloon should go up, the alarm will sound. Proceed to the Imperial deck in a calm, orderly fashion and await further instructions. The groups will be divided in the following manner. Group A, Mr. and Mrs. Huntley Small, Mr. and Mrs. Mackenzie, and Mrs. Scott Ells. Imperial Lounge. Looks like we're in time for the noon orgy. Alan, I think it's elegant. Like a private club. That's the problem. We're not members. This isn't a ship. It's a floating rest home. Shh. You wish something from the bar. Do you suppose you could fix us up with two double martinis? Very dry? Yes, sir. Alan, I'm sorry. I didn't know it would be like this. It doesn't matter that much, does it? We didn't want to mix with other people anyway. We wanted to... Stop saying we. If you'd listened to me, we'd be in London by now. And you'd be in a business meeting. Not necessarily. Yes. And it would be the same the next day and the next and... Oh, Alan. That's what this is all about. Don't you see? Your drinks. Thank you. Look, I know you've been unhappy, but do you think I enjoy working 28 hours a day? It comes down to the same thing, doesn't it? We never see each other. We never talk, or... I told you, after I close this deal, I'm going to start taking it easy. Which is what you said two years ago. You closed that deal, but it didn't make any difference. There were more deals. There'll always be more deals. Because that's all that matters to you now, isn't it? Bartender, another. Yes, ma'am. Try to control yourself. I have been controlling myself for six years, and I'm tired of it. I am tired of begging for little bits of your time. You're not interested in me anyway. You're interested in success. Fight your way to the top and then fight to stay there. Stop making a scene. Why? Does it take your mind off mergers and board meetings? No, it takes my mind off the fact that we're supposed to be on a trip together. Come off it, Alan. 
You're going to England on business. I happen to be along. That's all. Why? Because I insisted. If I hadn't, you'd have gone alone. Isn't that true? Admit it. I can't talk to you when you're like this. You made me like this. Because the truth is, you don't care anymore. I was stupid to think that a few days together would make a difference. You're a flaming success now. Alan Ransom, the financier. And I'm the nagging wife who doesn't understand. Eileen, please. What's the matter? Are you afraid they'll catch on? Don't worry. They think we're a happy couple. Made for each other. Shut up. Yes, sir. Well, when this tub finally gets there, you can relax. Because I'll be leaving. That might be a good idea. Oh, it is. You'll have all those nice deals to keep you warm with no silly woman around. It should be marvelous. It will be. For now, I'll be on deck reading the Financial Times. Here's for the drinks. Excuse us. Oh, not you again. Well, yes. Well, uh, not really. How do you do, dear? Nice to see you, Mrs. McKenzie. If you don't mind, I'm trying to read the paper. Uh, yeah, um, um, my wife, um, uh, Millie, yeah, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I, well, I say my wife, I, I mean we would very much like you to join us for tea, if, if you'd be so kind. Because I'm wearing my tweed jacket? No, hmm? no, no, no. no. <laughs> tweed jacket, I see. I think we're very British. <laughs> no, no, we simply want we simply want to chat. Is it a date then? I don't We'd be delighted. In about an hour? About an hour, yes. Yes, in the Imperial Lounge. We'll see you there. And thank you. Mm, not at all. An hour then. Yeah, jolly good. Looking forward. <laughs> Why did you do that? Because you and I don't have anything more to say to each other. You know it's true. We're finished. But you said it yourself. We're stuck here. So we might as well call a truce for now and make the best of it. Agreed. So glad you could make it. Charmed, I'm sure. Ah, uh, do, do, do sit down. Do sit down. Uh, not at all. Um, <clears throat> nasty day. What? Um, <clears throat> now look. The reason for this meeting, apart from the pleasure of your company, is, um, uh, well... Uh, Go ahead, Toby. Uh, yes, yes, um, thank you. Um, Millie, that's my wife, yes, 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 uh, the, uh, Millie pointed out that uh, we've all been, well, uh, something less than hospitable to you, if not rude. Uh, and so I, I expect I ought to apologize. And do you? Hmm? Oh, oh yes, 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 uh, most sincerely. But... You see, there is something more important. Uh, good news, in fact. Yes, uh, uh, we've been talking the whole thing over, and we've decided that you won't have to leave the ship after all. We won't? Say, that is good news. We were afraid we were going to have to swim back, and it's had us sick with worry. Really? Hmm? No. Nope. <laughs> oh, I see. It's, I see. It's not very good. No, no I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, my boy. But we were quite concerned, all of us, as I, I dare say you gathered. You see, it simply hadn't occurred to us that an outsider 
would ever want to travel on the lady. Uh, the last time she, she took on a new passenger was, well, according to Captain Prothero, uh, was some 16 years ago, so, so you, can, you can understand. Yeah, but never mind that. It's all settled now. What's all settled, Mr. McKenzie? Oh, no, we, we'll, we'll get to that in good time. You simply must forgive us. We can't have been very good company so far. Well, frankly... Yeah, the point is, we spent a good many fine hours, Millie and I, my wife Millie, uh, on, on this old um, well, scowl. And when we heard they were going to retire her, well, it seemed right somehow that we should join her on her last return voyage. Yeah, absolutely. And the same is true of the others. Yeah, with well, the other people. Yeah, and, and that's what accounts for the number of, of senior parties uh, aboard. We didn't understand. No. And you still don't, really. More tea? It's quite bracing. Yeah, I'll go. There's one thing that hasn't changed. Mm. Mm. Yes, tea is still the best in the world. What about the others, Mr. McKenzie? Hmm? Well, the others? Oh, oh, yeah, yes, uh, like us, as I said. Sentiment, you know. Of course they know, Toby. Why else would they have chosen the Lady Anne? Oh, yes, that's true. Our story isn't so different, I guess. My husband and I had never really been alone in six years. Excuse me, I'm gonna get us a drink scotch all around? Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> that's splendid. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's embarrassed, isn't he? I seem to be doing that to him all the time now. You were saying the two of you hadn't been alone? Well, he's a busy man. You get wrapped up in things if you want to be the best, and I don't know. When I heard he was going on a business trip to England, I made him promise to take me. <laughs> but that doesn't explain the Lady Anne. No. No, I suppose it doesn't. Mostly it was the time. More days together. And, well, it just seemed kind of... special. Oh, my dear, the Lady Anne is special. Very special. More special, I should say, than either you or your husband could imagine. You see, this is the ship Toby and I sailed on when we were married. Which would be 53 years ago. 52. Yeah, she was a splendid thing then. Yeah, the ship, I mean. <laughs> oh, no, no. Toby, really. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you told us it was an old rust bucket. Uh-uh. Not it. She. She, yes. Oh, I should have been struck down by lightning for such a fearful lie. Mrs. Ransom... Mm, mark this. The Lady Anne was the finest ship that ever crossed the sea. Queen of the fleet, she was. Oh, yes, indeed. Is, Mackenzie, is. No other ship can touch her. Quite right. Uh, sit down, Burgess. This is an old companion of mine, Ian Burgess, Mrs. Ransom. Ah, yes, congratulations. Uh, I... I don't follow... I hear there's been a decision made in your favor. Not now. Nonsense. Quite a relief, I must say. What is? Why, what else? My good lady, you are in luck. How so? Well, haven't you told them? It's about you and your husband. It seems you won't have to die after all. <laughs> Well, I'm so sorry. What did you say? <laughs> he said you won't have to die after all. <laughs> yeah, of boredom, he means. <laughs> well, don't stand there like a ninny Ian, tea all over you. Yeah, but sit down, sit down. Um, yes, um, to be sure. Sorry, <laughs> I seem to have spilled my tea. 
Uh, yeah, but, uh, well, uh, uh, you see, uh, Mrs. R, um, she was the only one of her kind, specialised in honeymooners. That was her freight then, yes. Oh, yes. Young people in love. Ah, marvellous. The drinks? Ah, yes. You see, that, that's what makes your presence so... Um, so... Uh, Sweet? Uh, no, 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 no. No, no, no. Well, it was that. It, it certainly was that. Young married couples, you see. That's all you'd ever see. Full of, of juice and the moon in their eyes. All those children trying to act grown up and worldly and used to it. And everyone as nervous as a mouse. <laughs> yes. But that sort of thing, it lasted for only a few days. The Lady Anne gave them time to know each other. Oh, she was a wise ship. Cheers. 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 Everything was arranged for young people. Love has its own point of view, you know. It sees things larger than life. Nothing is too ornate or too fancy or too dramatic. If it is a good love, it demands the theatrical and then transfigures it, turns the grotesque into the lovely, as a child does. With it, we can see what we wish to see in people. Without it, we cannot see at all. We can search forever. <laughs> How a shipping line ever found that vision, I cannot imagine. But they made the Lady Anne into an enchanted gondola and took that moment of happiness and pure sweet pain all lovers have and made the moment live for two unspeakably pleasant weeks. Uh, <clears throat> well, they, they get the drift, my dear. There's no need to go gooey. <laughs> but I feel gooey. The same is true for all of us, actually. Bolshia Jones and his wife over there, the bald chap. Engineer in his day, and a good one. The Whiteways. Mm. Next to them, Lord Bristow, with his cigar. Nice enough, but uh, he's getting on. And there's old Champion. Innis Champion, the writer, adventure stories, that sort of thing. Quite a droll fellow, though you wouldn't guess it now. Widower, you know. Aye, and his wife. <laughs> there was a wild thing. She passed on in... Oh, can't be sure of the date. What about you, Mr. Burgess? The same. We'd planned this trip together, but... Have you a picture? In my breast pocket, over my heart. She's very beautiful. Ah. Oh, my dear, please. This is purely temporary. I shall be with her soon. I'm so sorry. Oh, there, dear. It's all right. None of it really matters if you're in love. You are in love, aren't you, Mr. Ransom? Yes, of course. Well, that's the only thing that counts, you know. Everything else perishes. <laughs> now you've made her cry. Oh, perfectly all right. I cry all the time, don't I, Toby? All the time. Well, I don't. Why don't you two go out and get some fresh air? Do you good? Fog or no fog? That might be a good idea. Yes. We'll see you later. Of course you will. I think they're all very, very nice. The sun. What about it? It's behind us. It was over there, and now it's... We're heading north. 
So we're heading north. We should be heading east. Blame it on me. Everything else is my fault. Why not this? There you go. Starting again. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Look at them down there playing shuffleboard. Or sitting wrapped up in their blankets. Really, Eileen, this whole idea was ridiculous. Eileen? Eileen, where are you? Eileen? Eileen! I thought you did get rather gooey there, my dear, but you know, I rather liked it. <laughs> gooey. <laughs> oh! Oh, Mr. Ransom! Uh, I say, is something the matter? I can't find my wife. We were standing over there at the rail. She was right behind me. You don't think anything could have happened to her, do you? Oh, no, I, I doubt that. It, it's rather difficult to fall overboard. Oh, yes, yes. Eileen! 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 Eileen? Stuart, have you seen my wife? Uh, no, sir, but I, I wouldn't worry. I want this ship searched. I'll take the liberty of alerting the crew. Have you tried the library? Eileen? Uh, not here, sir. But she's got to be somewhere. Uh, still looking, sir. Haven't you found her yet? Easy, sir. We'll, we'll let you know. Eileen? Eileen, where are you? Not turned up yet? No, I searched everywhere. She'll turn up. Have a nip with me. Come on, boy. Uh, let's go inside. Uh, yeah, maybe she, she's inside. Come on. Let's go into the Imperial Lounge, what? Two whiskeys. Make them strong. I can't believe it. She's... gone. Well, it does seem that way. <laughs> but of course it isn't so. You've just missed her. <laughs> you don't know how much. A toast to the Lady Anne. Here, here. Oh, yes. Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. The Lady Anne. Mm. Yes. It's a pity. What's going to happen? A crime. An evil, black-hearted crime. Easy, Burgess, easy. Easy? Gad, they want to scrap the lady. Outlived her usefulness? Nonsense. A little slow, perhaps. Speed. That's all that counts now. Why? What's the rush, eh, Ransom? I... see your point. Freddy, another gin. That's the state of the world today. It's a plot. Doubtless of communist origin. Who wound him up? Burgess, do sit down. Haven't you eyes, man? The Lady Anne was condemned because she represents a better way of life. She's grace and manners and tradition. She's the Empire. Oh, I say, somebody turn him off! Silence, Adicott. The beasts are at the gate, and we stand about like statues, with our medals gone to rust and our swords broken. Soon they'll... Reach up their hairy hands and pull the queen down from her throne. Scrap the lady? 
They'll scrap the world! Poor chap. He'll feel better later at the party. Another drink, Mr. Ransom. Mr. Ransom? You mean you were here all the time? But I've been searching for you. I'm here. I've always been here. Oh, Eileen. Are you drunk? Maybe so, or maybe this is the first time in six years that I've been sober. What's that you're wearing? The nightgown? Oh, Mrs. Mackenzie gave it to me. She wore it on her honeymoon. It's beautiful. You're beautiful. This whole stupid world is beautiful. What happened to you? I don't know, but I'm going to try not to forget. I'm going to try very hard. Oh, Alan. Will you look at all this? Balloons, ribbons. Over here! Join us, please! <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Mackenzie! Oh, come on. Drink up. The champagne's getting warm. <laughs> well, you found her. Oh, you're as bad as Alan. I think we'd like you to meet Captain Prothero. Mr. and Mrs. Ransom. Happy to meet you, sir. My pleasure. You've had a pleasant voyage, I trust. Oh, yes. <laughs> We're grateful to be a part of it. Indeed. Your presence has been good for us as well. You packed your things? Shh, shh, shh. They don't know yet. Oh. Well, I uh, suppose it doesn't matter. Know what? Nothing important. If you'll excuse me, I have to make some preparations. Be back shortly. You look positively radiant, my dear. The Lady Anne has worked her magic on you. She... and you. All of you. I'd forgotten some things. How to relax. I was so busy, I... Well, I lost sight of what's important. It won't happen again. I say, let's drink to that. Have the engine stopped? Oh, no, nothing to worry about. Cheers. Mr. Burgess, why are we having a party now? We're only part way there. You'll understand soon enough. Who needs a reason to party? Mrs. Ransom, may I have this dance? I have been waiting for someone to ask. Mrs. McKenzie? I'm not very good, but... Oh, delighted, Mr. Ransom. <laughs> oh, splendid. <laughs> I see they haven't gotten them fixed. What? The engines. The engines? Oh, there's nothing wrong with the engines. Ready now? Your luggage has been collected. Luggage? Really? Should have told them. Didn't want to spoil the party. Excuse me, but what are you talking about? Why should our luggage be moved? Because, my friends, we're putting you off the ship. You're what? Are we in trouble? No, no, nothing like that. They'll come to understand. Maybe so, but we don't understand now, and we're not going anywhere until we do. I'm afraid there isn't any choice. Follow me, please. Uh, Alan? 
Is this some kind of gag? You don't just put passengers off a ship in mid-ocean. Stuart, Captain, draw your pistol. Yes, sir. You're kidding, aren't you? If you'll do as the captain says, this way. I tell you what, we'll all go. Alan, what's going on? You can't be serious. There's nothing to worry about, my boy. Your exact position has been radioed. Even now, help is on the way. Alan, I'm not kidding. Captain, this is outrageous. Your luggage is in the boat. Flowers, a tin of biscuits. And champagne, if I thought of that. The lifeboat sends out a signal so you'll be picked up straight away. Everything you need. Except a reason. It's time we were off. Into the boat with you! No, please, I... But why? Is it something we've done? Not a bit of it. Then tell us! You can't do this without a reason! Cause, my boy, you can't go with us. Not yet. Yes, come along. Not where we're going. No, no, no. Step carefully, please. We liked you people. We thought you liked us. They do, Alan. Don't you see? Blow it away. Don't forget the blankets. Alan, look. Everyone's at the rail. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. I see. What are those papers, dear? They're your letters, Toby. Don't you remember, dear? I've kept them for so long. You're throwing them overboard. They deserve a proper burial at sea. I won't be needing them now, will I? <laughs> no, dear. Not anymore. Listen, the engines are starting again. They're moving. So are we. You. Here's a blanket. I don't need it. Aren't you cold, darling? Not with your arms around me. I don't think I've ever felt so warm in my life. Do you think we'll see them again? Yes. In fact, I'm sure of it. Lady Anne never reached port. The ransoms were picked up by a cutter a few hours later, just as the captain promised. They searched the newspapers but found no mention of the Lady Anne. The ship, with all its crew and passengers, went down in the mid-Atlantic, or so it was said. But Alan and Eileen knew better. They knew it had sailed on to a better port, its final destination on a distant shore called the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone.
Passage on the Lady Anne, starring Martin Jarvis and Rosalind Ayres, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Pasquese, Anne Somville, Jim McCants, Joby Cerny, Eleanor Weingart, Martin Astro, and Nick Ruddle. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Lamari and Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Matt Sorrow, Tim Cerny, and Todd Byer. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. This is Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Time to feed the kitty. I've been feeding it all night. Yeah, that baby's hungry. Let's go, boys. You heard the man. Put in two chips. Two times how many hands? The auntie's eating me alive. You got some cards coming. I can feel it. Yeah? That a money-back guarantee? You pay your money, and you take your chances. Dealer aunties. Let's go, Johnny. I got to give it some thought. My stack's getting pretty low. <laughs> Look at who's sitting this one out. That right, Johnny? I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I know one thing. Takes money to win money. Yeah, yeah. Listen to the man. Are you in or out? Give me one minute, all right? Take it easy, John. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you should kick back, watch some TV. Hey, hold on. I came here to play cards. Hand me that remote. Say, what are you... Just give it to me. The old fire hall is there. So You're going to let one lousy player, player hang up the game? Don't game. worry about it. Johnny here needs some time out. You know the old saying. What's that? that Money talks and suckers walk. Front, scientists are baffled as all communications in and out of Peaksville remain blocked. For live coverage, our Eyeball News team takes you inside the city limits following this broadcast on the 11 o'clock report. And that's a wrap of today's news. I say deal them. All right, boys, here we go. Down the derby. Okay, already. I'm all in. You ain't even looked at your cards. What's the difference? One more hand and I'm out. Sure, Johnny, maybe you'll double up. I got a good feeling this time. <laughs> Me too. I'll see that and I'll raise you. Raise? Everything I got's in the pot. Separate side bet. I fold. Dealer raises again. Call. Cards, John? Three. Keeping a kicker, huh? All right, four. Come on in! Who's that? A friend of mine. Said he'd stop by. Heck of a time for it. It's open! Jody Hallam? Who wants to know? Mr. Hallam, will you come with us? You got a warrant? No, sir, but... Then get out of my room. My associates and I are having a friendly game of cards. This is a federal matter. We have a car waiting downstairs. Oh, good for you. You see any money on this table? Because I sure don't. There's no time to lose, sir. If you'll just come with us. Hey, why the cuffs? Someone wants to see you in Washington. Uh, be seeing you, Jody. I'll just hold on to my chips for now. Let me call my lawyer. No need for that. What's this all about? 
A matter of national security, sir. You might say a matter of life and death. Excuse me, gentlemen, if you don't mind. We'll just fast forward out of here. Hey, will somebody tell me what this is all about? Winning lottery numbers coming up, but first the news. In world news, the asteroid known as Wanderer continues on a path toward our solar system. But there's no cause for alarm. Scientists say it will miss Earth by several million miles. Repeat, despite rumors, there is no danger. Wanderer poses no threat to our world. And now, here's a handy household hint from our home economist. Portrait of a man who has just been granted a reprieve. Not from a card game, because it's a sure bet he would have won, given his considerable skill as a dealer. No, the two men in gray suits have saved him from almost certain deaths. His name? Jody Hallam, a gambler and con man who lives by his wits, and wants above all else to go on living. At the moment, the odds still look good for Mr. Hallam, but he is about to discover that the laws of chance don't always apply in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Pattern for Doomsday, starring Henry Rollins, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And I can tell you that its progress has been closely watched for the past month, as is the case with all unidentified objects sighted in space. May we have the slide, please? Excuse me, General? Yes. The eighth man, um, he's here. Showman. Yes, sir. Has he been briefed? Just the basics on the way over. I'll handle it from here. Mr. Hallam, have a seat at the end of the table. Well, aren't you going to introduce me to everybody? After the presentation, General Sinclair has the floor. Sit, please. Okay, okay. Now then, slide, please. This is a routine photo from the 200-inch Hale telescope on Mount Palomar. Must be some camera. Shh. I don't see anything. Let me use the pointer. That short white line in the star field is the first picture we have of Wanderer. May I ask a question? Dr. Uh, Conrad, is it? Yes. When exactly was this taken? A little over a month ago. October 3rd, to be exact. I see. Next slide. This photograph, taken only three weeks ago, indicates that Wanderer is indeed headed for our solar system. Next slide. And this shot conclusively establishes what astronomers feared, that Wanderer is on a collision course with Earth. What? Next. This picture from two days ago allows astronomers to accurately measure Wanderer. It is about 2,000 miles in diameter, a little less than our moon. Can we have the lights, please? Hey, General, is this on the level? I wish I could report otherwise. The fact is, the time of collision is now 53 hours and 40 minutes. Couldn't we blast it with an H-bomb or something? I saw that in the movie one time. Efforts are underway to destroy or deflect the asteroid, but unfortunately, there isn't much hope for success. Hey, General, if, as you say, astronomers have known about it for some time, why is it that the public hasn't been told the truth? To begin evacuating the cities, for example. To avoid panic. Virtually all heads of state are in agreement. And the damage is projected to be so widespread that there's no longer any point. But what about us? Why were we dragged here if this thing's going to hit in a couple of days? And I thought I was washed up. Now I find out the whole world's done for. What do you expect us to do, General? Most of us are ordinary citizens. Mr. President. Please remain seated. Have you finished your briefing? I have, sir. I wanted to meet you all personally. It's a great service you're about to perform for your country and for the world. I don't like the sound of that. He's not as tall as he looks on TV. Please, hold your questions. That's all right, General. They're about as confused as the rest of us. I'll get to the point. Out of the entire population, you eight people are among a very few to be made aware of the situation. 
Let me tell you why. I can handle that part if you like, Mr. President. No, no, they deserve to hear it from me. I'm the one who signed the order. It's taken 10 years for the United States to build its first nuclear-powered spaceship, the Varuna-1. It was intended for the exploration of space. That ship now stands on a launching pad in New Mexico, ready for its first and last mission, that of transporting human life to a new planet to grow and multiply. To put it simply, you have been selected to represent the future of the human race. Then we're really in trouble. You can say that again. Is he serious? That's People crazy. Why us? Know that in you rests the heritage of all humanity. Our prayers go with you. Good luck and Godspeed. Thank you, sir. Are you the psychologist? Dr. Russell Conrad, Denver, Colorado. I'd like to shake all of your hands. Francie Blaze, Los Angeles. I, um, entertain. Pleased to meet you. Jody Howland, Mr. President. I'm from Chicago. I guess you could say I'm a speculator. I see. Regina Walsh, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm a singer. Or I was. Is that right? D. Clark, Spokane, Washington, bacteriologist. How do you do? Philip Jewell, New York City. Mr. President, I'm not sure I approve of all this. I don't You're understand. You're Dr. Jewell? Yes. I've read several of your books on philosophy. Thank you. But about what's happening here... General Sinclair will fill you in on the details, Doctor. Lily Wong, San Francisco. I am an artist. Hello. Harvey Winteroth, Traverse City, Michigan. And just an auto mechanic. Don't say that. You all have very valuable skills, chosen to complement each other. Believe me, the hopes and aspirations of the world go with each and every one of you. Try to bear that in mind. And now, goodbye and good luck. Thank you for taking the time, sir. Never thought I'd get to meet the president, but there I was, shaking his hand and talking to him. General, I demand to know... Yes, Mr. Jewell? Just how did eight people get picked to represent the human race? It was not at random, I assure you. It was a matter of careful selectivity. A computer was programmed with all relevant factors. Physiological, psychological... Who did the programming? Panel of experts from several disciplines. Based on what criteria? General health, adaptability, fertility. That's why you all had examinations. Varied backgrounds, genetic history, immunity to disease, long-term stability on the cellular level. Out of what sampling? The entire population, Doctor. At least those we had preliminary data for. General, how come the president isn't going? He's a very important man, I would have thought. He's married, which was one of the disqualifying factors. For those of you who are interested, the criteria are listed in the background report. I have copies if you like. Well, I'd like to see that report. On the table at the back of the room, there's a packet for each of you. Look at me. What a mess. I better fix my face. You look fine. Don't kid me. We're not here because of our looks, that's for sure. Must be because we're in such good shape. Yeah, you're a regular bodybuilder. I'm serious. Other kids got the measles, but not me. I was always lucky that way. Goody for you. Oh, maybe not 100%, but when I lost, it was because someone else was dealing. <laughs> Man, I sure wised up in a hurry. A dealer, huh? I can spot one a mile away. Fingers always twitching. Just keep them to yourself. Hey, now, baby, I never done anything crooked with these fingers. I know. You just help the cards along. The suckers get greedy, that's all. So they get restless and overplay. Is that my fault? Can I help it if they want to make it all in one night? I ask you, who's the smart one, me or them? You heard what the general said about brains. We'll see how you make out where we're going. Listen, Jody Hallam always makes out. You remember that. Just don't try any magic fingers on me. 
Ha! Don't flatter yourself. Come on, I want to get the lowdown on this game. And after that, it was all entered into the memory banks. The results were collated and sorted until we had it down to this number. Ah, so we have a machine to blame for being here. Blame? You should be happy the machine picked you. Should I? Then why do I feel as if I'm deserting humanity in its hour of need? General, how soon will the Varuna leave Earth? In less than 24 hours. We'll all be flown to the launch point. What about food on the ship? It will be stocked with bread, soup, meats, even ice cream. In a concentrated form. Enough for a lifetime if necessary. You won't be hungry. Uh, how can they get that much chow on one ship? It will be made from continuously harvested tanks of chlorella, a fast-growing single-celled plant. A plant. That doesn't sound very palatable. Hey, General, where are we supposed to land? There's an area on Mars if we can confirm it's suitable for a small colony. How about if it's not? Ship's nuclear power pack can take you all the way to Alpha Centauri if necessary. Using a new form of hyperdrive. That's the nearest star system with habitable planets. Maybe there'll be people there like us. I read a story about a princess on Mars. Then you can go into your dance and knock their eyes out, if they have eyes. Who's kidding who? I was never a very good dancer. I was never very good at anything. But I got along because people would pay for it. All that's over with now. You better believe it. I'll start over up there. Be me this time. I'll be what I want to be, not what they want me to be. Right. Keep that attitude. I have a question. Who's flying us to where we are going? We've assigned a crew of two. That should be sufficient. Captain Gerald Vickers and Lieutenant Robert McKenna. You will meet them when... Oh, excuse me. Sinclair? Yes. Right away. Limousine is downstairs, ready to take you to the airport. No calls for us? To say our goodbyes? I'm sorry, Doctor. We can't risk breaching security. Now, if you'll all come with me, please. You have a great adventure ahead of you. Perhaps the greatest in the history of mankind. Oh, wow. Air traffic control, you're cleared for takeoff. At position, check start. take off. Oh, don't worry about it. The odds are on our side. Are you serious? <laughs> this crate could fall out of the sky at any time. Relax. You got more chance of being hit by a car. Yeah, sure. I mean it. You see the giant seal? What? There ain't no animals. Are there? The seal of the United States of America. This is some kind of official plane. They're not going to take any chances. What if we get... get hijacked? Now you're really dreaming. We got searched. Nobody could bring a gun in here. Oh, yeah? What about them? Who? The guys up front. With Sinclair. Take a look. They both got pieces under their coats. How do you know? I know. You don't think I ever saw a shoulder holster before? Well, if they got him, it must be okay. Secret Service or something. A lot of good they can do us now. Easy, baby, easy. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments we shall be landing. Thank you. Authorized person. 
ID, please. General Sinclair and Company to operations. Oh, right, General. Operations is the first building. Straight ahead. I know where operations is, sir. Yes, sir. Open the gate. Just follow the walkway to the entrance. How do you do, sir? Good to see you, Captain. Lieutenant John McKenna, General. At ease. This is your pilot, Captain Gerald Vickers, and Lieutenant McKenna. Mr. Hallam, Miss Walsh. Welcome. Hiya. Captain, huh? Miss Blaze, Dr. Conrad. Hello. Miss Clark, Dr. Jewell, Miss Wong. Mr. Winteroth? Hi. Nice to meet you. You're the pilot? I'll do my best. I sure hope you know what you're doing. Well, there she is. Where? Out in the field. Take a good look. That ship's going to be home for a long time. It's beautiful. Wow, some design. A little small, isn't it? Not really, Miss Blaze. It's a very efficient design. Just enough room for eight passengers. Eight? Don't you mean... I'll go over the details in a few minutes. For now, they're expecting us inside. If you'll follow me... General Sinclair? What is it? General, I have a communication from the Pentagon. Priority A. Very well. That will be all. Yes, sir. Hmm. What is it? Don't tell me. The flight's overbooked. You might as well know. The nuclear missiles we sent up from three countries to intercept Wanderer have made contact. All detonated on impact. They hit Wanderer? And? Well, don't keep us in suspense. There was no appreciable deviation. The asteroid is still on course. What does that mean, in plain English? It means that there's no last great hope for Earth. I would say, then, that this group is our hope. Captain Vickers. Yes, Doctor. Something you said a moment ago. What was that? Well, you said there was only room for eight people aboard the ship. That's right. Does that include you and Lieutenant McKenna? I'll answer all your questions at the final briefing. But... This way, please. Sit down, if you will. How many more hours do we have? When are you going to feed us? I'm a little queasy myself. In about an hour. We're on a tight schedule. Uh, General, I asked a question outside. I think I deserve an answer. We're eight people. The captain and the lieutenant make ten. But if the ship will only hold eight... I have an announcement in that regard. When this group was organized by presidential order, two reserves were included. Who? You mean we're not all going? Why didn't you tell us the truth? What are they arguing about? They got an angle. I knew it. There was no way of telling if you were all alive and well, or even if you could be located once the selection was made. The reserves were a way of preparing for any contingency. As it turns out, one that didn't occur. So who are the reserves? They were not specified. What? Then we don't know if we're on the list or not? In that case, I volunteer to stay behind. I'm afraid I can't accept your offer, Doctor. I'll give up my place. I have friends who are going to die. I'd rather spend my last hours with them. I sympathize with you, Miss Wong, but I can't accept your offer either. Then how... It was provided that in a case like this, the matter would be decided by chance. Leave it to me, General. Don't make me laugh. 
It just so happens I have a deck of cards with me. We'll cut for it. High cards go. Mr. Hallam. You want to be fair, don't you? This is the only way. Never fails. Aces and kings, sure winners. After that... I can't let you do this. Deuces and trays on the low end. Got it? Everybody, come up one by one and... We are not using cards, Mr. Hallam. I'm in command here. Then how? We flip a coin? Sometimes the old ways are best. We'll draw straws. Whatever you say, General, makes it simpler. Watch me. I'm tearing out matches. I'll make two of them short. Sit down, Mr. Hallam. No matches? Well, in that case... I said sit down. All right, all right. Just trying to help. Captain Vickers has prepared the straws, or their equivalent. Captain? Yes, sir. I have eight pencils here. They've already been measured, so there can be no mistake. Who's first? Miss Blaze? Why me? The order won't make a difference. Go ahead, Captain. Anyone at all. If you say so. Here goes. Just take one of the ends and pull it out of my hand. This looks like a good one. I'll go next. Now, Dr. Jewel. Followed by Miss Wong. Mr. Winteroth from Michigan. Miss Clark. Miss Walsh. And Mr. Hallam. There. That does it. Everybody hold them up. The short ones are Miss Clark and Mr. Hallam. You two will not be going with us. Hey, wait a minute. Sit down, Mr. Hallam. I was the last man on the totem pole. I didn't have a choice. Someone had to be last. Sure. Give everybody a break, but me. Statistically, it doesn't matter. The result was random. All I'm asking for is a fair shake. Game over, Mr. Magic Fingers. But I'm telling you, it ain't fair. You should talk, honey. Sit down. Are we free to go? You are, Miss Clark, with my profound thanks. You may go to the bunker with the rest of the personnel to observe, if you like. Or I can have you transported any way you choose. I'll have to think about that. Of course. There's a rest area down the hall. Lieutenant McKenna will open the beverage machines for you. Thank you. And goodbye to you, Mr. Hallam. And thank you, Mr. Hallam. Yeah, thanks for nothing. Come on, let's get out of here. Sit down. You're making me nervous. Yeah, yeah. Miss Clark's right. Would you like a cup of coffee? I'd like a shot of scotch if you want to know the truth. Cream and sugar? Black. Do you have family, Lieutenant? Yes, ma'am. I mean, miss. Uh, back in Austin. Oh. Are, are you going there to be with them? I sure hope so. If there's time. It's a terrible thing, I suppose. The little tragedies. We have time to absorb them. But something like this, it's... It's too vast to comprehend. I know what you mean. Cut the chatter. What is this, a funeral? You might call it that. Well, I tell you one thing. The game isn't over till it's over. You never know what's going to happen at the finish. This isn't a horse race, Mr. Hallam. We'll see about that. Give me the coffee, will you? Of course. Yeah. Tastes like mud. If you'd rather have a soft drink... Forget it. Sorry you didn't care for it. Yeah, sure. Where do you come off so high and mighty? Uniform, shine on your shoes. You know something? Underneath, you're just like the rest of us. Scared out of your gourd. I'd better see how the general's coming along. Will you sit down? It won't be much longer. Then you'll be back with your own kind. I don't see why you're so anxious to go home. One of them in there could have a heart attack or something. And then what would we do? 
Draw straws again to see which one of us goes? Sure, why not? At least try to face reality and make peace with it. Listen, if they let me do it my way, you think I'd be sitting out here? Oh, you mean you'd have fixed the cards. Lady, when your life is on the line, you try anything. Even if it means pain or misfortune for others? If that's the way the chips fall. <laughs> you amaze me. I thought I'd seen all kinds. You ain't never seen Jody Hallam before. Thank God for small favors. I would say, Mr. Hallam, that you're nothing special on the evolutionary scale. More along the lines of a throwback. I mean, you've hardly advanced beyond your one-celled progenitors. Say, is that a wisecrack? I've seen your kind under microscopes. Bacteria don't have a conscience either. Oh, but they do? In there? How do you know Vickers didn't fix it the way the General wanted? Don't be absurd. It was impartial, and we lost. I'm ready to leave whenever they let me. Go ahead, give up. That's what you learned in your school. But where I come from, it's a different story. General? Yes? General, I'm sorry I blew my stack before, but... Well, it's a hard thing to take. It really hit me, you know? Believe me, I understand. Everybody all set? They've had their final instructions. Everything worked out, huh? No hitches? Ladies and gentlemen, you'd better get ready for the pre-launch. Look, do you think it would be all right if I see him to the ship? Wish everybody good luck and everything? Mm, I don't see why not. That doesn't sound like you, wishing everybody but yourself good luck. No? Why the change of heart? Can't win them all. You ought to know that. That's not what you told me before. Well, that's what I'm telling you now. Miss Blaze? Yeah. I mean, yes, sir. We're going to the ship now. Follow me. Sure thing. Uh, not you. General Sinclair said it was okay. Only fly personnel on the field. I know. <laughs> I'm gonna say goodbye to him on the ship. General? It's all right, guards. Let him pass. Proceed. Sure, thanks a lot. Nice gun you got there. Oh, you coming with us? You'll have to use the ladder one at a time, please. Well, this is it. So long to the good old U.S. of A. It was a rat race. But I think I'm gonna miss it. It just doesn't seem possible to think that all this will change in a few hours. How much time? Well, not long, by my watch. The Baruna One is now on internal power. Look at all those stars. The sky's like this in Michigan. There's a place I used to fish at. I guess I won't see it again. We'd better get aboard. Move ahead to the control room at the end of the passage. Guards, stay with us a moment longer. How long to lift off? Eight minutes. I'll give the engines a final check. Thrusters powered up. Retros all clear. Gyro stabilizer charged. I feel like a sardine already. Relax, baby. This is one tin can nobody's gonna open. Aren't you supposed to wave bye bye now? Let me have your attention. This is it, Mr. Hallam. Shh. I want to hear what he says. The president has asked me to extend his blessings and his hopes for a safe journey. Also, he's aware of the hardships that lie before you. He wants to remind you that in all the years to come, you must not lose sight of your purpose. Guards, There's a digital sir, library see Mr. Hallam back to the building. Yes, sir. Each of you come with me. In a minute, I said. It will be your trust to nurture the first generation born off Earth. For upon this, a new civilization will be built long after we are forgotten.
This way. Right. What kind of gun are you packing? 45 automatic, huh? Keep moving. Can I see it? Keep your hands. I just want to look at it. What in the. Back off! Drop it. Not on your life. Watch him. He's got a gun. He's. Ah! Oh my God. Hold it! Now, General, since Dr. Jewel here won't be making the trip, as his reserve, I'm electing myself to take his place. He didn't want to go anyway. Do you think these people would have you after this? No more pretty speeches. You and the guards, make yourself scarce and drag the doctor with you. Something wrong with your hearing? General. Touch your holster, flyboy, and you're a dead man, too. Do as he says. That's better. <laughs> well, what do you know, honey? Looks like we're gonna get better acquainted after all. What do we call you now? Little Caesar? Just what do you expect to gain by this... this murder? Life, my friend, in the big blue up there like the rest of you. Oh, I know you're thinking you'll make me pay, but you won't. Not if there's only eight people left. You're gonna need me. Keep your distance, buster. Now, Francie, you know better than that. A man gambles, he loses here and there, but the game's not over till the last card's been played. Am I right or am I right? Hey, you! Keep your hands where I can see them! I can't let you do this. Back out of here real slow-like. You too, Lieutenant. Are you going to shoot them too? If you do, who'll fly the ship? Back out, I said. I'm not going anywhere. Neither am I. Put the gun down. <laughs> yeah, sure. There are too many of us. Guards, Mr. Hallam is going to surrender his weapon. Take him into custody. Yes, sir. You're invading my space, flyboy. You're surrounded, mister. Hand it over. Now. Don't make me laugh. If he won't, I'll just have to take it. I warned you, the next one won't miss. Try me for a target, little man. Let go! Drop it! Drop it! Now look what you've done. That ain't in the rules. Does he have a pulse? No, sir. Dr. Jewel, are you all right? It's just my shoulder. The bullet passed through. Guard, get the medical kit. All right, General. We won't be going anywhere, General. The second shot took out the control panel. Can it be repaired? Not the telemetry system. Then replace the module. There is no replacement. It would take days to assess the damage. He's right, General. Oh, is that true? You mean we can't take off? How can we? What are we going to do? Yeah, what are we going to do? I wish I knew what to say to you. Damn him! Just because he wasn't going... He was right. What? He always said he was lucky. And maybe he was. Now he won't have to face the odds. What's that? Whatever it is, he's sure in a hurry. General! Up here! General, this just came in, sir, from the President. I am happy to tell you all that the danger is past. The President informs me that gravitational forces in the solar system have apparently torn Wanderer apart. Oh! You mean it's not gonna hit Earth? Initial reports are that it is broken up into five pieces. Each will miss us by many thousands of miles. Let's get out of here. One at a time, folks. Can I give you a hand, Miss Blaze? You can give me two hands if you want. <laughs> a big, brave captain like you. Call me Francine. Okay. Francine, I'll help you down. What about him, Mr. Big Time Gambler? There'll be an ambulance on the way. 
He doesn't need an ambulance. He needs a hearse. Jody Hallam from Chicago. I got three words for you. So long, sucker. Portrait of a man who lived by his wits and wanted to go on living. The odds looked good, at least for a while. But when billions were marked for death, he lost faith in the laws of chance. Jody Hallam, who played a desperate last card and ended up the only man on earth to die as the direct result of a threat that never came true. In the Twilight Zone. Pattern for Doomsday, starring Henry Rollins with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Jerry Soule. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Linda Reiter, Richard Hensel, Roderick Peoples, Jeff Lupiton, Jamie Barron, Steve Key, Nikki Lindgren, Elaine Robinson, Kurt Nabick, Jennifer Joy, Doug James, Carl Amari, Alex Opener, and Vince Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website, at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. People Are Alike All Over, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, based on a story by Paul W. Fairman. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Lisa Joyce, Richard Hensel, Steve Key, Derek Purcell, Doug James, Linda Ryder, Brooke Reed, Charlie Kummerer, Amanda Amari, and C.J. Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Marcuson, 
Evening, Conrad. Thought I'd find you out here. You thought right. Look at her. Like a needle pointed straight up at the sky. Pretty big needle. Odd, isn't it? Why do you say that? Well, for us, I mean. Odd way to spend the last night. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. Neither could I. But what a thing to do. A last night on Earth you don't spend in the middle of the desert looking at your transportation. A last night you spend... Well, you spend it enjoying Earth. You walk around its streets, you go into its bars, you dance with its women. Yeah. You drink in its view, savor it, enjoy it. But not us. That ship out there. We'll have all we want of her and more. She'll be our world for quite a while. 113 feet long by 18 feet wide. And yet here we stand, Conrad, watching her. Just three hours before we take off. Maybe we're trying to get used to the idea. Oh, we'll have plenty of time to get used to it. That'll be our city and country and house and front yard and backyard for the next three months. And we won't have any choice in the matter. Markson, could I ask you a question? Go ahead. Are you afraid? Of some things, I guess. The unknown, loneliness, the silence up there. But the ship, after all the work that's gone into her, I don't think so. How about you, Sam? It's different. You're ready for this. Three, four, five years. It's all you've prepared yourself for. But it's not the same with me. We both went through the same flight training. I know, but I'm a scientist, Marcuson, a biologist. My whole life, my world has been books and slides and microscopes. I'm being sent up there because they need my mind. Pity they just can't send that and leave my body back here where it belongs. But speaking frankly, yeah, I am afraid. I'm frightened of the place we're going and what we might find there. Martians? Well, that's not very likely. They're the one thing you don't need to be afraid of. They shouldn't be feared, even if we do run into them. Whoever we meet up there, whatever kind of creatures they are, if they exist, they'll still be people of one sort or another. You don't really think that. Why not? I've got a philosophy about people, and I mean all people. I'm sure that when God made human beings, he developed them from a... Call it a fixed formula with the same batch of ingredients. We have a pattern of behavior designed to meet certain needs, and those needs are going to be identical no matter what the form and the place. And that means we're all essentially the same on Earth or in the farthest reaches of space. Think about it, Sam. People. On Mars. Wherever they're able to exist, they have to be the same. Even up there in the stars. I'd like to be able to read those stars. I wish there were an equation that applies. A plus Y equals what? A rocket ship plus two men equals... Equals a wondrous adventure. Let's get ready, Sam. We've only got a couple of hours. You're standing at the edge of a highway into space. One soon to be traveled by a flimsy two-legged animal with an extremely small head. His name is Man and he is about to send his tiny, groping fingers up into the unknown, bound for a once mythical place known as Mars. The participants are Samuel A. Conrad, age 35, and Warren Markison, age 31. They are the first to undertake such an ambitious voyage, and in a moment we'll travel with them to a location only slightly off course, in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, People Are Alike All Over, starring Blair Underwood with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Prepare to correct course? Not yet. Fire retro rockets on my mark. Wait, I said. For what? I want to run a thermal scan on the landing gear. You did that. Well, I'm doing it again, plus a spectrographic on the planet's surface. We can't even see the surface till we correct. By the time we finish the turn, it'll be too late. Too late for what? To change the flight plan, the gravitational field will take effect. Exactly. We cut the main thrusters and fire the retros for a nice soft landing, right? Isn't that right, Conrad? What if something's wrong? Nothing's wrong. But what if it is? It'll take all the fuel we've got for another orbit. 
We have to be absolutely sure. We're as sure as we're ever going to be. There are too many variables. Atmospheric density, drag coefficients, power consumption. We've been through all that. I just checked the readings. The readings could be wrong. If we're off by a factor of 0.01, we'll miss the landing site completely. I'm going to run the numbers one more time. No, you're not. I'm in command here, and I say we're going in now. At least wait till the planet rolls up on the view screen. I want a spectrographic readout. Five. Four. Not yet. Cancel the sequence. I'm not canceling anything. Two. One. Fire retros. I said fire. All right, if you won't do it... Don't touch that switch! Fire! Fire! Ooh. Strap into your seat, now! Markison, you all right? Markison, where are you? Warren? Warren, can you hear me? Over here. Oh, thank God. After a landing like that? Any landing you can walk away from is a good landing. If you can get this instrument panel off me, I'll try to do that. Hang on, it's split in two. I'll see if I can lift it. How's the rest of the ship? Nose down in the bottom of a crater, as far as I can tell. Air pressure seems to be holding. Here, take my hand. Whoa, whoa. Not just yet, Sam. I've got a little bit of a problem with this leg. But we made it, didn't we? Yeah, we made it. With or without my help. It wasn't your fault. Sure it was. If I'd followed your order... We still would have come down at the wrong angle. The flight plan was off. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the flight plan. It's the terrain. It's not like the reconnaissance photos. Close but different. Somehow... Then you were right to be cautious. Do we have power? I don't know. I haven't had time to check anything. Try to get the lights running. It's dark in here. I may be able to rig a new circuit. You do that. I'll give you a hand. Don't be crazy. You can't even stand up. I'll do it. Sam? Yeah? Hurry, if you can. Will you, Sam? I want to take a look outside. I want to... I want to see what's really there. There's plenty of time for that. Uh, is there? I told you, we've got air. That means the hull's intact. You rest easy. I'll, I'll get the medical kit. If you say so, Sam. If you say so. Sam? I've got the circuits up. We are in business. What are you doing? Running a diagnostic on the equipment. Stay down. How long did I sleep? A couple of hours. Don't worry, you needed it. You run an atmosphere check? Yeah. So, is it safe out there? That's the question. What's the matter? Something wrong with the sample? No, I got a good one. More than enough. That's the problem. You couldn't get a reading? Oh, I got a reading all right. A complete analysis down to the last trace element. So, what did it say? It says, the air is fine. Almost identical to the mix on Earth. Well, what are we sitting here for? Let's go plant the flag. Hold on, you're not going anywhere with that leg. You go then. Just get the hatch open so I can see what's out there. I'm not going anywhere. Of course you are. Sam, we're the first men on Mars. What's the matter with you? Not yet. What are you waiting for, a printed invitation? It's the reading. But you said it was fine. It... it can't be right. Don't you trust the equipment, Sam? You designed it, remember? You and I both know there's no breathable atmosphere on Mars. Well, maybe there is where we landed. That doesn't make sense. If we're in a crater, there could be a buildup of gases. Not according to any scientific literature I've ever read. <sighs> then it's obvious the literature is wrong. You trust your equipment? I've run the data 50 times. And everything checks out. We made it, Sam. We made it. You know what that means? I want to filter out another sample and run it through the analyzer. We've traveled 35 million miles. Exactly. Another few hours won't make any difference. We can't wait any longer. 
The human race won't wait. If you won't open the hatch, I'll do it myself. You won't be able to get it open. The hydraulic's out. <sighs> Patch in the auxiliary power supply. You said the circuits are up. I'm telling you, we can't. Maybe you can't, but I can. You're going to wreck your other leg. I'll use the manual override. That's what I'll do. I'll disconnect the hydraulic lift at the wall and... I told you to take it easy. Sam. <laughs> just my luck, eh? 35 million miles through black space just to find a place to die. You are not going to die. That's all right. Really. It's just that... I'd hate for this ship to be my tomb. Do me one favor. Anything. When it does happen, and I think it'll be soon. Don't talk like that. Get me outside, one way or another. Don't be afraid. I've got a strange hunch that if anybody's out there, they'll help you with the funeral. That's how people are. And they are people, Sam. As long as they've got minds and hearts, that means they've got souls. And that makes them... people. No. For God's sake, don't die now. Don't leave me alone here. Warren! Warren! What's that? I don't know that. There's no way to find out, and, I, and I'm not ready to find out. Go away! Whoever or whatever you are, go away! No. No, they're coming. Whatever they are, they're coming. The gun. Where's the survival kit? There. Nothing fancy, just a good old 38 automatic. That ought to do the trick. Get away! I said, get away from the ship! All right, if you won't go away, you want me to come out, I'll come out. You think you're ready for me, huh? Huh? Where's that lever? Whoever or whatever you are, let's find out if you can eat lead. What the hell? Come on. Where are you? What are you waiting for? You see this? It's a gun. Know what a gun is? Want to find out? Step into the light so I can see you. Please, don't be afraid. There's no reason to, you know. What do you have in your hand? Oh, this, this it's a pistol. It's a... I, I, I was only going to use it if... Uh... May I see it? What? Uh, I, I suppose so. Just don't touch the trigger. It, 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 it contains uh, explosive missiles. They're called bullets. We didn't know if you were ever going to come out. We've waited most of the night. Very glad to see that you've finally done so, however. This is amazing. Uh, I'm Conrad. Samuel Conrad. That's my name. Uh, you understand? Name? Oh, we understand, Mr. Conrad. We landed here, my friend and I, uh, in this ship. Crashed, I should say. We come from Earth. Earth? Where I'm from. This planet is known as Mars. We took off in our ship almost uh, three months ago. Check on the other one. He may be injured. Yes, of course. 
Here, I'll show you in the sand. See, this is the sun. Sun, the, the, the big star. And this is the Earth, the third planet from the sun. And this is you, here. The other one is dead. His name is Markison. Don't be alarmed, Mr. Conrad. We don't intend to hurt you. We've only been wondering when you intended to come out. Of course, we were curious. But how... how do you know my language? We don't, Mr. Conrad. As you'll no doubt soon realize, you're speaking our language. Your language? Unconscious transference. You'd call it hypnosis of a sort. But you must be tired. We'll prepare a place for you to rest and food. I'm appreciative. I, I really am. You'll forgive me my... my staring, I, I, I mean, but I, I can't get over it. I mean, you're... You're people, just like I am, uh, actual human beings. Markson said you'd... Mm. Oh. Marcus. We'll bear your friend for you. Later on, you can tell us the sort of marker you'd like. That is your tradition, isn't it? Yes, it is. We can also repair your ship for you. You can? If that would please you. Oh. Yes, yes, very much. Good. Consider it done. There are so many questions I want to ask. Really? So many things. I want to find out about your, your, your civilization, your, your science, the way you live, the social structure. A hundred questions. A thousand. We will be glad to answer all your questions. But first, you must rest. Yes. Come with us, Mr. Conrad. You must have food and drink and sleep. After you. Where are we going? Not far. A structure we've built. I don't see anything. Oh, I know it's dark out there, but it's only a short walk. You'll understand more when we arrive. The true end of your journey, if you will. A place that's more comfortable. Would you give me a moment? What? It won't take long. I'd like to say goodbye to my friend. Oh, certainly. Marcus. You know what's happened. I hope you know that you were right. There are Martians, after all, and they're people. It's incredible, but, but they really are just like us. You knew, didn't you? Somehow, you knew. Oh, I'm sorry, old friend, that I didn't believe you and that you didn't live to see them. Are you ready, Mr. Conrad? Yes. I'm ready. I hope this will do. I'm impressed. On Earth, this would be considered very modern. The angles, the lines, are the walls stainless steel? Well, not exactly. Something like it. Would this be considered a typical house here? In a sense, it would be the equivalent of an apartment, I believe you call it. Except that there's no furniture. I don't believe it. Everything is built into the walls. What's the power source? Not electricity, surely. It's a simple principle, really. You'll hear all about it about everything. But we promised you food. Your table and chair. From the ceiling? That's brilliant! And on the table, your meal. It will taste somewhat different from what you're accustomed to, but I trust you'll find it agreeable. Here. Thank you so much. All of you. You know, I am hungry. Very hungry. Please sit down, Mr. Conrad, and eat. Mmm. It's different, but it but I like the taste. Like uh, melon or uh cantaloupe maybe. Mmm. And yet there's almost a, a meat flavor. You don't mind it. Mind? Are you kidding? After that freeze-dried stuff we ate on the ship? No. Oh. Mmm. This is delicious. We'll leave you to eat then. Oh, I wonder. Could you do us a small favor, Mr. Conrad? Mmm. Anything. As a favor. Would you mind sketching for us what a home looks like on Earth? 
So we'll better understand your culture. No, no, not at all. Uh, this is what we call a ranch house. It has only one story. Here, look, I'll show you. This is roughly the shape. The front door here. And this is what's known as a picture window. Looking out from the living room. I see. The bedroom area. And the kitchen, where we cook the food. Here, I'll put down some more details about the interior. Please. Couch, chair, television set. Then inside the kitchen, over here, the refrigerator, maybe a freezer, and the stove. A freezer and a stove? Well, one to keep the food from spoiling and, and one to heat it up. Remarkable. In the bedroom, the bed, the bureau, the mirror, you understand? Do you understand mirror? Um, reflection? To look at yourself. Uh, <laughs> of course, I've forgotten. Will you look at that? Here's your mirror, along with the sink, towels, running water, and this will be your bed. All the comforts of home. Eat in pleasure, Mr. Conrad, and then rest. We'll come back later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, miss? Yes? I didn't ask any of your names. That's all right. You have a name, don't you? I'm called Tina. Tina, I wish you'd... Uh, will, will you tell the others for me how much I appreciate all this? The trouble you've gone to, this, this is a pretty wonderful thing that's happened to me, so... Thank you. Do you understand? Thank you. I, I mean, to come millions of miles and, and meet people of your own kind, I, I was so frightened before. I, I was so miserably frightened, and then... Please don't be. I know what I was afraid of now. I was afraid of loneliness of silence, of the unknown. But now my friend was right. There's no need for fear now. No need at all. No one will hurt you, I promise. You must believe that. I do, now. I'll see you later, Mr. Conrad. I hope so, Tina. And please, call me by my given name. It's Sam. Goodbye, Sam. There she is. Sorry, he had more questions. What did you tell him? That we'd be back later. He understands. How did he take the language transference? Oh, quite easily. His quotient is low enough. You should see the wave chart. He has the mind almost of an infant. And you must have a look at his ship. I have done so. So primitive as to be almost unbelievable. You wonder how he made it here. Tina, how does he react to things? What? He asked you a question. I'm sorry, how does... His reactions... Most trusting, emotionally very complex. He feels loneliness, curiosity, excitement. He seems to crave companionship. And what is your recommendation? My... For what we should do with him. I think we should let him go. <gasps> oh. Let him go? How can we let him go? He means us no harm, and he's... He's what? Tell us what he is. Go ahead, Tina. Feel free to speak. He's... He's so much like us, that's all. <laughs> Did you hear that, everyone? He's so much like us. Excuse me. Tina, where are you going? I have something to do. At this hour, surely not. Perhaps to observe our new arrival. After all, he is almost one of us now. <laughs> one of us, indeed. <laughs> Tina? Is that you? Yes, Mr. Conrad. I was just... Ah, uh, what's the joke? Oh, something one of my friends said. Oh, what was it? Something humorous, that's all. At least he thought so. Hmm. Won't you come in? I wouldn't want to disturb you. Not much chance of that. I'm too wound up. This is all a bit much to grasp at one time. You must have a great many questions. Perhaps you can answer a few of them. If you don't mind, that is. Won't you sit down? Well, maybe for just a minute. Have a seat. The couch is quite comfortable, thanks to you. Mr. Conrad, there's something you should know. Oh, that's an understatement. Where do we start? I don't quite know how to put this, but... Ah, uh, wait. I'm not a very good host. After all, you and your people have been so gracious, seeing to my every need. Is, is there anything you'd like? I, I, I assume there are refreshments. I don't suppose you people know what a drink is. 
In the cabinet, you'll find several varieties of beverages. Yeah? I hope they're to your satisfaction. Let's just have a look. Do you mind? Be my guest. I don't believe it! This is a 25-year-old single malt. Where did you get it? We manufactured it, you might say, to suit your taste. But how could you know what my taste is? We retrieved it from your memories, telepathically, to use your word. You were very specific in your recollections. May I ask what it is like? You mean you've never had scotch whiskey before? Well, young lady, you are in for a treat. Here, I'll pour us both one. I'm not sure that's a good idea. You're right, it's not. It's a great idea. Give this a try. Perhaps just a taste. Here's to the end of a long, long journey. And to good people everywhere. Mm. <coughs> it's a strange taste. It's so sharp. Oh, <laughs> I should have told you to sip it. Just take a small amount and just roll it around in your mouth. Then you swallow it. Ah, yeah. How's that? It's... Interesting. You said your people manufactured this. How, exactly? Uh, you must use some sort of molecular reconstruction powered by... Uh, what is the power source here, by the way? Solar? Hydrogen fusion? Uh, we've been experimenting with this on Earth for years, but so far... Please, Mr. Conrad, I... You seem nervous. It's just that... Not my fault, I hope. I've, I've never been very good at small talk, getting to know people socially. I, and, and now I'm more aware of that than ever. You're behaving perfectly. That's not the problem at all. You're the one who should be uneasy with us. Suspicious. What's to be suspicious about? Do you want to know the absolute truth? This experience, meeting all of you, it's lifted a burden off my chest. All this time, not knowing what to expect. But you're so kind. You're so understanding. You take it all in stride. A visitor from another planet, I mean, am I... The first? No, I can't say that you are. I should have known. You accepted me so easily. The other uh, visitors, where did they come from? Not Earth, obviously. Outside the solar system? Please. There will be plenty of time to answer those questions and more. I'm sure there will be. But you see, I'm, I'm a scientist. Facts, numbers. And... Those are our concerns, too. They have been since time immemorial. You've been here a very long time. Your civilization, I mean. Yes, in Earth terms. But Mr. Conrad, Sam... There is something I wanted to tell you. It's only fair that you know before... Before... Before what? Ah, Mr. Conrad. Still awake, I see. Oh, come in. I was just telling Tina here... Mr. Conrad, we have a surprise for you. Really? A very nice surprise. You shouldn't go to any more trouble. Would you accompany us, please? Where are we going? That's the surprise, Mr. Conrad. You'll see soon enough. Isn't she coming? Tina will remain behind. Oh, we were just getting acquainted. She has other duties. Actually, I... Don't you, Tina? I hope I'll see you later. No. If you don't mind, Sam, I think I will go with you now. Tina. Great, I'd like that. Quite a complex you have here. There must be miles of corridors. Like interconnecting tubes. It provides both shelter and a gathering place for our people. The walls, are they glass? A form of what you call plastic. Very strong for protection against the elements. Then you have seasons. We've seen evidence of dust storms on the surface and, of course, the polar ice caps. We've had to recreate an atmosphere in recent centuries. That has wrought havoc with the forces of nature. Far more than you might have observed from space. I can hardly wait to take a closer look. Really, Mr. Conrad, you don't want to tire yourself. You should get a good night's rest while you can. No reason to. I feel fine. Does the complex house your research facilities? Laboratories, that sort of thing? They are in an adjacent structure. I thought I saw a reflection out there, but it's so dark. All in good time. It will be a few more hours until sunrise. Then, all will be clear. Ah, here we are. After you, Mr. Conrad. What? Allow me to illuminate it for you. But this is... This is what, sir? Why, it's just like... Like the entrance to my house back home. Is it? Yes, this is the foyer, and, 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 the, and, the, and the living room would be down here. You like it? Do I? It's a 
perfect replica of my place in California. This is perfect. We did our best. I mean, in every detail. Furniture, the... Ah, the, the works, even the drapes. If I open them, I bet I'll see my old picture window. No point in opening them now. It's dark. Wait till morning. How did you build it so quickly? We sincerely hope this is the way you're used to living. You didn't miss a thing. The general outline came from your diagram, the rest from your mind. You think very clearly, Mr. Conrad. Very clearly, indeed. Strong, clean impressions. Would you care to see the rest of the house? Would I ever? Ah! My kitchen! And my refrigerator! It's filled with your favorite foods, the ones you remember most vividly. Cheese? Uh, fried chicken? And pizza? Oh, oh. I'd love to have some warmed-over pizza right about now. This is really fabulous. I don't know how to repay you. Your presence is quite enough. I really, really, truly appreciate it. We wanted you to feel at home, Mr. Conrad. Do you? (laughs) Well, I I never saw it this clean. Splendid. In that case, we were wondering if you'd mind remaining here for a little while. Oh, sure. And about my spaceship. Take your time. Your spaceship? You said you'd be able to fix it. Oh, yes. We'll restore it to its original state and then transport it here, outside your residence. It will be in perfect working order. That's great. You expressed interest in seeing more of our people. We'll arrange that first thing in the morning. I'm sure they will be most interested. I'd be delighted. For a little while longer, then. Enjoy yourself, Mr. Conrad. Enjoy your house. You bet I will. I can hardly wait to sleep on a real mattress again. Oh, let me show you out. That's not necessary. Sure it is. This is my house, isn't it? It is, sir. It most certainly is. What's this in the vase? You call them roses, don't you? Yes, but how? We had a little trouble with the petals. So delicate. If you examine them closely, you may find them somewhat imperfect. I doubt that very much. Here, I want you to have one. My way of saying thanks. Thank you. I'll keep it to remember you by... But we'll see each other again, won't we? What, what? Are you crying? Come along, Tina. I'm very happy to... to have known you, Sam. Time to go. Sleep well, and wake refreshed. Man, will I? This is too much. I wonder if there's some more of that scotch in here. Yes! Well, all I can say is if this is an illusion, it's one a guy can live with. Mm. This is the best scotch I've ever tasted. Mm. Uh, I think I'll just sit down here, put my feet up. Uh, this is the greatest. Absolutely the greatest. take a look out of my famous picture window and see what morning's like on Mars. Oh, you look at that. Red sand. Red hills. Oh, oh, wow. (laughs) They made the window so it retracts automatically. Smell that. Oh, real honest-to-goodness air. (sighs) I gotta get outside. Come on, what's the matter with this door? Wait a minute. What's that? Sounds like some kind of vehicle. Hey! Hey, everybody! I bring you greetings from Earth! Hey, what are these bars for? Everyone, 
Please exit through the rear of the tram. Over here! I'd like to shake your hands, but I'm locked in. Go to the main window, please. He's still in quarantine. What's he talking about? Why are you all looking at me like that? Please don't touch the bars. Hey, what's going on? Hey! This is our latest acquisition. No, no, it can't be. <gasps> My ship. They said they'd move it here. Wait, why, why, why would they? It can't blast off this close. It would set the whole house on fire. Unless they don't intend. Isn't he unusual? Careful, children. Can it talk? Yes, on an elementary level. A very limited vocabulary, of course. Its primitive spacecraft will soon be on permanent display. For now, you're free to observe the creature in its natural surroundings. I don't belong Note in the here. simple primal emotions. No! No! Let me out of here! You may take holograms if you like. And next, we'll move on to the Venusian habitat, the intergalactic breeding area, and the Alpha Centauri house. This again is a holographic opportunity. I don't belong in here, please! Please! I would like to take a hologram. Isn't he cute? Look this way, Earthman! You were right, Marcus. You were right. People, they are the same. No matter where you go, they are always the same. It's a zoo. A zoo. <laughs> a zoo! <laughs> it's a zoo. Species of animal on public display. Physical characteristics similar to a human being. Head, trunk, arms, legs, hands, feet. Very tiny, undeveloped brain. Comes from a primitive planet known as Earth. Calls himself Samuel Conrad. And he will remain here in his specially constructed cage with running water and electricity and central heating for the rest of his natural life. Because Samuel Conrad finally discovered a flight plan that led him off course and into the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. Perchance to Dream, starring Fred Willard with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Frenette Lebo, Doug James, Derek Purcell, Alex Sopiner, Amber Lake, Rick Arthur, Elizabeth Lido, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
there is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Cotton candy here. Get your cotton candy. Look, Mom, can I have one? It's nothing but sugar. Oh, please. Only 25 cents. Get your cotton candy. Well, just this once. But that's all you're getting, young man. One, please. Excuse me. Can I ask you? Mom, that man got in front of me. I, I just want to ask. Well, uh, one cotton candy coming up. Please, I have to know. My son was first. Where's the exit? Do you mind? I'm trying to get out of here. One at a time. Which way? Hey, pal, you don't look so good. Why don't you take it easy? I can't take it easy. Somebody's after me. Move right in, folks. See the dancing girls, blondes, brunettes, any kind you want. Starring the beautiful Maya, Princess of Darkness. Quickly, where can I hide? Hey, easy, pal. You don't understand. She's been following me all night. Everywhere I go. Can I have my cotton candy, please? Come along, Christopher. It's late. But, Mom... You've had enough sweets. You, over there. Come on over, mister. Show's about to start. Leave me alone! Come inside the tent. Always room for one more. <laughs> How do I get out of here? Well, right over there, pal. See? Through the turnstile? Follow the crowd. Hey, watch where you're going. Let me through, please. Uh, that man just shoved me. Sorry, you've got to let me out. Hey, slow down there. One person at a time. Please, someone's after me. Get in line, like everybody else. All right. All right. There, that wasn't so hard, was it? Officer? Where's the uptown train? Well, that's the next platform. Keep it moving, folks. Where am I? What's that? I, I don't know where I... Where are you going? What? Oh, I... I have to see Dr. Jackson. Who? I have an appointment on, on the Upper East Side. You don't need the subway. You're there. But how... It's the other end of that platform, right up those stairs. Say, are you all right? I... I really don't know. What time is it? Uh, quarter to twelve. Midnight? That's a good one. In the a.m., pal. Where have you been all night? Why'd you go home and sleep it off? I can't. That's the one thing I can't do. Noon in the city. Lunchtime for thousands of people. To most of them, the next hour will be a rest. A pleasant break in the day's routine. To most, but not all. The gentleman on the run is Mr. Edward Hall, an ordinary man who lives an ordinary life. The only problem is, his life has been turned upside down. He knows his way around the city, but he's had a bad night. Several, in fact. Nights without sleep as he flees a place that may or may not exist. It's all real for Mr. Hall, however, and it holds a secret he does not want to face. So get ready to run with the hunted, because time is the enemy, and the hour ahead is a matter of life and death when you're trapped in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Perchance to Dream, starring Fred Willard with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Uh, excuse me. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right floor. The Goodman building, right? Mm-hmm. What are you looking for? Doctor, uh, I can't remember his name. It's it's on this piece of paper. Let me see. Elliot Rathman? Oh, yes. Dr. Rathman, the psychiatrist. He's in 1410. That way, at the end of the hall. Thank you. Are you all right? I... I don't know anymore. I guess that's why I'm going to the doctor. Would you like me to walk with you? No, no. I can make it. Are you sure? What? You don't look so good, honey. 
Why don't you come with me? You? It isn't far. I can show you the way. Don't touch me! What's the matter? I'm free for the rest of the day. Get away! Relax, honey. It won't be long now. May I help you? Tell her to keep away from me. Pardon? That woman. Who? In the hall. She's been following me. I don't see anyone. She was there as soon as I got off the elevator. I didn't recognize her at first, but when, when she began to speak... Well, there's no one there now. See for yourself. She was. I tell you. Why don't you take a seat? Do you have an appointment? Uh, I, I think so. Dr. Jackson said he would call. Oh, yes. Mr. Hall. That's right. We've been expecting you. I'll tell Dr. Rathman you're here. Doctor, your 12 o'clock is here. That's fine, Charlotte. Mr. Hall? Yes. Come in. Please. The chair or the couch, whichever you prefer. Not the couch. No? You look tired. I am, but I can't. Why not? If you're tired... I might fall asleep. And what would be wrong with that? It's a long story. Are you feeling sick? No, no, just tired. Then try the chair. It's pretty comfortable. <sighs> Maybe just for a minute. I have to be careful not to close my eyes. No. I thought you said you were tired. I am. I am the tiredest man in the world. You know how long I've been awake? 87 hours. Almost four days and nights. And you can't sleep? Can't. No, doctor, that isn't it. Mustn't. I mustn't go to sleep, because if I do, I'll never wake up. Really? Mind if I... Walk around, keep the circulation going. Stand on your head if you think it'll help. I don't have that much energy. <laughs> well, what's funny now? You are. You're sure you're a shrink? That's what the diploma on the wall says. Why do you ask? You're not what I expected. Oh? What did you expect? Oh, I don't know. Something more like... An old man with the white goatee and a German accent? I've heard that before. It's what everybody expects. And they're always disappointed. I've often thought of wearing a disguise. Wait, wait a minute. I have a pair of horn rim glasses in my pocket there. How's that? Perfect. I hope it makes you feel more comfortable. Oh, you looked okay before. But I'm afraid I'm wasting your time. Why do you say that? You can't help me. Nobody can. You're sure? Yes. Then why did you come to see me at all? It was... Fred Jackson's idea. He's my regular doctor. I know. What did he tell you? Not much. Your name, Edward Hall. Your age, 35. Your occupation, draftsman. Unmarried. That's right. Long-standing heart condition? Since I was a child. Dr. Jackson's treating you for that? Yes, with pills. And did you remember to take them? When? This morning. What day is this? Good thing you reminded me. You have a glass of water? Surely. Thanks. No history of mental illness? Definitely not. That's all I have. You want to tell me the rest? No, forget it. I'm sorry to take up your time. Mr. Hall. Yes? You really think running away will do you any good? I wish I knew. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes running away is the best answer. Depends on the problem and whether it's something that can be overcome. The fight or flight response. Precisely. But I don't know if yours is that sort of problem. Listen, you can do what you like. But I'm going to charge you for the appointment no matter what. So why not get your money's worth? Promise you won't put me in a straitjacket. I can't promise anything. It wouldn't make any difference anyway. Uh, mind if I open the window? What for, if I may ask? To see the view. <laughs> Cars look like ladybugs from here. People like insects. Ah, uh, quite a drop. Straight down. Fourteen stories, uh, thirteen technically. There's no thirteenth floor. Architects are superstitious. And are you? Not that I know of. I'll have to ask you to close it. I only wanted some air. I'll turn up the air conditioner. It works best with the windows closed. Did you think I'd jump? You might have. Not a chance. I want to live. That's my problem. Why is that a problem? 
There are people who don't want me to. Then get on with it. With your story, I mean. I, I don't know where to start. Start anywhere. Okay, but I'm warning you, you'll think I've lost my marbles. Marbles can be found, Mr. Hall. Please, go on. Nice office you've got here. Nice furniture. Glad you like it. The pictures on the wall. Th this one in particular. The seascape. You ever look at it? Really look at it? Why? Does it remind you of anything? Has it ever moved? Quite a few times. It used to be over the desk. My wife likes to redecorate the office. No. What's in the picture? How do you mean? The boat on the waves. You're serious? No, it hasn't. Not to my knowledge, anyway. Sorry to disappoint you. I can make it move. Can you? Yes. That would be quite an accomplishment. Not really. When I was a kid, we had a picture like that. Not the same, exactly, but close. A boat, a, a sailing ship. One of those paint-by-numbers things. I remember those. I think my mother painted it when I was a baby. <laughs> she used to tell me to look at it. If I looked at it long enough, she said, it would move. I didn't believe her. But the idea fascinated me. One night, I spent a whole hour just staring at that silly boat. And did it move? Yes. You were lying in bed waiting to fall asleep, but you couldn't. That's right. You understand there's nothing strange about that. A fixed image on your retinas. Eventually, your nervous system shifts the position slightly to remain alert, or seems to. In Gestalt psychology, we call it the figure ground effect. In plain words, it was an optical illusion. I know, except that after a while, I couldn't control it. Every time I looked at the boat, the sails filled and began to dip, moving over the bounding waves. I couldn't stop it. Imagination is strong in a growing boy. I realized that. I realized it even then. But the point is, I got just as scared as if it were really happening. Why would it scare you? Oh, I, I don't know. The movement, the, the change of scene, of being someplace else. Of being out of control? Could be. Even if you know it's not real? But that's just it. The mind is everything. If you think you have a headache, and, and there's no physical reason for it, you hurt just the same, don't you? Granted. Excuse me. I need some more of that water. Be my guest. <sighs> Thank you. Dextroamphetamine? How did you know? I recognized the pill. Not one of Dr. Jackson's prescriptions. It's the only way I've been able to stay awake. How many grains a day? I don't know, 30, 35... I'll have to tell Dr. Jackson. Tell him! I don't have much longer anyway. Not if you keep taking those. You want to hear the rest or not? Yes, I do. All right. Here goes. When I was 15, I developed a rheumatic heart. They said I'd never really get well, that I'd have to take it easy. No strenuous exercise, no long walks, no stairs, no shocks to the system. Shock produces excess adrenaline, they said, and that was bad. Avoid any kind of shock. But they forgot about my imagination. Then three years ago, a woman was killed by a man who'd hidden in the back seat of her car. Maybe you read about it? I believe I did. Well, I started thinking about it. Maybe someone was hiding in the back seat of my car. Maybe I'd be driving over Laurel Canyon some night. And I'd, I'd look in the rearview mirror and I'd see somebody or, or something rising up out of the darkness behind me. I had to drive the canyon twice a day. The second time was always late at night. It's a tricky road. One slip and you're over the edge. One night, like every other night, I was headed for home. It was a dark stretch, only my headlights cutting into the blackness. Suddenly, I began to feel uncomfortable, as if I weren't alone in the car. It was ridiculous, but I couldn't shake the sensation. I, I kept thinking, there's somebody back there, directly behind my seat. If I look in the rearview mirror, I'll see his face. And then I'll see his hands reaching up. Here's the important thing, Doctor. I knew, intellectually, that I was alone. But I also knew that my imagination could make me see something if I thought about it long enough. And so, don't ask me why, but I looked in the mirror, and there he was. I hit the brakes, lost control, and that was when I went off the road, into the ravine, and crashed!
No! And that was it. The car was totaled. And you were okay? Not a scratch. Of course, there wasn't anyone else in the car. It was all in my mind. But what difference did that make? I crashed anyway. You were lucky to walk away from it. Yeah, I was lucky. The shock could have killed me. The old heart condition. The doctor said I couldn't survive another one. And has there been another one? No, but there will be. Just as soon as I fall asleep, the girl will be in this dream. And it will be the last. The girl? I'm getting to that. Do you have dreams, doctor? Frequently. Does everyone? I'm sure they do. It's a way of processing what happens during the day. An attempt to come to terms with our experience, at least symbolically. Some people say they don't dream at all. I know. Probably a defense mechanism. They do, but the content is something they're not ready to face consciously. I've always had dreams, ever since I can remember. Sometimes they've been wonderful, sometimes terrible, but vivid. I'd wake up and for a few seconds I wouldn't be sure which was real, this world or the, or the dream. It's not uncommon, Mr. Hall. They say a dream takes only a few seconds, but I can't believe that. I've dreamed whole lifetimes. Generations have passed. Civilizations rose and fell a single second, and it lasted forever. I'm sure that's the way it seemed. The experience of time can be very subjective. It expands, contracts. It's more than a feeling. Why do you say that? When I was a kid, I used to dream in sequence. I mean it. Remember the the adventure serials they showed at movie theaters? It was like that. Every dream was the next chapter. And I'd always remember because when I woke up, I wrote down what happened. Do you think that's crazy? Not necessarily. It could simply be that the dreams conform to your notes and not the other way around. Then you don't think it's possible to dream in episodes? I don't say it's impossible. I just haven't seen it in the literature. It's possible. Believe me. For a while, the dream stopped. Then something happened. About a week ago, that was when it started again. What was it that happened? Nothing. That's just it. Why don't you tell me what you remember? Well, I went to bed around 11.30. I wasn't tired, but I needed the rest because of my heart. I don't even know when I fell asleep, but all of a sudden I wasn't home in my bed anymore. I was at an amusement park in in the middle of the night. Can you describe it? Oh, the usual. Uh, A merry-go-round, a roller coaster, a funhouse, a shooting gallery. We could win a prize, that sort of thing. Colored lights. And it was crowded. People all around, pushing, yelling. I couldn't get my breath. There you go, bullseye. So I'm shooting. You must have been in the service. Yeah, Marines. Sharpshooter. Well, take your pick. Stuffed animal, cupid doll. I'll take the teddy bear for my girl. One teddy bear coming up. Ooh, Artie, thanks. It's so cute. Keep it by your bed to remember me by. Oh, I will. Hey, how about you, buddy? What? Over here, Mark. Step right up. My name's not Mark. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Take a chance. Six shots for a quarter. Hit the bullseye and you get a genuine imported Cupid doll. How about it? 25 cents. One quarter of a dollar. How much? 25 little pennies. Go on. You look like a good shot. That was when I got it. The prices. I looked around and it was the same amusement park I went to as a kid. In 26 years, nothing had changed. It was exactly as I remembered it. Ah, you missed it. Here, let me give you another rifle. This one shoots straight. (laughs) No, thank you. Hurry, hurry, hurry. See the dancing girl. See Maya, the cat girl. Move in close. One more time and you've got it. Uh, Excuse me. That'll be 25 cents. I I don't have any change. Hey, you owe me a quarter. Girls, girls, girls. The most exotic, the most exciting, the most sensational examples of feminine pulchritude this side of heaven. Move right up, folks. Last show of the night. See this roll of tickets? Well, the regular price is one dollar, but I'm going to put these away. If you're within the sound of my voice, the price is only 50 cents. That's right. Half price for this show only. The pitchman was in shirt sleeves and a straw hat. A crowd had gathered at the platform. All men looking at five dancing girls in skimpy costumes. 
But the one they looked at the most was in the middle, wrapped in a black silk cape, the color of her hair. He was right about one thing, she was beautiful. Full red lips, pale, delicate skin, and huge cat-like eyes. You like him full-figured? We got him. You like him slim? We got him. Blondes, brunettes, redheads, if they ain't here, believe me, they ain't worth looking at. Now, here's a little preview of what's inside. Music maestro, Maya. Give the folks a peek under the cape. Come on, baby, I know you're modest, but we can't expect them to take my word for it. Hey, honey, show us what you got. I couldn't take my eyes off her. Slowly, she opened her arms, the black cape parted, and I saw her magnificent body gleaming the sequins. I give you Maya, the cat girl. What a figure. Ooh, man. man, I like it. Hey, can I have the next dance? She started moving, whirling to the beat, her hair like a, a black flame, faster and faster. Was she smiling? I couldn't be sure, but the whole time, she was looking at me. I felt the crowd, the music closing in like a net. I couldn't breathe. Excuse me, pardon me. I have to go. If you let me through, please. I didn't know who the girl was. I'd, I'd never seen her before, but as much as I was drawn to her, I knew I had to get away. Something about her eyes, something deep inside those dark cat's eyes. May I have a light? What? A light. For my cigarette. Ah, uh, oh. Oh, of course. Thank you. But you're Maya. I, I just saw you on the stage. Why did you do that? Why, why did I do what? Walk away. I felt like it. You didn't find me nice to look at? Maybe too nice. Aren't you supposed to be back there entertaining the customers? I'm free now for the night. Are you alone? Yes. Then come with me. Where? Does it matter? You want to, don't you, Edward? How do you know my name? <laughs> oh, I know a lot of things. I'm Maya. Don't be afraid. I'm not. Then come. Um, Look, I don't know if I... You are afraid. Only because this isn't happening. It's a dream. I'm, I'm not here. I'm at home, asleep, and you're part of the dream, aren't you, Maya? I know that, too. You do? Naturally. We passed a funhouse with a huge mechanical woman out front. The laughter was grotesque. Take me in there, Edward. Screw you, Louis room? It, it's for kids. But it's dark. Soft and cool and dark. Please. How can I argue with a dream? Tickets here. Wait, uh, I don't seem to have any money. That's all right. We've been expecting you. What? Evening, Maya. Mr. Hall. Let's go. It's just inside this door, behind the glass. You can kiss me now. What if I don't want to? You want to. Look, whose dream is this, anyway? Edward. What in the... It's only a prop. A mechanical dragon. I can't take this. My heart. But it isn't real, Edward. <laughs> it isn't real. And that's when I knew, beyond any doubt, what she really wanted. She wanted to kill me! <laughs> you woke up then? Yes, I'm glad to say. My heart was beating a mile a minute. I had to lie still for an hour, waiting for it to settle down. I went to my doctor in the morning. He said I'd almost had it. Do you know who the girl was? No idea. She looked familiar, but I know I'd never seen her before. You're sure she wanted to kill you? Yes. Why did you think so? Why? If you'd seen her eyes, heard her laugh. You said she was beautiful that you desired her. Yes, but the way she followed me made me go with her. 
The funhouse frighten you? I'm not sure. I remember it from when I was a child, but it seemed different somehow. Larger and darker on the inside with more glass. There were long passages with mirrors at the end, and you were never sure which way to turn. Wherever I looked, I saw her reflection. A beautiful, seductive reflection. Someone you wanted. No one forced you to talk to her, light her cigarette, follow her inside. You went along with her willingly, didn't you? I, I couldn't think clearly. It was as if I had no will of my own. Something was happening, and I was swept up in it. I don't suppose she reminds you of anyone now. Like who? Someone you've seen since in your waking life. There was a woman in the hall when I got off the elevator. She spoke to me, and her voice began to change. For just a second, I thought she sounded like... Like Maya? Yes. That probably comes from sleep deprivation. Your mind is so tired it has to rest, but you fight it. So you slip in and out a few seconds at a time. It's called micro-sleep. It happens when we drive long distances, when we're pushed beyond the limits. A definite warning sign. Otherwise we lose control and, well, the consequences can be dangerous, as you must know. But what if the real danger is in closing your eyes? What if that's when the accident happens? What if... Easy. We're only having a conversation in my office. No harm can come to you here, I assure you. Sorry, I know you're right. Of course you are. We were talking about the first dream you had. What happened after that? Well, the next night, I put off going to sleep until one o'clock. That would make it hard to get up in the morning. But I didn't care. Turned out it didn't matter anyway. The dream came back, and this time it was more intense. I was back at the amusement park outside the fun house, and I was running. I couldn't catch my breath. When I thought I was far enough away, I stopped. Well, the next night I put off going to sleep until one o'clock. That would make it hard to get up in the morning, but I didn't care. Turned out it didn't matter anyway. The dream came back, and this time it was more intense. I was back at the amusement park outside the fun house, and I was running. I couldn't catch my breath. When I thought I was far enough away, I stopped. I was in front of a tent with a, a picture of tarot cards and a crystal ball painted on it. It was dark and no one was around, so I went inside looking for a place to rest. You are looking for me? Oh, sorry, I didn't know anyone was here. I am Madame Olga. No more fortunes, it's late. Come back tomorrow. Yes, uh, yes, I'll do that. Wait, something is wrong? No, I mean... I don't know. Come closer to the candle. Oh, so pale. And your eyes. You are running away. Well, actually... Sit. Give me your hand. If I could just stay here for a minute. Loosen your tie. There. Thank you, that's better. And the button at your throat. Open it. Now. Someone is after you. It doesn't make any sense. I, I don't even know her. Ah. But she knows you. I'm not sure. She seems to. You desire her? She's beautiful. What man wouldn't? She is the flame and you the moth. I'd better go. Wait. I must consult the cards. I, I don't need my fortune told. No? I don't believe in that sort of thing. It doesn't matter whether you believe or not. What is cannot be changed. You mean, fate? Call it what you like. The past and the future come together in this moment. What about free will? An illusion for children. All is written. Well, I hope you can tell me the way out of the park. I seem to be turned around and I have to be at work in the morning and- Silence. Well, what's my fortune? I am afraid. You don't have a fortune, Mr. Hall. Thanks. That makes me feel better. Why do you hurry? I have more important things to do, like getting home. You rush for no reason. You have always been here. You always will be here. Thanks for the advice. Bye. 
Edward. Where? Behind you. But how? I've been waiting. Get away from me! What's there to be afraid of, Edward? It's only a dream. I have a heart condition. I can't stand all this excitement. That's silly. There isn't any excitement, not really. You said so yourself. You're home in bed, asleep. Now you can do all the things you can't do when you awake. Anything, Edward. Anything. No, that isn't true. The doctor... Oh, look! I don't like those things. But Edward, it's the Cyclone Racer. Please look. No. Come on, Edward. Just one ride. It's fun. Please, look, I... It's the last run of the night. You must come with me. I didn't want to go anywhere near that roller coaster, but I couldn't help myself. I had no choice. Even though I knew what it would mean, I had to follow her. Oh, that was so scary. Yeah, especially in the dark. Can we go again? Nah, let's do something else. Oh, they're closing up anyway. Last ride of the night. Get your tickets. Two, please. I can't. Why not? I, I don't have any money. My wallet. That's all right, Mr. Hall. We've been expecting you. How does he know my... Come, Edward. We'll ride in the front car. Lowering the safety bar. Watch your hands. Really, I can't do this. Hold tight, Edward. It's starting. Tell them to stop. They can't. It's too late. But I can't stand heights. My heart. I mustn't look. We're going straight up. You must look, Edward. The first drop is the most exciting. It's 90 feet. A sheer drop straight down. No! Yes. Isn't it wonderful? It makes you feel alive. I have to get out. Kiss me now, Edward. With the wind in our hair. I can't! It won't be long now. We're almost there. I told you, I can't! I have to get out. How do I lift the safety bar? Don't climb down, Edward. It takes too long. Jump. That's it. Stand up. And jump! What are you doing? <laughs> Don't push me! Don't! <laughs> ah! No! Is that it? That's it. If I go to sleep, I'll be back on the roller coaster for the next episode. It'll pick up where it left off. I'll force the safety bar, stand, Maya will reach out, push, and that'll be the end of me. On the other hand, if I stay awake much longer, the strain will be too much for my heart, and that'll be the end of me. Heads you win, tails I lose. Quite a choice, isn't it? Where are you going? Outside. Maybe if I get some air. I wouldn't advise it. What would you advise? A straitjacket? So long, Doc. You can't help me. I've wasted enough of your time. Leaving so soon, Edward? Maya. What's the matter, Mr. Hall? It's her! My receptionist? Sorry, her name doesn't happen to be Maya. Doesn't it? I can't take this anymore. I've had enough. Enough, do you hear me? What are you doing? Stand aside! No, don't. Don't! Yes! What happened? He fell, or, or jumped, from that window up there. Oh, no. The blood. The blood. Dr. Rathman, I heard a scream. Is he all right? I'm afraid he's dead. You're right. There's no pulse. But he came in just a minute ago asking to see you. He walked into your office, closed the door. I know. It's funny. When he came in, I told him to sit down. He did. In less than two seconds, he was asleep. Then he gave out that scream you heard. By the time I could stand up and get to him, he had stopped breathing. A heart attack? It must have been. Well, I guess there are worse ways to go. At least he died peacefully. Open the window, would you please? We need some fresh air. Yes, doctor.
They say a dream takes no more than a second or so, and yet in that second a man can live a lifetime, suffer and die. And who is to say which is the greater reality, the one we know or the one in dreams, somewhere between heaven and earth in the twilight zone? More from the twilight zone after this. Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. I hope you're enjoying this edition of the Twilight Zone Radio Dramas. To learn more about this series, be sure to log on to our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You'll find special discounts on our Twilight Zone audio collections, listings of our radio stations, links to other websites, and a photo gallery of our recording studio and some of our stars in action. Plus ways to contact us with questions or comments about the show. And for a limited time, when you log on to twilightzoneradio.com, you can send in for a free CD of the show. So be sure to visit us at twilightzoneradio.com. <laughs> 